Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 357 of Spitting Chicklets, presented by Pink Whitney. Well, my friends at New Amsterdam Vodka here in the Boston Sports Podcast family. What's up, gang? Season humming right along, couple of weeks in. Lots of shit to talk about, lots of storylines developing, but let's say hi to the boys first. Mikey Grinelli, fresh off a plane from Mesa, Arizona, Hooters, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, got to uh, spend the weekend out in Arizona with Biz, but most importantly, I got to see Biz's new Bond mansion, Bond villain mansion that he's moving into. Incredible, incredible place, boys. I can't wait for you guys to see this. He's you're using the term. You have a mansion? Bond He's or using Bond the villain? term mansion extremely loose. It's it's a forty five hundred square foot house, folks. This is not a mansion. Maybe compared to anything in NYC. And may I remind everyone, I live in in Arizona. It's very spread out here. They're all. It's bungalows. incredible though. The spot. It's like Pablo Escobar. It's unbelievable. Ooh, yeah, it's got, got it's hippopotamus. Got a- hippopotamus in the front yard. <laughs> Why? The rhinoceros. Oh yeah, dude. The, hip, the hippos are out of control in Colombia because Pablo Escobar had so much coke money. He would buy hippos for pets, and then they recreated all so much they've fucked up the ecosystem in Colombia. Right. Uh, the last 30 years or so oh my goodness i had no clue that that was even a thing now going back to last podcast is that when you butchered the word rhinoceros i combined a rhinoceros and and i guess a dinosaur (laughs) and i created a rhinoceros Oh, okay, cool. Fucking A, man. Well, I asked I'm sure Kennelly to send me the clip of it, but he didn't send it to me. I still no. want that. Well, because he was busy I mean, with h- hanging out in Scottsdale, living the Vida Loca. Living it up at a Hooters. Uh, one may argue a rhino- rhinoceros is a uh, dinosaur. I mean, maybe it is. Who maybe knows? Is. Maybe there I mean, was a dinosaur. I think I might have actually created it in my mind, but there could be a giant dinosaur that lived millions of years ago that was just the R dog, the rhinoceros. Yeah, you know, you look at them up close. They are ancient looking. Biz, you just said you were going on a hike last night. You must see some pretty crazy animals out in the in the desert, in the high desert. No, there's the like hikes. wild boar, and, and and there are oh, definitely don't some. Don't get me started. Yeah, the war hack. <laughs> um, yeah, there's some stuff out there, but normally on the paths during when the sun lights up, there's like they don't come close to the path. So if if you are out there and it gets dark, you usually have like a whistle, and you're supposed to just whistle every like few minutes to kind of deter them from coming closer to the path. Now, I mean, everybody's seen the infamous rattlesnake video when, when that was in my garage, but uh, knock on wood, I haven't had many interactions with scorpions, uh, yeah. but yeah, nothing. Oh, I was scorpion hunting out there with Kami one night in his backyard because they light up, right? Yep. Or Some of them were neon. Like, yeah, they, they were neon. Up. So we were out there trying to get these things, but they're all over the map, all like fluorescent at the middle of the night. And they say this granted we were really? drinking. What? So, some of them are, right? I don't think really, all of them huh? do. Wow, that's interesting. I mean, like I'm not the, I'm not I'm not like the I'm not Steve Irwin over here. I don't really know much about animals, although uh, Lloyd we uh oh fuck. So Katie was out of town. You know, I figured I could trust him to go over to, when I went to going over to dinner uh to leave him out of his cage. Well, I come home and he ate my fucking twelve thousand dollar restoration hardware couch. Well, he went down to booty camp or not booty camp. <laughs> you sent him to booty camp. Well, you sure, sure you rewarded him for eating the, the expensive shit. <laughs> yeah. Barry's boot camp with all the cocktail servers. No, I he sent comes him to- home with just a sick dumper on him. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, he was, he was working. Boy, your ass he, looks great. He was working at Hooters the shift. We were there to make some of that money back. I paid for boot camp for him, <laughs> but uh, sent him away for 10 days. And holy shit, did this lady do an unbelievable job with him. And he's, I mean, he follows all the commands. He can sit down, shake a paw, do whatever you want. Um, so uh, r- really happy that we're getting him trained up and, and ready to roll because uh, I was a little bit fuming when I got home and he'd eaten the, the, the armrest off that uh, that couch of mine in the living room. You would have been fuming if he ate a $12 pair of sandals from Target. <laughs> eating a $12,000 couch, I know you were steaming mad. Oh, my goodness. It's been a, t- it's been a tough week on those types of bounces too, uh, so I, I got okay. So everybody was complimenting and or insulting the suit I had on TNT, the double breasted blue one with the gold buttons. The <laughs> funniest clip. Sorry to, to interrupt. The funniest oh, clip in, was buddy. when when you somebody tweeted when, when you have to work NHL on TNT and go to your first communion after. <laughs> <laughs> or somebody put up the Captain Crunch. Captain yeah, Crunch is the the fucking best. Captain <laughs> oh, Crunch the is Cap- the best. Yeah. It was Captain Crunch. <laughs> and but that so everyone's like, oh, the new suit guy showed up. No, the new suit guy. Fuck, he, he, that wasn't a new suit. He, the guy met me in NYC. Well, he un, unzips the bag and 
I'm looking at this suit. I'm like, yeah, I don't, that looks a little bit short. I try the thing on. It's like three or four inches short. I looked like I was about to go fight a bull in the it, ring. It, like one of those Toro, Toro jackets. Is that what you were doing when you pulled up the pants a little, like in, in that gift come out of it? No, that, I sent? What was, that was, okay. that, that was Anson Carter uh, giving homage to Wayno for the tuck. And I okay. said, no, nah, no, nah. he would go. Wouldn't, wouldn't Wayne go full Jersey tuck when he was in NYC. So I tucked in the front and I did like the little, nerd walk we're <laughs> wayno was dropping bombs on me last one oh, i was tripping was on you Dude, you brought him so much out of his shell man like he's like you know people like oh i get to see gretzky busting balls it's it's some people really haven't seen before and you oh. obviously take it well it's been it's been awesome yeah stuff, i've been man. spending the last week yeah. hanging out with a therapist to get my self-esteem back up after he chucked me in a body bag but so the long therapist is like short. who is who is bullying you young paul you're like oh wayne gretzky he's like <laughs> The great one, you are a loser. Get out of my office. He can say whatever he wants to you. Um, so going back to the suits, I, I'm going to be having the, the the hockey night in Canada on acid one. I got to go back to the crazy blue blazer because the suits still haven't came in. Still haven't got a phone call with, as to when I'm going to get them. And if all else fails, I'm going to have to go back to the gray one week four. So oh. back to that ugly one that, that I've dry cleaned 10,000 times that I've had for five years. So I need, a, I need you a get like a pink Whitney custom suit, like a sick pink custom suit, with maybe the little logo like hidden in it. Like when, Real when Conor McGregor had fuck you all over his suit. So yours is just pink. And then in subtle black, it just says pink Whitney everywhere. It'd be pretty fresh on you. I think right. dude. Okay, you can pull wait. off any look. We got pink Whitney ties coming for there him. you. Go. All righty. Okay, well, um, there's some idea. Anyone else got any ideas? Send me a couple tweets as to what I should wear. Now, next week is uh, is Halloween, boys. So maybe I'll maybe I'll dress ooh. up. Maybe I'll uh-huh. put the Wayne sweater vest that's a, on. That's a yes. <laughs> it, and since we're talking about it, Wit, do, do do you already have uh, costumes picked out for your kids? Do you do you pick them or do they pick them at this age? Uh Ryder maybe could have, but the wife wifey picks them. I got mine. I'll send you the picture. It's amazing. <laughs> Amazing. We get to hear about everyone's it or- probably everyone's yeah. probably seen this before, but no, I'm not even going to talk about it yet. Put it this way. There's a thing in my pocket that has to like blow the thing up the whole time I'm wearing it. Ooh. So I have a costume party on Saturday night. And then I think another one. I think another one Sunday before trick or treating. I don't exactly know the weekend schedule of Halloween, but it dropping on a Sunday's going to probably make it pretty lit in my neighborhood. My neighborhood's oh. great for trick or treating kids running around everywhere. We buy the full candy bars because I remember when I was younger, I'd go to a house. They give you a full Snickers, full peanut M and M's. I said, "Oh my god, if I ever make it in life, I'm gonna have the big boy candy and be the guy." Everyone's like, "Thank you, holy shit, you had full candy, not these little miniature bites." So we've done that, but then last year's COVID, but still we ran out. That's a nightmare. You run out of candy, you're a piece of shit. So we didn't get enough. So this year we bought so much. Problem is, I've already gotten into the stash. I'm crushing this food. So we got to go back to the store. I'm going to go back to maybe Costco, really load up. But I'm changing my diet. I'm going off the sauce. I got to get surgery on my elbow. Things are changing in Ryan's world. I'm getting back to being a legitimate human being who doesn't drink all the time, who doesn't eat like a sewer rat, and who maybe dresses a little better. So things are on the up and up. So uh, the kids in Witt's neighborhood could thank Sid for the, the full candy bars. Now, when you run out of candy, yeah. do you, you just start peeling off 20s? Like, how, how does it work? You no, I go, them- in the, I go in the fridge. Hey, you want some beef stew? There's some extra, you know, there's some chili, dude. <laughs> I got frozen more. pizzas. You want a frozen pizza? <laughs> kids if leave the kid with looks a lamp. Like if, if he's like maybe 12, I'll give him Pink Whitney, but nothing under 10 gets Pink Whitney. So we'll figure it out. You're, I might give him like golf balls. Yeah, yeah pro V ones. <laughs> Yeah, but no, I know. I give them, I give them the, the, the range the, balls, the, the, the rock fights, the top yeah, flight rock that, balls. Yeah. What you play uh, with. How, but more importantly for the adults who don't have kids, uh, Halloween parties are back and a Sunday Halloween. Perfect. Lines up for Friday parties, Saturday parties. Last year, there was nothing going on. It feels like it's been six Halloweens. It hasn't been a party. I don't know why it just seems, seems like it's been forever. I wonder if there's going to be a lot of slutty biz costumes out there this year. Biz, what you, you know, taking off on TNT, everything. They make a slut out of everything nowadays. What was a slutty biz costume? What would that be? What would that be? I don't know. What would that be, though? All right. Just a disgusting horn. Um, (laughs) It would be the Dennis wig that uh, Kevin Hayes sent (laughs) over to us. Horrible horrible salad with with a small, Uh, disgusting horn looking like the the worm in a tequila bottle. An old suit with a rip in it. 
Yeah. I was really hoping that like last year, I know you guys, when I wrote the skullet, but I wouldn't take the head off. I was praying that Halloween come back in time just because I actually did it in the shower. If I was going to be Beetlejuice, I might've said it before. And like the hair would have been perfect. Cause like Michael Keaton was bald and the hair come out in a perfect level. So I'm probably never going to grow that skullet back again. But if we could have gotten a Halloween, I would have had the best Beetlejuice costume ever. Cause when you can incorporate your, your natural self into the costume, like your hair, your limbs or whatever. Well, why didn't you do it last year? Like Halloween went on last year. Yeah. But it was like, there was no, nobody in my orbit was having parties. There was nothing, you know, going on basically where I was going to dress. And I was going to be like a freak who just dresses up as Beetlejuice. Like I'll do that. I ain't going to tell you guys about that. <laughs> All right. All right. I just mentioned Pink Witty. Of course, the fall classic is here. Hockey and hoops are in full swing and pigskin as well. So that means head over to your local bar and make sure to order some Pink Whitney. It's the perfect fall shot for you and your friends. Again, hit up your local stash house, your local bar, your local dive, whatever you call it, and get some Pink Whitney from you and the guys and gals. All right, boys. Uh, let's see. Should we talk about some hockey? Uh, we usually lead off with like the positive stories, but this week... Mm-hmm. Chicago Black We're going to keep it negative off the hop here. Oh, fuck yeah. Right yeah. into it. Oh, right into the black hole. Yeah, we had, a, we had a late negative. editorial decision biz. Sorry. It's not necessarily negative because if you hate the Blackhawks, you're the happiest son of a bitch out there oh, right that's now. That's true. They suck. Oof. This team, all right, I don't know. You have anything else to say? 0 5 and 1 outscored 27 of 12, boot off the ice when they uh, lost to Detroit last night. Um, there were, I guess there were more Red Wing fans in the building than Blackhawk fans, which is yikes. Uh, they have yet to have a lead, which Chief said was an NHL record. They have five even strength goals, uh, just two assists, 12 uh, shots on goal from Jonathan Taves. As Biz said, they don't appear to be playing with urgency. And then last night we had what appeared to be Jeremy Carlton handing the grease board to the players to let them do whatever on it. I don't know. That's just sketch and hand it back. This is a clusterfuck right now. Wit, I know you revved up. You were ready to go. There. Wait, just got to correct one yeah. thing. I Sorry. believe that they were booed off the ice the two games prior as well. So let's make it a hat trick yeah. for the, the, what, the Sunday nighter in Chicago playing Detroit on a back-to-back coming off of the Montreal beatdown. So a back-to-back on the road. So take it away, Ryan Whitney. When I got into the NHL, uh, one of my first road trips in the NHL, we went to Chicago. And we've heard Adrian Acoin on the show prior to this, and he talked about the years when he could just, like, yell to his kids in the stands at Blackhawks games. I mean, I'm telling you, I went to this game. The United Center is one of the coolest places when they're – good team and that fan base is rocking and the anthems out of this world and the intro song is something to die for it's just sick we are headed towards a path where there's six thousand people at the games nobody gives a shit the team sucks the gm stinks the coach is brutal i actually i i honestly don't even like blame Carlton that much like this is on pussy cruncher 69 as biz likes to call stan bowman it is a disaster that's his burner account that's I his don't burner account to, online I'm sorry stating facts here, i folks. i cannot believe you talked me into thinking this team was going to get into the playoffs and i got the blues running rampant on the whole league right now shit pumping everyone with a tarasenko that looks as focused and ready to play as anyone in the league and i picked the blackhawks to get in the playoffs and you know what Shame on me because I, I believe the hype. I believe the off season. I, I like Seth Jones. I mean, the analytical people who have hated him from the jump, they are loving this because apparently, according to different reports I read, he played like the worst game anyone in the NHL has played, according to analytics the other night. He's got four points in six games. People don't really care about that. They signed this guy to this monster deal. And mind you, mind you this, when they traded for him, They gave up a first-round draft pick. Columbus owns Chicago's first-round pick this year, unless it's number one or number two. So if the Blackhawks go on to be this pathetic all year, which maybe they won't be this bad, but holy shit, do they look garbage. They could end up getting the third overall pick, and Columbus gets it. Imagine that. Imagine how low it would be for Blackhawks. And Cody Sillinger as well, who's playing as an 18-year-old. He's the youngest player in the league, and he looks great in Columbus. And or did I say, what did I yeah. say? Yeah. Cody. Cody. Oh, no me. worries. You, you get the point Dash across one. Sillinger. Now, here's the thing. This has happened recently. Um, Colorado, Colorado ended up getting Bowen Byram out of the Duchesne deal to Ottawa. 
boom, fourth overall pick. You get a stud like that. And it also happened another time. And then it screwed. Um, then Ottawa, Ottawa ended up getting lucky. What was the other deal they ended up making for somebody? And they got a high pick with Carlson, right? Was that the deal? Yep. I don't remember if that was – either way, if you have a season like this and you trade a first-rounder thinking, all right, we're going to make a push. We got Patrick Kane, one of the best players in the world, to bring Cat to awesome, and then this happens off the start, you can't get a lead in six games. It's just one of the ugliest situations I've ever seen early in a season. I feel, I, I feel bad for Taves. I mean, he doesn't look great. He hasn't played hockey in so long, so obviously it's hard to get back into this, but – yeah, you fire the coach, maybe things change, but call it and like, what's he supposed to do? I don't know. The players are out there playing. The board situation, can you explain what exactly happened there, Biz, when he handed it to the players? Was that him literally telling them you make the play? Yeah, I've seen coaches hand it off to the assistant. I've seen maybe sometimes guys chiming in as maybe even they're drawing on the board. I thought it was extremely odd that the board was handed over and he legit just separated himself from the conversation from at least from what I saw. And listen, (laughs) this may come as a shock to a lot of you. I was not exactly the six on five guy. I I was usually at the end of the bench, just fucking staring at broads in the crowd. Women, excuse me, women. My night's done. Oh, I can't say broads anymore. My my apologies. This will be my last podcast. Wit, I was going to ask you this question. Have you ever been a part of something where the coach just hands it over and there's no coach really involved and the players are there drawing? I don't remember ever having that. I've For the most part, every time you're trying to get a goal, you're down a goal, or you're trying to protect the lead and you're trying to hold on for a win, it's mostly the assistant coach that's usually drawing up the plays or figuring out how to get the puck out or figuring out a formation you want to use. I don't ever remember a guy being like, here you go, boys, you decide. Now, maybe if the players are speaking up, it's, it's really hard to judge that situation. If the players are screaming at him, give us the fucking board. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> now I'm making that up, but who knows what the hell is going on with that team at this point? Well, that would be bad. Oh my well, God. Toronto's down three, one. This oh, is amazing. Dude, Ottawa's Holy back. shit. Ottawa was down four to one. They come back and tied it four four. Um, so he, he, you look at Chicago, though, it's like, I don't know, man. How happy is Duncan Keith? He's on a 5-0 and Oilers team running through everyone, and he's like, Jesus Christ, thank God I got out of there. Everyone thought I stunk. The team stinks. Really? And I, and Flurry, Flurry for sure has not started off great, but he's never really, I don't know if he's dealt with something like this since his first year in Pittsburgh. When you have no defense in front of you, you're getting shots from all over the place. You're getting out-chance, out-shot. There's no chance for a goalie to look good when you're playing like this. I wonder how long if this continues, Carlton has. I mean, we last year we thought there was maybe a period of time where, where Hines in, in Nashville was going to get gassed. I know that Poyle is not typically a GM who likes to change coaches. Mind you, it was a shortened season too, right? So if it would have all went colossal throughout the whole way, I mean, you're not dealing with a full – full length of the season after the game they asked Seth Jones mind you he's only been around for for you know a month and a half now he said that no this is accountability fully on the players you know the, the message that Carlton's sending to us is, is being received we want to play hard for him even when they asked Jonathan Taves about it he said the minute that something bad happens we all pucker up right now the confidence is completely shot everything is just every little mistake we make that's coming back to bite us is just affecting us colossally and you go back to that Detroit game right in the first couple minutes, the Han ends up throwing a pizza ends up right in the back of their net, easy tap in for this Lucas Raymond. And we're going to have to get to him because oh this kid God. is oh. a fucking stallion. But right after that, it's just like, boom, the trickle effect. I was just shocked after getting booed out of the building two games in a row. You're sitting at home, licking your chops after being called out by your fan base. You got the team in Detroit coming off a of back-to-back on the road, traveling across customs, which is another at another hour on the trip. You're changing time zones, and you can't even muster up a good performance. And let's talk about Flurry too. Like the, I don't think the onus is on him at all. I'm looking at some of these goals. They're giving up the blue line so easily, and they play so soft. And if they so think soft. they can just play this run and gun type style and, 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 and win game six, five, they are sadly fucking mistaken because you look at other teams around the league and they're just as loaded. I, I listen, I, I got the clown nose on just as much as Stan Bowman. I thought this was the most improved team in the off season based on the moves they made. I think we can still agree on, on they are one of the most improved teams based on a paper. Am I confident that they can turn it around? 
yeah, I think that that when and Kane's coming, hopefully coming off injury soon. He did miss last game, so that's a big hurt. They're going to get the Leafs at home on Wednesday, which if the Leafs drop this one, this is going to be like the Flint, Michigan mega bowl of drama, right? So we got a, a big one teed up for Wednesday night. But R.A., I, I, did, did you come out with a blog talking about Chicago? And, and you seem to be pretty confident that this this was the way this was heading in the off season. No, I actually, that was our boy chief. I, I, I skate okay. my name at the Blackhawks. I, I don't go into chief's lane. I mean, unless I opine on in, in another blog somewhere, but he said, uh, this is all on Bowman. He has to go. That was the blog I sent you guys a little while ago. And yeah, I think if the works is going to make changes, they need to make wholesale changes. Don't fire the coach because he's still Bowman's higher. Like you got to get rid of all of them. And when you look at chief's blogs and you read them and you look at the series of moves, this guy's made and what he's turned into nothing. And like, He's mishandled assets over and over again. I mean, if I'm Danny Wirtz, like I'm saying, see you later, both years, bring in an interim guy or two for the rest of the year to reevaluate it and, and start from scratch because, I mean, the results with Bowman have, have been terrible, man. He's just like giving away assets. I mean, you look what they did. What um, was it? The Panarin Assad, he turned into so and so, which became Zadorov, which they traded for a draft, like basically turned an all star into a third round draft pick within like three years. So, I don't know, man. Sometimes ownership becomes enamored with some of these front office guys, and they like they they like this guy, especially. And then you add in the whole fucking sex scandal ball. I don't want to call it sex scandal. That all the you know fucking the video guy being a fucking diddler or a touch or whatever. You add all that in, and all the kind of like see no evil, hear no evil, speak don't speak no evil stuff too, man. I don't know, man. If I'm the fucking Blackhawks, I would just be like. Punt it all and just start over at this stage. Given, given that's the way what I'm saying with the lately. fans. The fans are so sick and tired yeah. of the front office. And They're sick and tired of that other story and how disgusting that all seems to be coming out slowly and surely. What actually went on there? And that's why, dude, you have no idea the dark days of the Chicago Blackhawks, 2003, four, five, six. They were so bad, and nobody cares. And that's when I don't even think the team was on TV. So yeah. it's like yeah. th- th- this city has no problem if they're just dis- the city of Chicago has no problem if they're just disgusted with an effort and a team yeah. and a front office to just completely yeah, they'll just shut go it fall down. the Bears. Um, yeah. The whole There's, city sucks, actually. Yeah, call it, I call love them, Chicago. Every team stinks. Oh, actually, the Bulls are good. We, we wish we fucking visit them again. But Carlton was put in like an unwinnable situation either way, like just fall, fall on a legend like Q, not really having a known resume. I don't think he was really set up for success either way. No. But, yeah, I, I, I will know. say, listen, I don't I, I don't we'll blame see. him either. But if this is the response he's going to get from this lineup, we're not we're not talking about a, a team that can't compete for a Stanley Cup. We're talking about a team that's been getting booed out of their own building after every game at home. Like there's so at, at some point, like if, if this continues for the next, you know, 10, 15 games where they're putting up these horrible efforts and not getting anything out of the guys there eventually has to be a somebody, a coaching change. I mean, everybody liked Mike Yo in, in St. Louis. He just wasn't getting the response from the guys. In comes Barube at some point, and, and that kind of leads me to my next point. I think the only thing that's going to change this season around, and I know they got bag skated on Monday after practice, the Chicago Blackhawks, so we'll see the type of response we get on Wednesday. But if that doesn't work... I think we're going to need a practice Donnie Brook. Well, but but RA I mentioned shall, it and so did Chief. Before we if you're going to fire a coach and you're going to get get rid of Carlton and bring someone in, it is true like how are you going to allow Bowman to do that? He's it's like you're going to allow him to hire another coach. It's like that's kind of the issue here is the decisions he's making. So if you're going to fire the coach, it's like get rid of the GM too. I'm not a fan of people losing their jobs. No chance, but at some point, it's like, what is going on here, guys? This is this is like, and it's six games. Are you overreacting? I don't know when you haven't held a lead for one fucking second. Yeah, it's been rough sledding so far. So, uh, anyways, coming out of the gate, uh, kicking the uh, the Blackhawks a little bit. But the other big story this past week, the NHL returned to Seattle for the first time in nearly 100 years. Uh, Seattle Kraken lost the home opener to Vancouver for two Saturday night. Saturday night. The team retired the number 32 for the 32,000 deposits they got. And also because Seattle is the 32nd NHL team. Uh, unfortunately, fans could only watch the game on ESPN Plus or Hulu. ESPN Plus had the exclusivity. So people who've been watching the, I don't know, whatever local station they're used to it, uh, couldn't get it. But either way, Seattle, a little stumble out of the gate. One, four, and one, just 13 goals, four 
23 goals against. Uh, Paul, let's go to you first for a Seattle Kraken take. Well, well I talked to Witt about it uh, today a little bit, and he just said that, you know, they can't they can't provide offense. I mean, you see the home game, it's both D-men getting it and Giordano and Dunn. And, I mean, that building was rocking, though. It, it, looks, it looks huge inside. How many people does it seat? Uh, good I, question. I don't know if it's not, if over 19. It's got that crazy design, too. I don't know if you saw the picture. I think it might have been um, – uh, Sarah Valley, who tweeted it. it, you could actually see the street level. People like walking by on the street can actually like look into the arena because it, like we said before, it goes down into the ground. It looks like one of the cooler buildings in the in the whole league. I, I it, and not to criticize them too early here. I think that they might have overthought it in the expansion draft a little bit. In in su- surprisingly, like even like a guy like Tarasenko, I know there was question marks on his health coming into the season, but like. There were there were certain guys available who could put the puck in the net that they could have taken a quote unquote risk on that they didn't. Um, this might be a plan for the future, though. I, I, I trust that Ron Francis knows what, the, what you know what pieces in order to set up. But yeah, as of right now, that just seems to be the issue: not being able to find the back of the net and most of their offense coming from the back end. So we'll we'll see. Um, but I, I still that the good news is, is they're going to get continued support for at least the first couple of years. And that's just kind of automatic when you get a new team in the league and the amount of excitement surrounding it. But great job by the fan base, incredible rollout. Uh, and uh, yeah, and I'm excited. I'm excited to catch a game there. It looks like an arboretum. There's there's plants and fucking flowers yeah. everywhere. It's what is it? Climate change arena. Yeah. So it's called 17151. 17,151 people jam packed in there. It was a great opener. Giordano got him up 2-1. I actually stayed up, watched the game. All of a sudden, boom, boom, boom. Garland, I think, got the winner on a great yes, little did. fake shot. Ends up sliding in 5 off after a fake slap shot. Um, that's the thing, Biz. They, 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 they're they going to they're gonna struggle to score. But even with a tough start, uh, we mentioned it was nice they got that win early, but it's been a tough start. But that division is like going to be so wide open. I don't think they're at all out of it by any means. It's so early. But it is going to be tough for them to to kind of try to create offense with a forward group that doesn't really look like there's much there goal scoring wise. And, and for a guy they, you know, paid in the off season, I, I feel like Grubauer just hasn't had the timely saves yet. Oh, and, he's not playing in, behind no. Colorado. Oh, okay. Well, that could different do it. ball Ooh. game. Yeah, so I think sometimes flirty. the sometimes the the best moves you you make are the ones that you. How's it? What's you the don't, same? You don't move. Yeah, that's the one. Don't make. Don't move. Don't yep, make. That's the, best the one. Ones of the ones I, I knew what you were saying. Thank yeah. you. Well, conversely, with um, the Edmonton Oilers, they have no problems whatsoever with the offense. Connor McDavid picked up where he left off. Uh, Edmonton's five and old. They got twenty-four goals for thirteen against McDavid. Six goals, thirteen assists. He leads, or he's tied for the lead in both goals and assist categories. Leon Dreisaitl, four goals, seven assists for eleven points. Zach Hyman, business fit right in with this team. Zach Cashin got a couple goals for us in Anaheim the other night. And, of course, they're getting the goaltending. Uh, Mike Smith, 2-0 and on three starts, 9-2-0 save percentage. Koskinen, uh, he started, he's with 3-0, and I believe, 9-4-3 save percentage. This team, man, they got the probably the best memo you can ever get. Busy. Party time in Vegas, dinner, Ryder Cup, Raiders game, fly home. Like, that's probably the best thing a, a team could see when they're on the road, eh? And I'm sure Tippett's happy to be getting it out at the, the beginning of the season. Because there was one year when we were in Arizona, and, and mind you, we ended up winning the division. This is the year when Mike Smith went on his crazy run, but we hadn't done rookie party yet, and and you know we were in the midst of battling for a playoff spot, and he was trying to call it off, and we had it dialed in and lined up for L.A. Sure as shit, we ended up getting the green light. We were so bad in L.A. that next game two days later. Mike Smith must have made 50 fucking saves, and we won one nothing. thank God, and kept that run going. But well-deserved by these guys. These guys, the the moves, I was I was at first, like, you know, surprised with them bringing in Duncan Keith and, you know, what they were willing to do. But Ken Holland's looking like a fucking genius. And this is a team, in my opinion, Weak division, they need to get as much ahead of the game as possible early on because the only the only possibility of not being able to go on a big playoff run is the fact that that Mc, uh, McDavid doesn't really have a governor. He, I, I'm convinced that he wants to get 200 points, and he the every time he's out there, he's trying to fucking score goals. So later in the season, if you're fighting for playoff positioning and you're having to ride that horse, he's going to be too beat. I mean, you saw it last year, and not to take anything away, he had an unbelievable regular season, over 100 points in, in what was it, 56 games. 
But all of a sudden, like, I felt like he had no gas against the Winnipeg Jets. They were out in four games. Is it his fault? Absolutely not. But in the second half of the season, if they're able to establish this big lead and and know that they're going to make playoffs and know that they're going to get a solid seed, who knows, maybe even win that division. I think the more rest you can get for those horses going into playoffs, the better. And, and I don't know, maybe even fucking sit McDavid out a few games. Cause as I said, there's really no governor on the guy. You put him out there and he's just type a, he just fucking goes and goes and goes. And I said it before the season started. I think that he might get 160 points this year, which is uh, astronomical. I couldn't agree. I couldn't, couldn't agree more. Dude. He, he's the best hockey player to ever play hockey. I'm sorry, folks. I'm sorry. He doesn't have all the records. I'm not saying he's the best career. He's the best player that's ever played hockey. It's a joke watching this guy. It's a different level. It's a different league. I've said this 50 times on this show. I saw a thing uh, on NHL Network. They, uh, I think Scotty Hartnell and Bruce Boudreaux had him 50% to get 150 points. Dude, I think he's getting 150 points. Who he's He's averaged 150. I think he has 150 points in his last 82 regular season games. Every single night, he can get six or seven points. You think I'm joking? <laughs> start watching the start. I'm not joking. Start watching the Oilers. Any any chance you get, watch the Oilers. Watch how many points he could get. And to think about it, right? 164s. If he plays every game, that's two points a game. Right now, he's just under three points a game. I don't even think it's fucking crazy to think about this guy getting 200 points. Call me stupid. Call me dumb, dumb wit. Call my ears big. Make fun of my takes. This guy could get 200 points one of these seasons. And the power play, which is clicking at 50% right now, is him, Leon Dreitzel, Nugent Hopkins, that's it. That's just Hyman, the only they put on the air. <laughs> and Tyson Barry. They're snapping it around. They know where each other all are. And Hyman, oh my God. The Leafs, what a joke. The Le- I understand the Leafs, no chance they could afford him with what they fucking pay four forwards up front. But how good does he look? And I actually wondered, I didn't know, right? I, I know the guy works his balls off. I didn't really necessarily think he was as skilled as a lot of people do, but he certainly fits in right away in Edmonton. He goes to the net, he scores 30 goals, he's already got five. Now, granted, you're playing with the greatest hockey player of all time, but I'm an Oilers guy. I told you, I don't care how much they dislike me. I'm on the Oilers this year. I want no team to win the Stanley Cup more than them. I'll say the Flyers, because me and Keith and Kevin, yeah, you know, best friends, right? The party. Yeah, yeah. After that, I'm an Oilers guy. I want them to go on a run. Mike Smith skating. He's coming back. He should be back soon. But it's just about watching McDavid and watching him gun down records. So I believe the highest point total since Yager. Yager had what? around? Can we pull this up, Mikey? It was Kucherov's, like 128 or whatever it was. He's dusting that this year if he stays healthy. Dusting yeah, it. that by Christmas. Dusting it. He could have that after 60 games, dude. It's just so amazing to watch his speed, his skill. He could lead the league in goals, too. It's just it's something to behold. And I love watching him play as everyone else who's ever fucking played or watched hockey does. I'm not speaking crazy here. And but his, this 150 points thing is right there. And his point per game output year over year is continually progressing. It's going up. It's Every going year up. it's going up. Yeah, he's figuring out the algorithm on how to fucking beat guys <laughs> and where to pass pucks through lanes. And <laughs> He's a machine. Wait. Wait, in uh, 2018, 2019, Kucherov had 128 points. Yeah, what before that, I think it was like Yager had 150 or something. Yager was the last guy. Or maybe Lemieux. Did Yager, no, Yager, did Yager ever have 150 points? This is just, yeah, he just must, amazing. Yeah, Yager had to have had 100, at least 150, I would think. Either way, it's very impressive. But the most impressive thing is their ability to surround him with better players this year. And they do have a legitimate chance of winning the Stanley Cup. They just got to throw the nope. governor. 149 in 95 96. The, the last guy with 150 points or more was Mario Lemieux. And I think we're going to see it happen this year. I truly do. Let's so go so. Oilers. I mean, let's go Oilers. I'm an Oilers I mean, guy. I'm Mike, getting a I've jersey. Said- I've said before, oh, we're, we're blessed to be able to watch this kid because I've said a million times, we, we didn't see Gretzky a lot, man. We, we really didn't. Playoffs and sporadic games when he came to your town, if you were lucky to go to the game, we just didn't see a lot of Wayne Gretzky. The fact that we can watch McDavid every night, it's fucking awesome. It's fantastic. And All I'm right, we just gave him the double barrel stroke hey, off session. Hey, we can hey move buddy, on. Hey, buddy, until he stops fucking deserving My wrists it. are oh. sore. 
Oh, by the way, I, I mean, hit you're able active. I need I to hit find your team in Toronto sucks. Biz, I hit yet another first touchdown on a primetime game. DK Metcalf, eight to one. It's like the fifth one I've hit this year. Okay, since we're on the football talk, quick uh, little timeout here. Right. What do you guys make of the Tom Brady situation and the guy handing back the 600 TD ball? Soccer. I mean, um, sucker. I, I get the sentiment. Sucker, you're fucking you're a... dog in the guy. Sucker. He's got the <laughs> Dude, strength coach he... in his face saying, "Give me the ball." You're calling him a sucker. You would have got bullied like, to give you're, it. You're back the last too. guy to hand over a half a fucking mill wet, please. Like, what? no, dude, I'd be, you're the last guy who handed over a, a ball estimated to be worth a half a million dollars over. That's some not that's I already read that the NFL wouldn't authentize authenticize the ball. They, the NFL are bullies that anyone who's dogging that guy's a clown. He was standing there like he didn't know what to do. By the way, what he ended up getting is not at all what I guess that ball could be sold for. But he's got everyone in his face. Like, give me the ball back. Like, I'm, I'm he should I'm get the sorry, pound. Dude, it ain't that easy to just walk out of the game with Tom Brady. It's on Mike Evans for giving it away for people who don't yeah. know tom brady threw his 600th career touchdown pass on sunday Fucking embarrassing crazy. another chicago team 600 600 right sorry. no i'm just i'm, I'm amazed sorry about it. i mean i cut you off i'm amazed that he's thrown the 600 oh, it's it's, it's any and realistically He's probably going to get 700. When the fuck's he going to stop playing? So nobody's ever done it before. And Mike Evans totally out to lunch. He's probably high as a kite playing. He's still unbelievable. He hands the ball to some fan. And so, like, all of a sudden, it was like a panic where they send over all these people and the guy gives the ball back right away and everyone's dogging him online like, what an idiot. I just think it's a lot easier said than done to just take off and not give the ball back when you get all these people. So I believe he ended up getting season tickets for the rest of this year and next, a $1,000 gift card to the pro shop, at least give him cash. (laughs) And then Brady sent him over, like, um, signed helmet and cleats, and then Mike Evans, like the cleats he was wearing. So it was a good amount of stuff. In the end, people are saying the ball was worth 500 grand. I just don't know. Like the NFL are such, I'm not going to call them Nazis, but they are pretty much complete scumbags where they would have like somehow finagled the way to screw that guy over. Yeah. He should have got Giselle in the fantasy suite for one. Dude, night. Romo think, said that Brady should give him a night or two with Giselle on the broadcast. <laughs> no, he did. Uh, he said I no, he didn't, believe he didn't get any, yeah. any fallback for that. No, yeah. hey, Romo can get away with anything. You were telling me recently he was at a charity event and he got he get a hey, so it's did pretty. Did I known. tell that on the pod last week? No, you didn't. You didn't. You told me, but you said he gets. Oh my! No, he, he gets <laughs> buckled. He gets crippled at these events that he goes to because he's probably going to a million of them because he's Tony Romo. And uh, what, what what was the – how did it all shake out, Wit? So Old Sandwich, my golf club, the best place in the world, It's uh, he was down there playing some G. And he had been flown in. I guess he was in town right for the Pats-Cowboys game, but he was giving a big speech at the we, – we met – Francis We Met Foundation or charity. Francis We Met was an amateur, won the U.S. Open early 1900s. He's a legend in golf. And so now there's a huge – foundation that sends kids to college scholarships it's an awesome thing and so he spoke at the big dinner like the big gala he played golf he was buckled buckled couldn't even speak he's up on stage jim nance introduces him he's like what's up jim how you doing i got some clips of this guy couldn't even speak you got, you Dude, got, I got clips, clips. He, he couldn't <laughs> put a sentence together i don't know how much they paid him but what a life where Tony Romo, nasty golfers, flying around the cities, getting paid $17 million a year by CBS to announce games with Jim Nancy. He can't even keep it together to give a speech at the Wimet dinner. Absolutely buckle. Uh, Jim, I uh, thought I played good out there. Yeah, so, uh, eagle. so he, so fuck, I, he dropped that comment on the broadcast. Pretty funny comment, though. Oh, f- no shit. I thought he'd get, I thought he'd get Mike, some Bill, Mike Milbury did it. He'd be canned. <laughs> Fucking Mike Milbury. Mike Milbury says he can be a distraction man. with a woman around, but, yeah. but Romo's yeah. talking about getting a night with Brady's Seriously. wife. Uh, Gonzo. Yeah. In, indecent proposal over here. <laughs> Speaking of other uh, the older guys making comments, uh, Don Cherry. Not happy about uh, Austin Shocker. Matthews strolling in like he's strolling into a barbecue. Yeah. Now, I love Don. Same. I would say that wearing a nice track suit compared to some of the crazy suits that he wore would be like a like nicer dressed. And and last time I chirped Don Cherry suits on the podcast, people were like, "Oh, he donates those to charity." It's like, yeah, like I okay, well, that's a great he gesture. Still wears them. <laughs> he, I know he's, thick, but come on, like some somebody tweeted out a photo of that nasty green one that looks like the the third jerseys for the Dallas Stars, and he had that big hat on too. 
So I don't know. I as far as the fashion goes, I think Donnie Boy. Eh, eh. Yeah, I think that's an expected take from Don Cherry that he doesn't like the relaxation of the dress code. That was pretty probably predictable, I'd say. But I mean, they're not going to listen to him. It's not like uh, Dubas is going to change anything at this point. No, Sportsnet rehired him. <laughs> listen, listen. They to just this. fired Sheldon. They just fired Sheldon Key from brought back brought in yeah. Don Cherry. Yeah, I mean, I'd ra- I'd rather look. Nice and some sick jeans, nice kicks, and like maybe a top you grab over at Vince or something. I don't even know what's cool than wear a fucking fluorescent green suit that Don Cherry's had on before. That's more offensive than walking in with a hole in your jeans. In my <laughs> mind. In my mind, too. Uh, yeah, I, it feels like there's a ripple effect going on here. More, more uh, teams might relax. I'm sure they we said, will never that. Do it. Ray won't say anything bad yeah. about Don because well, he coached for the Bruins. And what well, keeps happening. Um, all right, we mentioned Edmonton as a hot team out of the gate. The only other team that has yet to lose in their first five games, the Florida Panthers, 5-0 and out of the gate, 22 goals for, 9 against. They've had a balanced scoring attack with some top goal tending. But, but, I think we but, got a couple undefeated teams around the league, all right. Well, I know, but I, I, I specified undefeated in their first five. As a, oh, okay, excuse me. Teams. Go right That's ahead. That's okay, buddy. Uh, Bobrovsky 4 0 and four games started 199 goals against 942 save percentage. This is what Florida was looking for, and they signed him to a $10 million deal. And Spencer Knight got his first start versus Tampa Bay, which I thought was significant. Stopped 30 of 31 shots. And like I said, they're just getting a balanced scoring attack. Hubert Dover, Hagee, Bakoff, Ekblad, Bennett, uh, this rookie Anton Lindell, he was taking 12th overall on 20. Uh, they're just getting it done, uh, but 5 0, nice little stop for the Cats so far with. They look great. I think I said before the year that they could easily win that division. It's finally uh, maybe them on a little bit of an even playing field with Tampa in terms of what they lost step-wise. I've talked about Barkov and what I think about him, how great of a player he is. And, I mean, I actually don't think Huberdeau gets enough respect either because offensively, this dude's a wizard, scores big goals, plays hard, is not easy to play against, which some people who don't see him often may think. But... Bennett coming over and being this good offensively ever since last year's trade from Calgary has been such a big, big like jump for them. I think that bottom line with like Thornton and Hornquist, they can play in the other team's end. They could be pain in the ass to play against. I don't, I don't know much about, I think they got a third line center right now. Luce Steinen. I, I, I don't know anything about him, so I can't speak on that. But he's playing with Marchman and Reinhardt. Reinhardt was one of the bigger players to come over this summer. I think we talked about that. Him leaving Buffalo, people didn't understand how good he actually was for the Sabres. Ekblad's healthy. And then the one question, and the thing we've dogged before, is Bobrovsky and how much money he makes with Spencer Knight there. But if he's going to play like this, Jesus Christ. So I was looking at this team really being at the top of the league and, and, and no doubt that division with Spencer Knight possibly being there, being their, their go-to guy. And it, it looks like that might not be the case yet, but even to know that you have him, if Bobrovsky does slow down and can't keep this toward pace, it shows how good this team really is. So Quenville, he's proven everywhere that he's an amazing coach. He can get through to guys. I'm sure he's happy as hell out of this disaster. That was Chicago. He's in great weather. He's got a good team. And that team is going to continue to win games this season. It's not at all fluke this start. They're that good. Holy shit. Was that a fucking breakdown? They're nasty. They're oh, a nasty team. I don't have and a I hate word. seeing it because Yans is gone. But fuck, I got to you give got to give credit where credit due. They're, they're filth. You didn't even leave me any crumbs with. <laughs> well, fuck, you're on TV. Figure it out. Think of something. Well, what if I, that was just Gretzky and, 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 and Anson and they went to you? What are you going to say? Uh, I would say... I would say, where's your fucking shot clock? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Wayno, where the fuck's your shot clock, bitch? I can't believe they gave you a shot clock. That was dirty. They the only, the, dirty. I, you mentioned Ekblad. The only thing I could follow up with is the fact that he's coming off that nasty injury, but he hasn't skipped a beat. I mean, he just scored his third goal. They're pumping on the Arizona Coyotes, unfortunately. But they are just so well balanced. And, and the, I guess the biggest question mark coming in as a opposed to Ekblad's health because you know you you need your ace back there we always talk about it was Bobble and he's playing like the 10 million dollar man that he is and you just mentioned that insurance policy they have in Spencer Knight who's actually playing in this game uh this game tonight against the Coyotes they're up 3-1 so uh yeah they look they look really good I and I also hope they get a little bit more fan support because I've been looking at the like chiming into their games and they're not really drawing as well that I, I would, I would expect. I but know the snowbirds aren't down yet. That's, that's true. And football season still is on. And actually um, 
I know I keep drawing it back to other sports is we had the tw- 25th ever sports equinox on Sunday where we had MLB playing NFL hockey and basketball. And I was surprised to hear that that was only the 25th time in history that all four major sports leagues were playing on the same day. How come that doesn't happen every year? Yeah, well, it, it used to never happen just because there used to be no overlap between, I believe it was baseball and basketball for years. Or there was basically, there was a period of time also when football ends, um, what else isn't going on? There was never, but the last few years, because of the prevalence of playoffs, seasons getting expanded, like we've seen, we've seen it before, whereas it like, was not a fixture of IU. And, and football is only being played on, well, I know Thursday, it used to not be played on Thursdays. They used to have the Sunday and then the Monday nighter, but obviously baseball being, you know, backed up a little bit, but I just thought I'd bust that in for a little fun fact. And you told me to chime in. So fuck. Sports so equinox too. That's a great little term. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. That is a good one. All right. Let's see. Well, I'll quickly wrap it up on Florida yeah, yeah. though. Like to have Reinhardt on the third line. And I, who knows how these, these lines switch like flip and flop. But it just shows the depth where they're getting like this kid Owen Tippett can play. He's on the second line with Bennett and Huberdo. Yeah, Ginger. And 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 Chief, shout out the shitbag Blackhawks. By the way, I love the city of Chicago. The team stinks. He brought up too. They got Quenville running the show there. They got Forsling looking great on D playing with Gudas. And then they got Duclair, who was another Chicago send off on the first line with Barkov. So oh, geez. just another kick in the nuts for Hawks fans. Just absolutely kick and stand on pushy crusher. Six nine, right in the dick. Now, listen. I know I said I would take a sky dump on on Bill Zito's car last year after he tried to fuck over our boy Yans, but credit where it's due. Nobody's going to be sky dumping on his car this year. He's made some great moves and got that put that team in a in a good spot. So it's great to talk about new organizations on the pod. I know it's been a while since Florida's been relevant. Is it the year of the rat? Let's hope not. We shall see. Uh, next team up to talk about Carolina Hurricanes 4-0 out of the gate. They're presently playing Toronto right now. As we speak, they're up, uh, I believe three to one on the third period, uh, Monday night we're recording, uh, Carolina, man, they're getting back to a form. We saw a couple of years ago, so far outscored the opposition 18 to seven, not including tonight. Uh, we had the whole caught kitten hemi situation. He returned to Montreal the other night. He got booed and he scored. Um, we had a Brendan Gallagher goal disallowed, but how about this? The funny part of this whole, the funniest part of this whole thing, the Carolina hurricanes bought the uh, internet domain, did the Habs lose.com. Oh my goodness. And when you this clicked on it, out of control. and when you clicked on it, you could buy t-shirts for either Aho or caught Kenny Hemi with, for twenty dollars each. Of course, that's the signing bonus number in Aho's number and the promo code we, oh, you, we, yes, in French. So, <sighs> ultimate trolling, but a hacker got the last laugh. Apparently, a hacker come in and hacked the account that uh, Carolina created. So, you couldn't buy those shirts anymore. And the team came on and said, Hey, man, we're here to entertain. We're just having fun, which I think is great because no harm, no foul. Uh, but either way, Carolina 4 0 on the verge of 5 0. Uh, but the Kotkin Yemi stuff, Biz, I know you also want to chime in on the uh, Gallagher goal, too. Well, I'll, I'll go back to that, but they weren't done trolling. Before the Leaf game, they fucking send the PJ over. They bring in David Ayers to get the crowd pumped up. They are just on him. I think he's already done it once. Yeah. They they are just on a a troll job mission. Um, Yeah, so the Gallagher goal. I had uh, Ryan Miller scored on him, by the way. Uh, He chirped me on Twitter. Ray Croft chirped me on Twitter. Mike McKenna chirped me on Twitter. I thought that... I think that the rule is getting a little bit soft. They said that he impeded Anderson's ability to stop that puck. I thought that Anderson had already established position. Gallagher's skate heels were on the line of the crease, and they were both in a squat position. So it's not like it's, it didn't look like he was impeding with his space nor touching him. The, the At the point where he ends up touching him was where he, when he reached up, deflected the puck, but by then it looked like it was already behind him. I thought it was a bullshit uh, uh, goaltender interference. I think that Gallagher seems to get fucked on at least two or three of these every year. Mind you, he is going to the blue paint every night. He goes to those dirty areas. I just thought that one in particular was one of those eye roll ones where I compare it to the way that the NFL has gone with the roughing the passer where you're just like, Jesus Christ, we're trying to create offense here. And that's the type of soft shit that you're going to call back. So of course that, uh, of course the Habs ended up getting routed. 
Um, RA, I think that you disagreed where you're like, no, well, within the rules, that was goalie interference. So I was like, ah, fuck, whatever. I'll let it go. But cock, cock the Emmy, if that's even how you say it, I'm going to just bury that yeah, one. We'll, we'll, we'll roll with it. W- w- I mean, well-deserved after taking booze for what? Signing the offer yeah. sheet? Is that what he got paid. booed for? Yeah, Getting, I mean. Get, making, making some bread? They're just taking all their frustration yeah. on their team out on him. They all just know their team stinks, so let's blame this guy. Let's yell at him. And to he stick with wrong. And to stick with Carolina, like what else needs to be said that we haven't already said? Incredible culture that's been established. You knew that Rob Brindamore was going to have these guys ready to go. The big dogs continue to produce. They haven't skipped a beat after losing Dougie Hamilton. They just fill in that role and – I mean, this, this this is a playoff team. They're dangerous. We all know that they could e- like they could easily go on a run and win the Stanley Cup. And I think that Anderson just needed to get out of Toronto, clear his mind, and I think he's yep. going to have an incredible bounce back season, much like probably any net miner that spent too much time in Toronto. Nine forty four save percentage. Uh, Biz one seventy five goals against. Stopped eighteen and nineteen thus far tonight. Uh, he has been a difference, and the change of scenery could be great for his career. Go ahead, back to you, Wit. Sorry. No, I, I was, I've, I've, I've watched this whole Leafs game. Matthews got one on him, being best buddies. Kind of not surprised there. Uh, and Matthews was so due, but this team is really good, man. They're going to compete. They're going to be right there. They're going to be in the playoffs with a chance to win the Stanley Cup. Really dependent on goaltending, I think, and the ability to score come playoff crunch time. But I love this team. Svechnikov. Whew. That guy is something else. Tara Vinen and Aho have this special connection. Cockton Yemi's been playing with them. This Neckish, I don't know how to say his name, Filth, just another guy that they've kind of brought up, brought in, that's looked good. I think Ethan Bear has been really solid so far with Slavin, and, and I just think they play with a ton of pace. It's like yeah. Brindamore, we've talked all last year, they play exactly like the way Rod Brindamore played. So it's a deep team. Derek Stepan's on that team, so it's like a veteran down on the fourth line that can kill penalties. It's just a team that's going to be in the hunt all season long to compete for their division, and they're showing right now that they're a much better team than Toronto. I think there's been times Toronto's looked good tonight, but Carolina's just wore them down and gotten great goaltending. And the team we just mentioned before that, Montreal, Absolutely disastrous start. 0 and 5 out of the gate. They were outscored 19 to 4. Uh, they did get a 6 to 1 win uh, Saturday over Detroit, but this is a broken team right now. Uh, they tied the worst start to a season for a team that went to the Stanley Cup final the previous year. Uh, unfortunately, the Berger van said, quote, it's a long shot that uh, Shea Weber ever plays again. Uh, Jonathan Drew, yeah, Jonathan Druin is leading the uh, team two goals, three assists, five points in six uh, games, followed by Perot, then Dvorak. Uh, Suzuki, he got that big paycheck. He's got one assist. Uh, Caulfield, one assist. This is, I'm sorry, going into our recording. Galaga, no point yet. Uh, Jake Allen has been forced into more of a starter's role due to the Gary Price situation. Uh, one and four, the two six five, and a nine oh five going into uh, again this recording. Just a disaster for Montreal right now. It's going to get to the point maybe uh, wit where it's going to be too big to dig, dig out of perhaps. Oh, it's it's uh, it's they're, they're done. They have no chance of making the playoffs. Zero. Yeah. I don't even think they did. You know what? They had a chance if Carey Price was playing and playing like his usual self. Yeah, because he keeps you in games. But they can't score. They're missing their leader on defense. It's really shitty to hear that 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 Bergevin says he, Shea Weber probably will never play again. But he's been through so much, battled for so long. You're not really that surprised. But... I mean, Gallagher zeros on the board so far. Like you mentioned, Suzuki one assist. I, I, I said in a couple of weeks ago, they lost to no. Like, you don't really understand what that does. It makes a center like Suzuki get all these matchups that he hadn't been dealing with prior. So it's a, it's a tough, very tough sledding right now for this team. Um, I don't really know what you hold hope on. I mean, that they dusted Detroit, which was good, but... I, I look at that team like their their power play has been pathetic before, and now they don't even have the big shot of Weber on there. It's not like that's going to make them any better on the man advantage. And then the goaltending without Price, it's just they're a team that's just severely outmatched almost every game they play, along with a fan base that is going to get worse and worse and more ruthless and ruthless as this goes on. So certainly if you're a Toronto Maple Leafs or Montreal Canadian fan right now, you want to puke. Yeah, I think that run last year kind of provided a little bit of false hope as to what it was the a action... phony run. It, it wasn't a phony run. It they was got... a phony fucking run. 
<laughs> Tabarnak. Um, they got incredible goaltending and the most timely goal scoring from guys that came out of nowhere ever. So yeah, you just you, you're not going to be able to replicate that in a full 82 game season. That's why I didn't have them making playoffs. And at this point, other than that win against Detroit, where they didn't have Detroit didn't have their best player because he couldn't even go to Canada, they pounded them. But we're not going to see much of that this year. And I guess your your only hope is that you get out of this season where you see some progression from the young guys like Caulfield, who you know he's these guys all of a sudden they don't have a, a, enough guys around that are taking the the microscope off of them. And then Suzuki signs this massive deal. He's got one assist so far. Yeah. Is there a lot of hockey left, but guys, these kids are getting paid based on what they're projecting, what they can provide. You just gotta, you gotta hope that, that this, this type of season doesn't beat the wheels off of the guy's confidence moving forward to where he at least gets to close to what you ended up paying him. Cause that's a lot of money coming his way. I mean, I, I'm all over them. They're no, they're not they're not as bad as I'm. As, they're not this bad, right? Like you got to think Anderson ends up getting going at some point. Caulfield's going to score 20 goals. I I believe that. So at some point, this team will will get going a little bit. But I just I truly think that there's no chance of making playoffs. And I thought that before the season even began, and you saw this start. Yeah, we're gonna have to see the the old Toffoli. We're gonna have to see the old Hoffman. We're gonna have to see the old uh, who'd you just mention? I'm very happy though for Anderson. Uh, I just Anderson. mentioned Anderson. I'm very happy though for Druen because everyone yeah. knows what he's been through mentally and 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 coming back and and at least having some success on the score sheet. It's good to see a story like that come out of a team where there's not many good storylines right now. Well said. Well, whether you're ready to pop the question or mark a special occasion, find jewelry as unique as her with the modern convenience of online shopping at BlueNile.com. Pick from a vast selection of preset diamonds and gemstone jewelry. Blue Nile offers endless options ready to ship same day. Having trouble choosing? Blue Nile has jewelry experts on hand 24-7. Available via phone or chat to help you find or build a memorable gift at a, every budget. BlueNile.com is the original online jeweler. Since 1999, they've helped millions of couples create their perfect engagement ring. Mark the moments that matter with jewelry from BlueNile.com and listeners get $50 off $500. This podcast exclusive offers, in, I'm sorry, this podcast exclusive offer includes engagement rings. So use the code Chicklets. That's code Chicklets, C H I C L E T S. Every order is insured, ships free, and arrives in discreet packaging that won't give away what's inside. So shop stress free and find your forever peace. Go to BlueDial.com today and use the code Chicklets. Oh, with all the, the jewelry talk, I thought you were going to mention Tampa Bay and their new rings. Who yeah. Were brought yeah they, out. Got, they got the rings, Biz. We'll get to them a little bit later, though. It's you got my hopes weird. up to talk about Fallout Boy, who, who um, headed that concert that they had, the little private concert. But let's talk about the Leafs before we yep. get to Mr. Negative Wit. Two, three, and one out of the gate. Two. Outs good, 19 to 12. Mitch Mono just one assist in the first six games. Austin Matthews, uh, no points in the first three games. I know we obviously fixed that in the fourth game, but uh, that first game versus the Rangers, when he came back, Biz, I know that was an insane game. The Rangers won 2-1 Panarin's OT goal. I know uh, Mr. Gretzky himself had an OT proposal you wanted to, uh, to mention well, on the show. Yeah, unreal three-on-three. Three. Matthews actually had, almost ended up scoring. Was it uh, Shesterkin in that when he ended up coming out and challenged him? And Truva made a great play on the puck. But those are the types of three-on-threes that you want to last 10 minutes long. And I still think that the league should – consider extending the 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 three on three overtime to 10 minutes i think david amber mentioned it online as of right now they say the the pa just based on like the the safety of the players because usually the guys playing three on three are the guys who have already lugged 22 minutes of ice time and then as far as some d maybe in the 28 minutes range so you don't want to play even longer getting into different cities later but uh, I, I digress. Um, what Wayne was saying is a lot of the times in these three on three is you're getting teams, even if they have possession in the offensive zone, sometimes they'll bring the puck back to ragged in order to like reset, maybe get a, little, a few you know, fresh players off. He said, once you cross center with it, you shouldn't be able to bring it back outside center ice. You could bring it back outside the zone but not go past center. So you're not having these guys rag the puck and kill a lot of the three on three time. 
And he thinks that it'll, it'll, it'll increase the place, the pace kind of like in basketball where you can't go over and back. I thought it was a nice little small proposal in order to make the, the, the pace pick up and not waste as much of the, the minimal three on three time that we have. Do you agree with that? Would you like to see the fact that you can't bring it back across center ice? Maybe, maybe let's say this when you get it full possession in the offensive zone. Uh, I'm trying to picture like what it would look like. I don't know. I, I understand how when they do throw it back to the goalie or really like take it out of the offensive zone to reset, maybe get some new guys in there and hopefully catch the other three tired, not allow yeah. them to change. But a lot of times they're going back and they kind of wheel it right back up. I think what ends up being an issue sometimes is when it's three on three and it's man on man in the offensive zone, there's just really nothing going on. That's when it's like most boring. I feel like, because once you start getting the rushes back and forth, it's great. That overtime was one of the best three-on-three overtimes I've ever seen the other night, Rangers-Toronto. I actually thought that game, it was Matthew's first game back. He could have had eight goals. He was a force. Um, But I guess I see what what the great one's talking about. It's more about like it would just be weird off the hop seeing how it would go because guys would still take take it out of the zone, but it'd be harder to get the change. You couldn't throw it back to the goalie. Um, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that one. I got to think about it a little bit longer. Okay, so going back to the Leafs, as far as their play, they're two, three, and one. No need two, to four, hit the panic. Two, four, and one. They just, oh, is the game over now? They got well, three go, minutes, go. they're down three, one, they stink. I guess I'm not winning that puck line bet, for fuck's sake. Shanny, I want my 100 bucks back. <laughs> Before this game, they were leading the league in scoring chances, slot shots, cycle chances, and rebound chances. And this is, comes from Mike Kelly, who, who's a, a big analytic guy. They're getting the cracks. Marner is in a massive rut. I was listening to the 32 Thoughts podcast, and Elliot seemed to think that the noise, especially in the playoff time, definitely affects Marner, and it build it up, it, it, especially through the, the, the run as Game 7, it, it, like the series prolonged and went to Game 7, excuse me. I don't know if that's carried over, but you listen to, to Morgan, Morgan Riley speak or anyone in that locker room, they say, despite the struggles that these guys have offensively, the attitude that they bring to the rink every day and their, their, um, their desire to get better and to want to win, that doesn't change. They don't slug, shrug their shoulders or whatever it may be. That's why I have confidence in this team. We knew there was going to be some question marks coming in with the fact that they had to replace Hyman. They did so by doing it with cheaper players like bunting. I don't know if necessarily the Richie experiments uh, worked out. Um, That was your boy though. Listen, I said he had a good preseason and the fact that he looked like he could step into that role. Do I put a lot of stock in preseason? No, but I was fucking hopeful because I'm, I'm a, I'm a pessimist or no, an opt. What is it? (laughs) Shut up, Wit. Optimist. I'm an thank you, Grinelli. I'm an optimist. And I still think this team can fucking figure it out. They're gonna make playoffs. I know that. I bet my dick on it. They're gonna figure out the offense. I just showed you all those those uh, analytical things that they've been doing properly. The puck's gonna find the back of the net. Mitch Marner's still gonna end up getting, you know, 60, 70 points, and he's gonna heat up once he gets out of this rut. Everybody goes through it at some point in their career. Austin Matthews, we know he's going to get his scoring chances. He just potted his first this season. He's going to get going. Everybody's bitching about Tavares looks slow. Tavares looks slow. You think he fucking cares about the first 10, 15 games of the season, knowing this is a playoff team? No, he's going to get the bus warmed up. He's going to find his hot streak. The D's going to get rolling. They're going to get the goaltending they need. For a fan to throw a jersey on the ice when your team is 2-3-1, and Bad. You need fucking, a fucking brain transplant. Someone's trying to go viral or something. Cause like, come on, wait, get over two, get three over and one getting a Jersey yeah. chucked on the ice. So Stupid. fuck off with this Stupid. panic button bullshit. Have they been playing their best hockey? No. And this is the type of team you guys know what you leave fans when they get in that offensive rhythm. It's like watching a, it's like watching like a fucking a beautiful ballet. All of us. Oh my God. Everything's working. And when it's not, Sometimes it can look really ugly and disappointing, and that's where it's at right now. So once they catch their confidence and their stride, they are going to be a playoff team. Are they going to contend for the Stanley Cup? Well, we've yet to see it. And if anything, I'm more happy that they're going through this adversity at the beginning of the season than they are come right around the corner from playoffs, baby. So right over to Wit. I don't. I don't. uh, I think it's. I think they're a good team. I think they're an above average team. I think that you want to know what they have in common with like the Buffalo Sabres, though? 
They both have the exact same chance at winning the Stanley Cup. <laughs> You're I'm a not fucking kidding. idiot. No, 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 no. You're a fucking there idiot. There is zero chance this team could win a Stanley Cup. Zero. I'm telling you this right now, dude. They have fucking three forwards that make 34 million bucks. Matthews is the only one that's worth it, what he's making, in my mind. Marner, first team all star, no doubt. This guy, when he's on, fuck, is he unreal? He's over, I think, three years in a row now. He's a lot over a point per game player. He's great. But the way this team is built, they have zero chance at winning the Stanley Cup. And I think that they are a playoff team. I think they can get in. But I think that you look at the depth, you look at the goaltending. I love Morgan Riley. Look at a lot of the D. It's just, it's not there, dude. It's not there. I think they're a good team. I think when they get going, and you talked about those numbers, it's for certain that their shooting percentage is going to go up. It's really low right now. It'll go back to a a level where it's kind of normal when they'll start getting more than two goals a game. But they ain't winning the cup, dude. This team has cup aspirations. Maybe deep down, they actually like know that they can't win. Maybe deep down, Dubas knows there's so, there's no chance this team could win a Stanley Cup. I just want to win around in the playoffs to actually get like some good faith from the fans. But if you're a true fan of the Maple Leafs and you're watching us on YouTube, look in my eyes and try telling me that you think this team could win the Stanley Cup. Put your Cup. cock on the line. I fucking put my cock on the line. Yeah, and you didn't do anything about it. Your bets are fucking I doubled down. Don't even, you don't even pay I doubled down. Don't I said do if they miss playoffs, yeah, I'll Yeah, you're not going to do it again. There's no chance the Toronto Maple Leafs win the Stanley Cup. You heard it here first. And I do think that Matthews is so incredible that he's worth that money. Tavares, I understand why he got the money, but as he's getting older, you're seeing his game dwindle down a little bit. Foot speed thing is an issue. I understand what you're saying, Biz. He knows it's a marathon, not a sprint. He's not at all panicked that he's gotten off to a little bit of a slow start. The Marner one is different, and it's different because he's a Toronto kid. Every single person in the province knows how much money he makes. And he looks like he's not having fun. He looks like he needs to have one of those moments and it'll happen this year. Marner will have a 10 game stretch this year. He gets 20 points. I'll guarantee it. But it looks right now like the weight of the world's on him. And tonight he got walked on the point. He got walked by Slavin in the third goal, just completely torched at the offensive, his defensive blue line. And it's just like the, the shoulder shrug. And I know what you're saying. Morgan Riley says, these guys show up. What else is he going to say? He's their teammate. You can't tell me like right now, Marner's body language on the ice looks like a guy who's kind of happy to be playing hockey. I think right now he's feeling I make $11.3 million, whatever I make. I'm expected to score at least a point or two every night. And I'm not doing my job. And I'm starting to actually hear about it. It's, it's the same thing in pro sports. It doesn't matter what sport you're talking about. When you have young players, and th- th- like maybe not McDavid, but even in his case, at some point you go through adversity. And it is good that he's going through it right now. But when, when and I don't know Mitch Barner personally, but in looking from the outside as a fan of the NHL and how good he can be, when has that kid ever had adversity? He's hitting it right now. And it's definitely a lot easier than the times well, when you score goals. Uh, yeah, but this is like the same thing almost. It's like, I mean, this I don't is think like... he scored a goal in the last 20 games, right? Like go, dating back to, to, to last playoff and then even going into the regular se- last regular season a little bit. I know. Yeah, I, I don't think he's – I don't know how many – has he even ever scored a playoff goal? Dude, this team, like, you want Marner, you want Marner making that money on this team? No, I think I, I think what's happened, and it, it's I mean it's in the past. I think that when when that all went down, he he put an amount some amount, amount. What is it? An, an amount, amount, um, immense, uh, immense, 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 amount? immense. Struggling with the words today. Immense amount of pressure on himself, and the playoff performance hurts you. And then now the fact that off of that horrible playoff performance, you think, okay, we're we're gonna at least get regular season Mitch to start the season, and then everybody's gonna back off. And then all of a sudden, he's got, what, one assist in the last six games to start the year? Top in here, Grinelli. Biz, he has five playoff goals in his career, but he doesn't have a single playoff goal in the past two seasons. There you go. So, and then, like I said, dating back to last regular season, I don't know when it's been since he scored a goal. So, I think he Okay, so I just wonder, I just wonder, like, when you look at teams, it's like, you know, they decided we're going to get as much as we possibly can get. 
and and now it's like look at this team like lo- look at how much money is given to those three guys like how do you how do you feel the cup contender when that's the case i just think and, they got to get hot at the right time and <laughs> and they got they got they got enough good players they got a, enough good players good ones if it like for instance what Nylander did in playoffs last year if he can repeat that if they get in if you get you got a great second line center in Tavares if he's able to heat up. Marner and Matthews speak for themselves if they can find that playoff stride. I just think it's all about timing with this with these guys because you see them go through these cycles, and 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 that's what I'm going to base my hope on, and in the fact that they can actually keep Morgan Riley because he's up for contract. So there was a lot of question marks coming into the season, including Matthews coming off of injury as well. So we're it's early. I'm not chucking my jersey on the ice. I still think this is a very good hockey team, and I'm excited to see them turn it around. All right. I'll say they're good. Not putting very good on it, but they are a good team, and it won't be this bad. But this is when you got to really kind of try to be as positive as you can if you're Mitch Marner because, like, sulking. I'm not saying he's sulking, but sulking and being like, woe is me is is not going to get you anywhere. Right, you heard you're hearing that from somebody who fucking went through his whole career. Well, he doesn't want to give Steve me. Dangle a heart attack. He's, he's probably something. upset. That's why he's shrugging his shoulders. <laughs> All right, boys, moving right along. The New York Rangers, another team with a pretty good shot out of the gate. A 4-1 on one start. Uh, 4-0 and trip was their first perfect trip of four or more games since February of 2015. They had that big Saturday comeback versus Ottawa. Uh, losing 2 nothing with five minutes left. They scored three goals in the final 320 to win the game. Almost got a little puck line Jesus action there while we were watching it. That part, I know we talked about uh, Fox on here. That pass from him to Lindgren, from D to D, and going to the crease. Absolutely unreal goal. I'm not sure if you guys caught that, but pretty adventurous game as well. Uh, Chris Craddock crashed the net, knocked into Murray, ended up knocking him out of the game. I don't think he did it deliberately. I don't think it was on purpose, but... Brady Kachuk went after him. Of course, Brady fought earlier in the game, fought Jacob Trouber as well. Uh, pretty entertaining tilt, but uh, show the Rangers look like a different team this year, what so far than we saw last year. No doubt. Um, they had one off night. It happened to be opening night when when Washington put a beat down on them. And since then, it's been it's been lights out. The goaltending has been phenomenal. Shesterkin is sick. This guy, it it the Shesterkin and Sorokin in in Long Island is shaping up to be two legendary goalies yeah. for the Islanders Rangers rivalry. But and and the fans are kind of chirping each other as to who's got the better goalie. I think I yeah I I I kind of lean towards Sorokin. I meant to tell you guys as much as it pains me to say the Islanders are winning the cup. Ugh. The Islanders are winning the cup. Yeah, uh, I'll go back to the Rangers quick. I, I hope so. I like this team. Have you seen Revo's little? Uh, little scream before the game too. Yeah. Shesterkin set us free or release us or whatever he says. So uh, I think that they're fun to watch. First off, I really enjoy watching this Rangers team play to have some and the friendly air really kind of having a connection and Criders on that line. And then also like Panarin turns Strom, you know, Panarin makes Strom a better player than he is. I, 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 I like Strom's game. I think Ryan Strom's a great player, but when you're playing with Panarin, he's like, this guy's going to get him paid. He's going to make this dude a lot of money. And so the ability to have Reeves on the fourth line with some toughness that they didn't have. Um, I, I I don't know enough about this Heedle. Philippe Heedle, is that his name? He's playing yeah. third line center right now. I know he's skilled offensively, but like Sammy Blay on that line and Gauthier, it's it's a different team than last year because I think they've just, with a couple of additions, they've at least added a little bit of sandpaper and then Fox hasn't slowed down at all. So you talk about like the slump after winning the Norris. Nope. We talked about him. We blew him last week so we can kind of hold the horses on that. I know his Matt is. Well, I mean, did you see the fucking plays he made on the road trip? He fucking oh, made dude, a ridiculous the one play. In, oh, in Nashville. And then the, the game against Ottawa, man, the pump fakes he threw at the blue line, even to open himself up to give that backdoor tap in like, Come on, man. I think the only kind of, que- not question mark, but maybe weakness is their D. Uh, like, they're, they're, they're 5'6", Nemeth and Lundqvist. Uh, You know, Keandre Miller's young. I think that he's definitely had steps of improvement this year, at least from what I'm reading around the Rangers. And Troub is obviously making a ton of money. I think you kind of hope you get a little bit more offense out of him, but you don't necessarily need it with Fox. So it's a team that really can rely on goaltending now because even when Yorgiev's in, they're, he's good. So, but Shesterkin, no doubt, is their number one, and he is filthy. I love saying guys are filthy. It's just like it rolls off my tongue. I I wish somebody said I was filthy. They say I'm filthy off the ice. I never got filthy playing. 
four and zero road trip. I don't know when the last time they did that was, but that obviously set the tone, got a lot of guys' confidence brewing. Goudreau's fit in perfectly. Um, a couple big clutch goals for them. And then you mentioned that Sammy Blay. Like, I don't know if a lot of people would criticize his skating when he came up. Not sure if he could keep up at the NHL pace, but the plays he makes with his like, – he's got silky, silky mitts. And he's been finding guys wide open. That Lafreniere, I think, I think it was in um, in Nashville where he ended up setting them up back door. That was the pass Fox gave to uh, Blay first. To Blay first. So these yeah. guys are just clicking on all cylinders right now. Going back to that hit on Murray, guys, that was one hundred percent accidental. Oh, I ended I up sending out a tweet being like, "Do people actually think this is intentional?" People thought I said it in the tone of like I was just like genuinely yeah. asking the question. Some people are fucking dumb in there. I well, even had sarcasm. Larry, Larry Brooks and, came after me. Sarcasm and Twitter are oil and water too, biz. So like you know, you everybody looks sarcasm. back to Kreider. I think he hit Carey Price like six years ago. So everybody just is like going to hold it to him for the rest of his life. They basically treat him like he's Hannibal Lecter when they put put him on the ice. Anyway, great team that's clicking, and of course. Coaching probably has a lot to do with it. Those guys are playing loose and loving life right now. So I was bullish on the Rangers from the start. The only the only big pick I had in preseason not making me look like a complete fucking donkey right now. Hello, Clarice. <laughs> Hannibal, you said Hannibal like this. Sorry. Can't well, that's what they're that. treating him like every time he's out yeah. on the ice. They think he's the dirty. I saw player. some people respond to your tweet. Like, well, when yeah. they meet, you know, when it happens over and over, it's like, dude, it hasn't really happened that many hey, times. It's, it's good to see. And, and the and the on ice awareness, maybe it's just not there. And it wasn't intentional. I mean, we did see him go offside by 20 feet. A couple times. Also, I, I did mention Brady Kachuk fought uh, Jacob Trouba that day. Per the uh, hockeyfights.com polls, Brady Kachuk, 11-3 and three in his short careers. In, in well, NHL. you said that he oh, went after oh, Kreider. Um, th- yeah, that was more a of a result yeah. for when yeah. uh, the goalie was pulled and he hit it, <laughs> and Kreider hit one of their guys from behind, yeah. which, was, which was a boarding. He yeah. was, I think he was a little bit more aware of his positioning on, on that hit. So Brady said, hey, I've seen enough of this shit, and then went after him. And I think he tried to shove his fist down his throat. Kreider's kind of one of those guys, maybe like uh, not an in, you know, a diehard Rangers fan or a re- an enormous NHL fan may not know. He's like two twenty five. You beast. know what I mean? Like I remember telling people who didn't watch a ton of Marion Hosa, like how big he was. They're like, "What, really?" Kreider's fucking enormous. So you see him hammering guys all the time because he's one of those dudes. He just runs into somebody with how fast he can get going. He sends guys flying. But that one play on Murray, it was totally accidental. I couldn't agree more with you, Biz. And I think he ended up leaving with a groin injury, not even a head injury. So not enough of that. It's, it's kind of like the PK slew foot. Some guys just don't like guys, and they're just going to say that anything yeah. they do. This isn't Matt Cook we're talking about. Ugh. Uh, next up, we're going to take a look at Minnesota. First, we do want to let you know we have a pair of guests coming on Chicklets today. We have Tom Bussy Martin. You'll understand why we call him Bussy when we bring him on in a little bit. And then uh, Brady Shea, defenseman for Carolina. We'll get him on in a little bit as well. But Minnesota, come out the gate hot, uh, 4-0, until they lost to uh, Nashville on Sunday, 4-1. They had a wild game at uh, Winnipeg the other night, 6-5 win biz. That was a crazy game. They're down 5-3 with five minutes left. Uh, Winnipeg had an empty net goal to seal it. I think it was Shifley scored it, but Connor, uh, Kyle Connor was oh offside. So the goal comes down. Uh, Eric Sinek comes down, scores the tie-in tie goal. Then in overtime, Talbot makes this crazy save. It's a three-on-one the other day. Eck wins the game in overtime. Absolute bananas. Fucking uh, biz. I know you want to chime in on that game. Oh, but also, the Superman punch. Um between Moose and Brendan Dillon. Marcus Holy Fleming. fucks, mixing a water, all right? Sorry, um, dude, there was a lot going on there. <laughs> no shit, that was a pretty wild game. As far as the offside, though, let's go to that first. Drag a leg. That game was signed, sealed, and delivered. Connors had an unreal season. I think he he's, was first star of the week as well. Tough to blame him. Bit of a meltdown for the, for the Winnipeg Jets. Uh, unreal game for Felino to be mic'd up too. Ends up yeah. challenging uh, uh, Hootie fight there from, uh, oh, geez, now I'm drawing blanks here from San Jose, moved over to Washington. Dylan. Dylan. Brent, yeah, and he Dylan. gives him the fucking Superman punch. The crowd's going absolutely bananas. Then 
of course, as I mentioned, he's mic'd up. So they get the comeback tying goal and then the OT winner. And it was a very exciting overtime as well. It was a big save at one end, goes all the way down, uh, and Kaprizov sets up the winner. Uh, Minnesota is buzzing. They end up falling to Nashville the other night, but just a great hot start for a fan base that we're happy for and that the fact that they got a team that's going to compete. I didn't have them making playoffs like the bozo that I am, and that just goes back to all my terrible preseason predictions. But Whit, I know that you are bullish on these guys, and uh, what do you think of that start? I think they're, I think they're looking great. It, the, the building looks like completely off the hook now. It's, it's every night it seems like the place has gone – nuts with different i'd say different type of like offense right i mean when kaprasov came over everything's kind of changed but you can't just like put it on him i mean he makes erickson act look so good but then like they have depth we're just talking about like getting more than just one or two lines scoring but like fial is playing on the third line right now and rask is playing with him and goudreau who came over who looks good i just think that they do have they do have all the things going for them in a sense of like Everyone knows their roles. It looks like a team that's pretty determined and, and understands what each guy's job is. Yeah. You know, they never really look lost on the ice. You got to give their coach credit. Like a lot of people kind of wondered about that hire. Dean Evans has done a really good job. But in the end, it's been a one player's really changed the entire trajectory of the entire team. So this dude, he's such a game breaker. He held out for a lot of money. He deserved the money. And I think that Goligoski's come in also on D. That's a guy who's from Minnesota. They bring him in. He's a veteran presence. Spurgeon's an awesome leader, a captain of that team. We've talked about him. I said it when RA and I were doing this podcast alone, he was the most underrated player in the league. That was like five years ago now. No, that's Barkov. Uh, no, 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 no. This was like before Barkov might have oh. even been playing. There's I just remember Erickson always talking about Spurgeon. Then. I was always, what, RA? I said Louis Erickson was the most underrated player when we started. Until he got those shoulder pads, the <laughs> no, ones that were no, too Louis great. Erickson was the like most underrated player in the league. Yeah, for years. For I years, will back exactly. Wit up here though. He has been saying it for years. Jared Spurgeon, most underrated player in the league. Yeah, so like the team's solid. They're good. They're fun to watch now. They never really were, and also Hartman too. He looks good. You know, he was in Nashville. He was in Chicago, and he's settled in Minnie's second line center right now. And Felino's playing on his wing. And I, I think the best thing about Felino is how tough. I mean, he could fight anyone in the league, Biz. Yeah. I didn't really. I, I knew he was big, but fuck that Superman punch, Bieksa style. That was pretty sick to watch. I, I feel Dylan like this is no a come out a coming. come out party type season for him. And he had that big goal to get things going after the fight at the start of that third period to start that comeback. So. So he plays on the right wing, and then Greenway's Green wing. on the left wing. Oh. Like those two monsters <laughs> playing on that line with Hartman. And he was hilarious when he came on with us too. If you haven't listened to his interview, yeah. by the way, Marcus Felino, he was like, I jump back at how funny he was. He was he was good shit. So check that out. One other note on that uh, Nashville Minnesota game I mentioned Sunday night. Uh, Nashville goaltender Connor Ingram. He won his first NHL start, uh, and he did tweet afterwards nine months to the day that I stepped away and went into the NHLPA program for help. I played my first game. Amazing the things that can happen when you put your mental health first. Uh, hashtag let's talk. So kudos to uh, for Connor for getting the W and for Congrats speaking Congrats to him. That's great. Congrats. A- absolutely fantastic stuff. And you know what? Hey, fuck it, boys. Let's send it over to Bussy right now. Tom, Bussy Martin with one of the all-time trade stories ever. Get you on the other end. First, we do have an ad for you. This interview is brought to you by Cross Country Mortgage. Cross Country Mortgage is much like us at Bostool, a people-first group of people. They are dedicated to the fundamentals of mortgage lending, which results in a fast, convenient, and less stressful home financing or refinancing experience. And right now, rates are unbelievably low. Don't pay the bank more money than you need to. Cross Country Mortgage makes the process as painless and simple as possible and helps keep you with your money in your pocket so you can do fun things like take road trips and see your favorite team on the road. If you're a homeowner and haven't refied lately, you could be leaving thousands or even tens of thousands of dollars on the table. And that's money that could go toward a new shed toy or just some pocket cash or whatever. Rates are at an all-time low right now and may never get this low again. So call today for a fast, free, great quote and a free home valuation. And when you do, tell them Bostool sent you. Go to crosscountrymortgage.com slash Bostool to learn more about your future home buying experience or to refinance your current mortgage. That's Cross Country Mortgage, LLC, and MLS 3029. All loans subject to underwriting approval, www.nmlsconsumeraccess.org. And now, enjoy Tom Bussy Martin. 
I'd like to welcome our next guest to the show. He played 92 NHL games with Winnipeg, Hartford, and Minnesota. He also won a Call the Cup with the Sherbrooke Canadians in 1985 and was a first-team AHL All-Star in 1988 with the Binghamton Whalers. And he also has a unique place in hockey history, which we'll get to shortly. But thanks so much for joining us on the Spit and Chicklets podcast, Tom Bussy Martin. How's it going, man? Oh, how's that for an intro? That's the best intro ever. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get the All Stars ever. I'm doing great, guys. I take Venmo Thanks at uh, for having me. Yeah, I my pleasure. Me, based on this You're hockey, making me into a god with my daughter and her friends. Oh, yeah, really? Perfect. Okay. Hey, oh, I'm, I'm my looking... daughter's 21, and all her all her friends, the guys, they just love spitting. Yeah, chocolate. the last time we had a, a 20 year old girl told uh, told us she listened to the podcast, it was Wit, and it was Jim McKenzie's daughter, and she's like, "I'm sick of hearing about my old man's horn." <laughs> oh, I play with I play with Jimmy too, and Bingo. Oh yeah, my! Yeah. Some, my lord! I think, it's, I, think it's, I think it's once every six months. I know the poor girl's just like, oh, oh my god! You play with Jim Kite too, right? Oh, yeah. He was my roommate for two years in Winnipeg. I got some Kiter stories for you. Wow. Hey, so. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah Kiter. So, so Bussy, I, Biz said, hey, this guy's a legend. We're going to have him on. He's got a million old stories. And I think the main one is the is the, is the the nickname, right? Do we get into that now? I'm, I'm so curious the, as to how this went down. This is what caught my ear right away. And I'm like, yeah, hey, I got to get this guy on the podcast for sure. But the main reason I got you on is because you won some money off me in the dice game. So I figured I needed to get compensated back Oh, somehow. you joined the country club on the in the alley of Vancouver? <laughs> <laughs> He's, he thinks it's on yeah, Hastings. No, we, play, we play behind the garbage can with behind the pro clubhouse. We use a flashlight. You guys don't have a practice putting green. You just got a nice little uh, we dice area. We don't have a driving range, but fuck <laughs> off. That doesn't matter. It's still a great time, right, Bussy? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, with lots of money. Hey, the dice is a great game, though, eh, Biz? I'll tell you what, man. It, 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 you were drunk as a skunk, and the minute we started playing that game, you were like, you'd sober up, oh, and you oh, were. Yeah, so what, gotta be on. What, what was the name of the game we were playing? We called Liar's Dice. Okay. Liar's dice. Huh. Everyone's like, yeah, I don't know what that is. Is it? Is it? Could you go up online and look at the rules? You can. So basically, what's explained to say the four of us are playing. We, we all start with five dice. We roll it. Then you have to bid until you call, think a guy's bidding too high. So which you would go four fours. I'd either have to go four fives or five fours. Then you keep going around until one one number is just like seventeen twos. And you go bullshit. You pull it. If the guy's got it, you lose a dice. But if you, he does have it, you lose a dice. You the add up, guy with yeah. the dice wins. It's, it's hard yeah. to explain a dice game <laughs> on a podcast, but long story yeah, short, it's, it's fun. There's a lot of bluffing involved, and, and there's a lot of drinks involved. And what's the original it's ante? Great, for every, What's the ante everyone's throwing in? 20 bucks. 20, 20, 20 bucks. 20 bucks, but it's something like, you know. I, I My mortgage payment. No, but the, the <laughs> Yeah, Biz is doing swipe ups to get it back. No, but it's more one of those things where you can end up losing or winning a lot, even though you start with the anti at twenty. One of those. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. I oh. love those games. Usually you start with about usually about fifteen guys. Usually, yeah, like sixty price. bucks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like a tank of gas. That's how I think. Hey, Biz well. loses a buck twenty and withdraws from the member guest. Yeah. Like, I'm out. Guys. I'm in the can't, parking can't lot. Can't it. It. I'm in the parking lot with a shit. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not gonna lie. For for a newcomer, Biz played really well. He I'm good at up the game. I'm very good at, yeah. Money's involved. He focused. Any part took an Adderall <laughs> right when he realized there was a game going on. Um, okay, so we gotta we gotta get to the nickname story. Let's, let's let's kick it off like that. I think our fans would really enjoy that. And where were you at the time when you were playing? Playing the University of Denver. Okay, and and pioneers, and and we had what's, uh, what's that? Pioneers, pioneers. That's right. And we had Ryan Malone on, and he had a pretty good recruiting story. Let's actually get into the recruiting trip before we get into the the story about the. Well, you know, back in '82 when I went to school, you were allowed to go on six recruiting trips. That was what the NCAA double rule, and you know they were all the same. I went to North Dakota. I went to Clarkson. Went to Bowling Green. Northern Michigan. I didn't even make it to the school. It was a blizzard. I didn't even see it. Fuck. I said, I'm not going there. And the last trip I did was Denver. I was going to go to court. I was going to go to, um, to Clarkson. I liked the coach. They had a good program close to Montreal, which I loved, but I went in and all the trips were the same biz. You know, you fly in, they pick you up, take you for Chinese food with the coach. The next day you go see the rink, you go get drunk with the guys and the team, hopefully get laid. And then you fly back. Out. It's like cookie cutter. <laughs> Right. Cookie cutter. So I go to Denver and I get it off the airport and there's a guy in a tuxedo with my name on a card, Tom Martin. I go, oh, fuck, that's great. That's that's fancy. And there's a limo waiting for us. 
And he, I go, where are we off to? And he goes, well, we're waiting for another guy coming in. His name is Phil Housley. I go, wow, because I had read about Phil. He was his draft year, too. And the Hockey News said he was going to be the highest drafted American ever, right? And didn't know anything more about them. So I'm waiting, you know, and I, I played 85 junior games. I just finished the finals against BC and Alberta. I'm all stitched up black and blue. And, you know, I'm about 205 pounds at that time. Fighting all the time, and uh, House comes in. I don't think House had even shaved in his life. He had all this red peach foot. I should know he's a redhead. He was all of about 165, right? And really nice guy. Might have been the first time he'd ever been on an airplane, though. Like he, which I'll lead to another story, but the limo takes us right to the last Colorado Rockies game, and they're playing the Oilers. And it was just before the Oilers had won their cup, but Glenn Anderson was on the team, and he's an ex-pioneer. So Howes and I got to go down to the dressing room, meet Gretzky and Messi and all the guys. And right after the game, the coach, his name's Marshall Johnson, a great guy, takes us downtown. We have a late night dinner at a steakhouse with the mayor of Denver, right? Next day, we got to get up at six o'clock. We go back to the hotel and uh, Hauser, uh, he liked to partake in things that weren't boozy at the time. And uh, so we stayed up quite late getting to know each other, smoking some weed. And um, he, we had a six o'clock call and we had a private plane that took us to Aspen what? to one of the alumni had a Holy big ranch. Shit. What year Hauser, is this? Hauser, Hauser was throwing up the whole time. He couldn't get on the plane there. What's wrong with him? I go, hey, it's just motion sick, man. I got you. I got you, Hauser. Don't worry. We come back. We go downtown again with some other rich guy. It was just like, I, I'm coming here, man. This is the best fucking school ever. Like, so I sign. Hauser's going to me the whole time. I go, you're going to sign here. This is the this is a golden treatment. And he goes, yeah, no, you know, I'm not uh, I'm not going to sign anywhere. I'm just doing the trips for free. I'll be in the NHL next year. <laughs> so I'm, look, I'm looking. I'm looking at this tiny, tiny, right? red, redheaded guy with peach fuzz. I go, yeah, you're never going to play in the NHL, man. You're going to get killed, right? So I sign with Denver. Of course, he gets drafted fourth overall. He's, he breaks the record for most goals for a rookie defenseman in Buffalo. I got a funny story. I'll tell you about that the next year. But uh, at the beginning of the year, there's like five other re- freshman recruits. And we're all there. We're talking about the recruiting trip. And I realized I just won the golden fucking ticket because I was with Housley. The guys had the same experience before. They got Chinese food. They got to see the rink. They got drunk with the guys, and that was it. It's only because I was with Housley. Oh. And he was just, you know, it was just the Housley Golden Shake. I was perfect timing. That's but unreal. I only stayed, I only stayed the one year at school, which is how I get traded for the bus. But I'll jump to the Phil Housley quickly. The next year, I get called up from I was playing in Victoria, and I, uh, Winnipeg had a whole bunch of injuries. So they called me up at Christmas time. My first game was in Buffalo, fucking ugliest town in the world. But uh, <laughs> Housley's skating around in warmups, and I go, "Hey, House," he looks at me, he goes what the fuck are you doing here? <laughs> I go, I go, what do you think I'm doing? Well, I didn't think I'd ever see you again, man. And I go, fuck you, you little prick. <laughs> I remember I tried to forecheck him. That fucking kid could skate so fast. I had him corner coming around the net. I had him all lined up and I missed him by, but he put the burners on it. I missed him by 15 feet. Fuck a guy. He was so good. So anyways, while I was at Denver back, uh, back when I was growing up, you weren't drafted to the, your your major league junior teams like you know, the Bantam draft. When you turned 14, you got signed. And the team that signed me was the Seattle Breakers. And they had no money, right? And they, you know, my mom was a real stickler. They got they graduated high school and, and got to college. And they couldn't offer anything. Because some of the teams in the Western League back then, for every year you played, they offered your year of Canadian school, but they couldn't offer that. So I said, no, I'm gonna go to I'm gonna go to US college. So I came home at Christmas time that, and I biz my good buddy, Russ Cortnell, who I played with growing up. Yeah. I skated with the Cougars at Christmas time, and the owner of the Cougars said, hey, you know, if I trade for you, will you come back and join us? And I said, uh, yeah, for sure, I'll come back. Because I wasn't your prototypical college player. I think I still have the penalty minute record for that league. Yeah. And, and you know, Most playing with Mass. Jet flight, so well, and, the, and the thought of coming back home too, right? Fuck, I, yeah. I was probably. Yeah, I said, never played at home. So uh, they try to trade for me. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. My season ends in Denver, and I'm out studying for a midterm at the library with a girl. And Kevin Deneen's my roommate. And I come back at about 10 o'clock. You say, fuck, dude, phone's been ringing off the hook. You've been traded. And as you know, you can't get traded in college. You can't, you know, you have to switch schools. And I uh, said, trading? I said, I don't know what it is, but something to do with a vehicle as well. I go, what? So the phone rings at 6 the next morning. 
and it's hello is this tom martin i go yeah hey it's uh, brian gumbel from nbc <laughs> i think it's one of the guys in the teammate and i fucking slammed the phone down well it rings again i slammed down again i fucking tired i go it's not funny third time it's a girl she's mr martin uh this is seriously nbc and brian gumbel i don't know if you were noted no but last night you were traded for a bus and we'd like to interview <laughs> i went fuck so at the time i go thinking what's the big deal it must have happened before and it's probably going to happen again yeah, it never did before, and it hasn't happened since either. Uh, so uh, I got traded for the bus. And well, how, the, how the bus thing happened is the Spokane Flyers had folded that year. And our owner, the Cougars, is an old Scottish guy, a real rich guy, and he bought everything in an auction, the bus, the skate sharp, and their sticks. But he didn't want to pay the duty to get it in Canada, so it was sitting at the border in Blaine, Washington. And uh, Seattle was in the playoffs against Kamloops, and their bus broke down. And they were going to have to forfeit game one of the playoffs because they couldn't get the cam loops. So our owner said, hey, it's yours. Give me Martin. The paper's <laughs> yours. They got the bus. So they got, a, they got a cab to take all the Seattle team to the bus at the border, and they went up to cam loops. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. That's so, how it began, uh, the, the, leg- the legend of Bussy. And that's what that's brought you on the started. podcast. And so how how like NBC had found out about that before you had? like That's crazy at that time for that to travel that way. You know, wits, and it was all over the U.S. Like, you know, I was on a, they, I, they flew me to L.A. for an interview. You know, the, the Denver newspaper came in and did a photo shoot. They made me lay across the net like Burt Reynolds, and then they superimposed <laughs> a bus underneath it. And it was a big deal. But, you know, the funny thing is when I got back to Canada and, and I went to my first pro training camp that fall, it's like nobody nobody remembered about it. Like when I got to camp, I was expecting to get my oh, fucking yeah, ass off. Yeah. yeah, nothing, nothing. Nobody says a word. I think, fuck, this is, these guys are great. Until I, you know, I make the team. And uh, when I make the team, I get cut, sent down about five games in the season. But Dave Ellett, who you know, Biz, from uh, Phoenix, Dave Ellett. Yeah, he's still, uh, I think Rick, he's hanging around the alumni and, program still. Yeah. Andrew, uh, Andrew McBain and a guy named Bobby Dulles, the dumbest guy I ever played with. Uh, we all went out. We're the four rookies who made it. We went to the keg. And Dave Ellett has this very deep, Clint Eastwood type voice. He speaks really slowly. He goes, "Oh, how about that asshole got traded for a bus last year?" <laughs> and I'm thinking, I'm thinking, fuck yeah, okay, yeah, have some fun. I realize after about a minute, they don't fucking realize it's me. <laughs> oh I go, no! But I go, you guys, hey, that you, was me. you said the dumbest guy you ever played junior with. I was talking to talk. Like we went out for beers after TNT last night. Not a big deal. <laughs> and he was talking about the dumbest player that he ever played with. And and you know when they used to do the curfew calls. Well, at the time, they had the plug-in phones. So what he did, he thought was he was going to you know, fool the coaches. So he unplugged the, the plug-in phone, brought it to his girlfriend's. And he, thought, he thought it would ring. And he thought it would ring at his girlfriend's place because he brought the plug-in fucking phone, Bussy. So that's pretty fucking stupid. How stupid was oh. your firm, former teammate? Oh, Bobby. Bobby, and maybe it was a language thing, but he was just, he just was, you know, they asked him what his strongest skill was, you know, when he, when he made the team, he says, I have a really good backhand. You know, my, my backhand's amazing. Right? <laughs> he ended up being a pretty good pro, but he was not a smart kid. Fuck. Yeah. Poor Bobby Dulles. Now, th- that bus ended up getting confiscated later that season. You didn't, you didn't even yeah, have, he end up seeing drugs it. on it. Yeah. <laughs> didn't the Seattle team have a play without a visa and they try to fake it and ended up having, getting the bus exactly, confiscated? That's exactly what happened, Mike. They, uh, they had a kid they brought over from Germany and he didn't have his visa. Like he made the team and they, they started the season in, in, up in Westminster and they were crossing the border. So they told him to get out and run across a field and they pick him up on the other side. <laughs> but the border, the border officials caught him. So they lost the bus at the beginning of the next year and oh. never got it back. You know, about every five years, the story comes back up and I got to do a Sports Illustrated interview. Or, and then the last I heard from Sports Illustrated, the guy flew up from Philadelphia and he said they tracked the serial number of the bus. And it was taking a whole bunch of seniors from Tucson down to Mexico to get their meds every week. So it was a shuttle for old people. So it's still on the road somewhere. It's like one of those trades that still lives on, like guys still getting drafted 30 years later. Well, nice to know you're doing a good deed anyways. Yeah, true enough. Uh, true gr- enough. Gr- growing up on Vancouver Island, like how was the hockey and the minor hockey growing up? Was it pretty good? You know, Biz, we had a good run. We had, you know, there was a time there in the late 80s, there was nine of us from Victoria playing in the NHL. But, you know, we had a really good junior team. The Victoria Cougars, like from 75 to 82, they went to the Memorial Cup twice. They had a whole bunch of first-round picks. So, you know, when you're able to go on a Saturday night and watch a guy for a couple of years and then, 
you get to see him play on a hockey night in Canada That's the cool. next year. It drives you. Know, it's you. A, it's it drives a, you. It's a, it's, a, it's a tangible step, yep. right? Because you see these guys around town, so exactly. it drives you. Now, Victoria's been in a dead zone for hockey players. You know, we got Tyson and Jamie Ben. We got a couple of good guys, but we maybe had nine guys in the last 20 years because we just haven't had that junior program. It's getting better again. Who, who, but, you know, we had Russ Cortnell, Jeff Cortnell, myself, Tori Robertson, uh, Mel Bridgman, Brad Maxwell. Like, we had a lot of good players coming out of there. Yeah, it was a good, talk, good hockey town. Now, you weren't shy to go at all during a, uh, an era where there was a ton of fighting. Like, is that something that you you liked as a kid? How did you first get, get into fighting so much? You put some pretty big PIM numbers up. Well, you know, you know, I grew up in a kind of a shitty part of town, if there is one in Victoria. And, we, you know, I grew up fighting. But, you know, by the time you're in grade 8, you're not fighting that much anymore because you've kind of got your own groups. But when I went to junior at 16, and uh, my first exhibition game when I was in Kelowna, it was against Vernon. A guy high sticked me, and my dad was in the stands. I looked over him, and he just gave me the nod, and I just went cuckoo. And it was so much fun. And uh, you know, as you learn, you know, it's 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 a it's a curse to like fighting because you know maybe I wish I had hadn't fought as much as I did, but it was just part of my game. I enjoyed it. It uh, so that's you know, what... it gave me a little bit of room. I was never a great skater, so it gave me a little bit of room out there. And and yeah, I was a bit of a nut job for a few years. Like I fought so much. That's why yeah. uh, it was just one year at Denver. You said, "All right, uh, I, I need to be doing stuff that college doesn't necessarily allow." Yeah, you know what else happened, uh, Wits, is that when Colorado moved to New Jersey, Marshall Johnson, the guy who recruited me, got offered the assistant GM job, so he left, and they brought in a new coach named Ralph Backstrom, you know, the famous Montreal Canadian, and he didn't recruit me. He didn't really like my style of play very much. Um, and, you know, I had a good year. I had almost a point a game. And as I said, I broke the penalty minute record for that league. But at the end of the year, he uh, he said, uh, you know, I've had, recruited two more left wingers. So you're going to be number three. You're not getting any ice time. I said, well, you know, Ralph, for fuck's sake, so I was second on the team in scoring or third. I didn't get any PP time. Like, if I'm not going to play, I'm not coming back. Because, you know, I had the bus thing in my back pocket at that time, right? So, and, uh, <laughs> and, and he goes, no. So funny story, that same road trip when I felt when I ran into Phil in Buffalo, we went to Minnesota and we played them on a Friday night. And that weekend, Denver DU was playing University of Minnesota. So uh, one of my teammates, Wade Campbell, grew up with one of my teammates at DU. Uh, I can't remember his name. Sorry, guys. But we decided to go over to the to visit them at, at the university after the game. So I played my second game and I walked into the restaurant where the guys were having drinks and the coaches were sitting right there, uh, Ralph Baxter and Ronnie Graham, who's from Victoria. And I walked through them, Ralph Baxter was, what the fuck are you doing here? And I go, yeah, I played in the NHL tonight. Yeah, couldn't play for your team as a sophomore, but I played in the NHL tonight. And he stands up, he goes, no, you didn't. And I go, yes, I did. And he goes, no, you didn't. And I, Wade Campbell goes, yeah, he did, and he played really well. The truth was, I got the shit kicked out of me by a guy named Dave Richter that night. <laughs> fuck, was he tough. Oh. Hey, but you tough. couldn't check. You couldn't just get on your phone and check online if you That's did. It was actually a matter of like, <laughs> yeah. are you making this up? Yeah, you can't yeah. say hockey DB me, bitch. You can't say that back no. then. No and elite so prospects. That was, pretty, that was pretty rewarding. But then Ralph ended up being my coach like eleven years later in Phoenix, which was at the same at the beginning of the year. Hey, we're good, right? Like bygones be bygones. He was pretty good. What was the yeah. Calder Cup run like? Was that one of the best years of, of playing hockey in your life? It was, but it was my first year biz, and we were re- we were the bad news bears in Sherbrooke. Like we were half half Montreal or three quarters Montreal, and and, and we shared teams with Winnipeg, which is mine. We were only allowed four Winnipeg guys dressed tonight, and you know we had Brian Scridlin, we had Ricky Natris who just come back from his year of suspension for possession. We had uh, oh, no, you know we were it. just. We had a coach who looked just like Fred Flintstone who couldn't speak English. And I got called I got called up for most of the year. I got called up at Christmas time and I didn't come back. And if we didn't win the last game of the season in Springfield, because I talked to the guys on the phone, we wouldn't have made the playoffs. So then uh we we beat Fredericton in game six games the first round. And then uh Patrick Waugh and Stefan Riche and Claude Lemieux had joined the team. Yeah. But the uh, only guy who was playing was Rich. Uh, Rich went right in the lineup, and Patrick was our number three goalie. We had M- Mike Moffat and a guy named Paul Pajot. And frankly, in practice, Patrick didn't look that good. Like, he couldn't stop a fucking thing. He was tall and skinny and, you know, he had acne, and, you know, he didn't speak any English. He didn't look that good. And we- Some people say <laughs> I eat too many chocolate bars, but they don't know the real me. And we only played, our Canadian uh, listeners will know that one. <laughs> 
I think we played Maine in the second round, and they beat us 6-1 the first game. They had won the regular season championship. That was Jersey's farm team. They had Greg Adams was down there, Kenny Danico, like a lot of the guys. Um, John McLean had joined them from junior. Like They had a good squad, and we were playing game two. First game, Paul Pajot pulled his groin, so we got Moffat in for, is going to be our goalie, and Patrick's backing him up. First time Patrick's dressed. And Moffat gets the old slap shot in the head and warm-ups and splits him down the middle of the forehead so he can't go. Well, we throw Patrick in there, and he stops 24 shots in the first period. We win the next four games straight. We play Baltimore in the final. We beat them in six, I think. And uh, Patrick was just the stud. He stopped everything. It was amazing. Now, even most, compe- he, most competitive guy I've ever met. Even when he started playing and, and, and that run really began in practice, was he still brutal? In yeah, he didn't games, work hard in practice. Yeah, he's right? Like, all right, so he's just kind of chilling those days off. Kind of chilling. But, you know, they had Francois Lure was our assistant coach. You know, Francois, they say, is the grandfather of the new hockey style, right? He's the guy who invented, yep. you know, and, and, you know, being a big guy, Patrick was his was his model, like the guy he worked with. You know, he made the big jerseys, sewed patches between his legs, did all that stuff, taught Patrick how to do the butterfly. And it was, it was a project, and he was good. Fuck, he was good. Um, yeah, uh, Claude Lemieux, like even like polarizing to even teammates of his. What was it like with your your short time with him? I loved him. Play with him anytime. Why wasn't One he in the favorite? lineup? Well, we were. They were deep, and yeah. they had it. We had a contractual thing that you know we we had to have four Winnipeg guys, and he just couldn't cut yeah. the lineup. Riche was so good. Like Riche came in and was just a stud, and Claude just they didn't have room for him. They couldn't bump anybody at that time. So he practiced with us, and I played with him the next year, Biz, like it, for the in Sherbrooke, which I spent most of the year of the second year down there. He lived down the hall from me. Just a great guy. He's an asshole to play against, I agree. But on your team, I'd have him anytime. You, and he's a funny bugger. You, you got to have one. Funny. You got to have one story about him, then. Well, I'll tell a hockey story about him. Remember, I was telling mm-hmm. you, Fred, uh, Pierre Kramer, who coached the Penguins for a little while before you, it's he. Uh, he was our coach. He couldn't speak English. And we're in Fredericton, and, and Claude Pepe, we called him, took a really stupid penalty, and they scored against us. And Kramer started screaming at him in French, like fucking screaming at him. And then they Claude's like right back at him, blah, 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 blah. And right on the bench, blah, 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 blah. They're going at it for about five minutes. And then Claude starts crying, like, I mean, bawling his eyes out. And he jumps over the boards to go to the – we had to skate across the ice in Fredericton and get the dressing room. Kramer grabbed him by the neck and he made him walk all the way around the rink in the stands along the mezzanine. <laughs> Blades on the concrete. Blades on the concrete. He got called up. He got called up the next day. It was near the end of the season. And he went on a run. I think he scored 13 playoff goals. That was the year they went to the finals. Get right? the fuck out Calgary. of here. No. That was the yeah. same year? That next day what, he got uh, called up. Did you ever find out what he said to make him cry? He Oh, I asked the French guys. I asked the French guys. He goes, well, you know, he, he, he told him he will never play in the NHL again. I'll make sure that's going to happen. I'm going to ruin your career, is what he said. Yeah. <laughs> kind of like you and telling he like, Housley he was never going to play a game next year and he fucking was leading the league in de-scoring. <laughs> you know what's funny is that reminds me in terms of a French guy yelling at a French player, a French coach yelling at a French player. Ironically enough, you played with Michelle Terrian in this run, <laughs> but I played for I played for Mike Terrian in, in in the in the minors, the lockout year. He was screaming at Mark Andre Fleury, screaming at him, same type thing. And I was like, "What they? What he say?" And the French guys like, he told him he's the worst first overall pick to ever exist. Oh no! And like I was like, "Holy shit!" So I could totally see uh, that's maybe where where Mike learned some of that is from that coach. Yeah, well, let's make a correction. Uh, Mike Mike Terry didn't play any games in the playoffs. He was with us, but um, <laughs> oh, why? Because uh, he's softer than baby shit. <laughs> oh, he was. Soft. He was. I heard he was he the was softest. Soft. That was the, the hip, <laughs> most hypocritical thing. Like I was a young guy, and I actually felt that he would probably would have ruined my career. But I'm like, I keep hearing that you were the softest fucking guy to ever play the game. He was the softest guy I ever played with in pro hockey. Take your shots, and, buddy. Well, no. It, and, <laughs> Take them all. Hey, right what's here. funny is I've dogged him. I've dogged him a lot on here, and then 
Uh, God bless Jimmy Hayes. He passed away. And at his wake, uh, Terrian was there. I talked to him for a while. He came up. He's like, Wait, how you doing, buddy? I was Get like, out of here. I swear, he was so nice. He's like, we got to catch up outside. And I was like, I don't know if he wants to dummy me outside. <laughs> like, but but well, no, he was, was, he was say... great. But at the time, he was a prick to me. And I did hear there was actually a story that when his team sell, you guys won the Calder Cup. I think there's like a picture. He's like on the other side of the glass, though. So it was like what? as much as he was dogging certain now, players I, when he I coached did, them. I was going to qualify because he wasn't much of a player right and i you know anybody who's get plays pro hockey is a decent player but he couldn't play at that level but i would say as a teammate off the ice he was a lot of fun oh was he really yeah, yeah. okay yeah. all right all really right. loose drank a lot he was a lot of fun he was a good guy and when he didn't play he was never pouty right he just took it on the chin he old was great. school coaches that's just they were fucking mean you know they would they 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 really tried scaring people through intimidation and the minors you're really able to do it right because when you tell a guy in the yeah. minors i'll bury you I'll, I'll ruin your career like you you almost at the time you, you you're, you're petrified well it's a perfect lead into my next story if you don't mind well i was just gonna chime in and say like you pretty much nailed that on the fact that like maybe that was experience he saw that french yeah. coach lose it on claude lemieux and then lemieux yeah. goes and lights it up he's like oh that's how you do that, it that's what I works can, yeah. he's like i can fucking coach <laughs> <laughs> and he's and he's had a pretty good career doing it so that first year biz when we won the Calder cup i'm playing for john ferguson in winnipeg and you know I, you would think that i would be john ferguson's type of player right he's from baden and i'm what from the same area I grew up, we're the same player we fought. You know, I scored when I got a chance, he could score. But when I was in Winnipeg, as I said, I finished the, the year there. The trade deadline was also the roster deadline. So if you made it past there, which was a big deal for a guy like me who was up and down, you were a roster player. Like they can't trade you to the, they can't send you down to the season's over. So we played Calgary in the first round of the playoffs. And I play all, was best of five. And I played all four games, got fights with Timmy Hunter and Baxter and did my job and, we got about three or four days before we're playing Edmonton in the second round. And I'm just about to go on the ice and I'm, you know, I'm just about to put my skates on and the trainer goes, Hey, Fergie wants to see you up in his office. Right. So I, I like, this is great. He's going to tell me how good a job I did fighting all the big guys. So I walk up and you got to go in the old Winnipeg arena. You got to go up to the main mezzanine and then you got to the office. You got to walk through all the secretaries and he's in the office in the back. And I see, he goes, Hey, Tommy, sit down. And I go, yep, yeah, no problem. Fergie goes, yeah, I'm sending you to Sherbrooke. And I go, no, you can't. I'm a roster player. You can't send me, right? He doesn't say a word. He stands up from his desk. He walks by me and closes the door. He leans over me like a grizzly bear. And you're going to fucking Sherbrooke. He screams at me so loud, I start to cry. And then I've got to walk through all the office staff and everybody there. And I got tears coming down my eyes because, you know, he, he could have broken glass out loud. He yelled at me. So I walk into the dressing room. Randy Carlell, our, our player rep, <laughs> is there missing practice like he did every day. I hear he's a tyrant as a coach. He was the laziest player, but one of the oh, best players. Oh, here we go. The with. truth is coming out. I oh, love this he shit. was so lazy. He, I don't think he practiced that whole year. But well, like he could play. Also, my guess. So anyways, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. What's, yeah, no, well, no, I want to no. hear. I want to hear what Wood had to say. I, no, I, I also played for Randy. Randy hated me, but he, he, I would guess he was a good dude off the ice too, like as a teammate. The I guess best. the boys loved really? him. Really? Yeah. I, I could the sense best. he's one of the guys, man. He busted just, balls though. Holy shit, dude! He. Just well, I heard poured, that. Oh. I heard that. I ran into him. I ran into him at the draft in Vancouver. I went over there to say hi to a couple of guys, and I had a beer with him. You know, we're old teammates. I go, I hear you're just a fucking asshole to play for. And he goes, Yeah, it works for me. Right. And I go, I go, yeah, you know, how do you tell an asshole who's successful that he's an asshole? Right. You just you can't do it. And I said, well, you weren't the hardest working player when I played with you. And he goes, oh, that doesn't mean anything. And I go, OK. So anyways, Randy sees I'm upset and he goes, what's up? And I go, well, Fergie's sending me the minors. He goes, you can't send you down. You're, you're a roster player. And him and Fergie were tight. They were horse racing buddies. Right. And they like to smoke cigars and eat fancy meals. I'll be right back. So I'm sitting in my stall. This is great. He's going up. I'm not going to go to Sherbrooke. He's gone for about 20 minutes. He walks back down. He goes, uh, yeah, you're going to Sherbrooke. <laughs> <laughs> so I go down. Biz, it's the best, best experience of my career. I win the Calder Cup with a bunch of great guys, right? But I get to training camp the next year. And, uh, you know, training camps were big back then. I think Winnipeg maybe had 30 roster guys, 32. And then they fill up with 60 guys who were on PTOs. And, you know, used to have about four or five days of scrimmages. And then you have a rookie exhibition. I'm two days into camp 
we've we haven't even had an inner squad yet like not one and mike doran the assistant gm says i need to talk to you after practice and i said sure so i go talk to him because yeah we're gonna send you down to sherbrooke and i go what right i go mike and he goes yeah it's fergie's idea i don't agree with it but it's fergie's idea so I fly from Winnipeg to Montreal, you know, you know, up the year before I've been up and down 40 friggin' times. There's always somebody there to pick you up at the airport, you know, with the team band, and you get your stick. So I wait there, I got my gear and my sticks. So I, I wait and I wait and I wait. The bag is sitting empty's out. Nobody there. This is 1984. So I phone my agent, Ricky Kerr, and I go, Ricky, uh, nobody's here to pick me up. And he goes, well, Where are you? And I go, I'm in Montreal. And he goes, What? And he said, Yeah, I got sent down. And he goes, Camp hasn't even started. And I go, I know. I said, What do I do? So I got to get a, I got a cab to the bus station in downtown Montreal. I got to take a bus to Sherbrooke. It stops in every freaking little town on the way there. It's like a six hour bus ride. I get to the hotel where I stayed at the whole year before and I get the front there. Hey, Tom Martin. And I go, Hey guys, how are you? I'm here for my room. And he looks, Oh no, we have no rooms. Nobody's coming for two more weeks. Uh, You guys don't have any reservations. And the place is full. It's a tourist town, right? So I got to go across the street to this other hotel they need a credit card for a d- deposit. I think I got a hundred dollar limit on my credit card back in those days. I got to phone my dad to give him the credit card number so I can stay there. So I get the night. I'm waiting. I get up the next morning, waiting for the shuttle to take me to the butt rink. There's no shuttle, so I fucking take a cab to the rink. I go to knock on the rink door where I've been going in. You know, I just won the Calder Cup there two years ago or two months ago. The ice keeper guy goes, "Hey, Tom Martin." And I go, "Hey, Claude, how are you?" He goes, "What are you doing here?" And I said, "I'm here. I got sent down." There's no fucking ice in the rink. <laughs> There's nothing in the rink. There is no ice for eight more days. Nobody gets sent down for another 14 days. I'm there by myself. What did you do? Every Why day, did they do this? There was a, there was, the rink was right beside the university. So I used to run thinking somebody's watching, right? No, so I'm I saying, why did, they, why did they do this to you? Well, I'm going to tell you. Okay, Come sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was wondering where it was going to. But that might Fergie's, be. Fergie's might be not very idea. happy with me because I told him he wasn't allowed to send me down. So guys trickle down. We Two days in the season, I get called back up. And I fly in, and the night I fly in is the Booster Club dinner. And I said, I got to go to the Booster Club Winnipeg. So I get there, and Fergie comes over, slaps me in the back. Goes, I hope you learned your lesson. I go, yeah, you're a fucking asshole, right? <laughs> I get sent back down the next morning. <laughs> I don't get called up again the whole season. I'm down there for the whole year. I don't get back up. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And hey, that that, uh, that was waivers back here. then. You're going to Sherbra. Hey, you actually were crying? Oh, yeah. It scared the shit on me. Yeah. Yeah, that's, 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 that's petrifying. You know, tough guys can cry, too. I cry a bit. Oh, of course. So oh, last no, Fergie story. Scary, we're on the Fergie story. So the next year, I signed a termination contract, which means I'm a free agent at the end of the year. And Dan Maloney is our new coach. And he was a pro scout. And he really liked me. He said at the beginning, Cap, you're going to make the team. Just shut up. Fergie hates you. Right. Okay. So I make the team, but I blow up my knee like two weeks into the year. And I, um, but you know, they send me down for conditioning because they don't know my knee is, is hurt. And uh, I go down to Glens Falls, which is really out of Detroit's farm team. But at the end of the year, our assistant coach, Rick bonus is, um, is getting promoted from our assistant coach to run our farm team. And so we go play golf. This is in May. We go play golf. And then Fergie's having a barbecue for all of us. And we all have to get up in a bit of a bit. Dale Howard chucks us as all to get up and say something about Bones. Great guy. One of the best coaches ever. And it comes to me and I go, hey, Bones, here's to you. And here's to you not being my coach next year, right? Because he's going to be the minor league coach. Fergie's had like 30 scotches. And he gets up. He's like, he'll be your coach next year and the year after that, <laughs> the year after that. And I go, fuck you, Fergie. So Fergie takes a swipe at me across the table and I fucking pop him right in the nose. Like just automatic, just instinctual. I just popped him. He's down, he's down. He's bleeding all over the place. And <laughs> Howard Chen goes, dude, you just punched our GM. Like, fuck. And I go, well, he deserved it. Like, fuck. He, t- he took a swung at me first. Right. And Mrs. Ferguson was the sweetest lady on the planet. She goes, he won't remember any of this tomorrow, but I'll tell him that he <laughs> took a punch at you first. Right. So anyways, I, I ended up signing with Hartford. Uh, Fergie phoned me about two weeks after. He goes, hey, I expect you to sign here. And I go, well, Ferg, I'm going to wait till July 1st and, and see what other offers come in. And I, you know, I think he offered 105 with a guarantee of 30. And Hartford offered me twice as that, an American with a bigger. So I phoned him and said, hey, I want to stay in Winnipeg, but this is, you know, this is what Hartford offered me. And he goes, fuck, you're not that good, kid. And I go, okay, I'll sign. I'll sign at Hartford. But same thing, 
Same thing, Wits. I ran into him like 20 years after that. He's scouting. He's in Victoria. I'm walking with my dad to watch the junior game. And this guy's waving at me. And it's Fergie. He's waving. Come up here. Come up here. And I go, hey, Fergie, what's up? He goes, oh, it's so good to see you. We'll go for some beers after. And I go, you know, fuck, Ferg. I don't know if I really want to go for beers with you. You're such an <laughs> asshole to me. He goes, oh, come on, man. I was just, I just pushing you. You needed to be pushed. And I go, Fergie, no, you needed to calm me down. So just like your Mike Terrian story, it was just how they thought they motivated yeah. guys. Like, yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, hey, one guy we got to talk about who you play with at University of Denver, Kevin Deneen. I mean, fuck, he ended up playing just under uh, 1,200 games in the National Hockey League. Could you see it at that age? Like, did you know this guy was going to go on to be very special? No. <laughs> he was a defenseman at DU who scored 10 goals that year. When I played with him at Hartford, he was a right winger, and he scored 44 goals. Like, no. I, like, I knew he was good, but I didn't know he was going to be, like, So he's playing the back end when you, when you were playing with him? What's that? He was playing the back end? He played defense. He was drafted as defenseman. Wow. I don't know yeah. how many people know that. I know. I didn't know that. Was he awesome offensively and struggled defensively, and that's why it was an obvious move up? Or was no, nope. it... nope. wow, no, kind of like a, a really Wendell good Clark. defensive defense. Never joined the rush much, and then he went to play for the Olympic team. And Dave King put him up in right wing. Had a great wrist shot. Right. And I played with I played with Kevin for three years in Hartford too. Just a great guy. Funny story though. Uh, my year at Denver, we're playing Minnesota Duluth in the best of two playoffs. How stupid is that, by the way? Best of two playoffs, total goals. They beat us like 5-1 the first game. They got uh, Tom Kruvers, but they had Jim Johnson. Did you guys play with Jim Johnson from Pittsburgh? No. You know, we all had masks on, and he was a fucking chirper and a hack, and there's no fighting, right? And we've got to score five goals with a minute left to go when I'm on the ice, and I get a chance to run him, and I run him hard. Like, I cross-check his head right in – and I get a penalty, and Kevin's freaking out at me. He's, dude, you get a fucking penalty. We, we got a chance. I go, dude, we're not going to score five goals in the last minute of the game, but I'm going to play against this guy for the rest of my life. And he's, he's going to know I'm going to kill him every time I see him. <laughs> Kevin's so mad at me, he punches me. He punches me right in front of all the Duluth fans with, with his glove on in my mask and knocks me down. Right, right in front of everyone. I was so fucking mad. I was in the dressing room waiting for him when he came after, and our teammates came us apart. But he was just super intense. Just a great teammate. I think wonderful guy. I think a minute left down five. I'm like, if if, if a guy pissed me off that much, I'm taking the run. And if one of your teammates got that mad about it, you'd be like, dude, I'm gonna go after you next if you don't relax. We lost the game. Yeah. Fucking Kevin was tough though. God, oh, I saw yeah. him beat up some big guys in NHL. Like he gave it. He gave it to. Uh, Gordy Kluzak gave it to Bobby Probert. He was tough. Kevin was a tough little dude. Was it was he a factor in why you ended up signing with Hatford later in your career? No. You know, I kind of thought we might have a fight when I first got there because when <laughs> I didn't leave him on good terms. Oh. Uh, you, yeah, so no, but he ended up being a great teammate. You no, know, it was just the most money. They offered me the most money at that time. Did you right. uh, did you play with any Boston guys? I mean, it's a pretty dominant oh, Boston. Fuck, wait, you guys are you guys are the weirdest dudes on the planet, you Boston guys. <laughs> what do you mean by that? Just how big of assholes <laughs> they are for no reason? No, I live. I played with. Uh, I lived with Peter Taglinetti, who played at Providence, but he's from Boston. I played with Davy Silk. I played with uh, a couple guys in the minors: Scotty Harlow, Dominic Campadelli. They're all great guys. I love them. I played with Billy O'Dwyer for a little while. Just all real good guys. They were great teammates. But I got a great story about Davy Silk. I've got to set the story up a little bit. So, you know, when you're in the minors, you get called up and down a lot. If you get called up, the team gets stuck paying your lease deposit on your apartment, right? So Winnipeg thought it'd be really smart that they they would get a three bedroom apartment, and whoever got sent up and down would pay them rent every month. Worked out well, like a halfway house. So I start <laughs> the year with Peter Taglinetti and his his new wife at this time, Allison Taglinetti. Unfortunately, Allison passed away a couple of years ago. Nice lady. But um, he got called up right away. But she had lived and grew up in New Hampshire. So she had all her stuff at, the, at her at her apartment. They never came back for it for a long time. And Davy Silk got sent down. And Silky was a character. Like, he was one of the funnest, funniest guys I ever played with. And typical, like, Tuesday afternoon in the American League, we had a whole bunch of beers for lunch. We'd go back to watch some porno or watch St. Elmo's Fire or whatever we did, sitting there drinking beer. Oh, and uh, it was me, him, Alfie Turcotte, and Pepe was there. Claude Lemieux was with us. So he goes to take a pee, and he comes back, and he's gone into Allison's lingerie door, and he's put on a brawn panty set, a purple brawn panty set. And he sits down all straight-faced, and we start to laugh. And our door buzzer rings, right? It's an apartment building. So I go over there, and I say, hey, who is it? 
hey, Tom, it's Allison Tagliadini. I go, <laughs> perfect. That's great. So I go back, I buzz her in. I go to sit down. The guys go, who is it? And I go, it's uh, one of our teammates. I can't remember. So he's coming up for a beer. I said, Silky, Silky, you got to go answer the door because he'll make you think it's so funny. So, right? so Allison, Allison knocks on the door. Silky opens it. He's this hairy little Italian wearing her purple bra and panties. He screamed, she screamed, she went nuts. And we are laughing. He comes in and goes, tell us a tag with Eddie. And I go, I know, isn't that perfect? Like, that's <laughs> unbelievable, right? So I go downstairs and I say, hey, Alice, it's the first time. We haven't been sitting around wearing your underwear every game. But, you know, come on, it's kind of funny, right? And she starts to laugh and we bring her back up. So hot meat, which is what we call Peter Tagliadini. I know he's going to phone, right? And no cell phones, it's 1985. So the phone finally rings and he hits him. He's fucking pissed off. And I go, hey, 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 come on. It's kind of funny. And thanks for the heads up. Like, tell us Allison's coming. Like, come on, it's your fault, right? And, uh, but yeah, it was a great story. Silky was that just the best. Yeah. So funny. Another, funny. Another, another guy early in your career, uh, Dale Howichek. I mean, he was just a oh. pup just starting out. I know you didn't play a ton with him, but I mean, you must have saw how good he was right, right from the jump. He was amazing. You know, in an era, well, first off, our division, you know, we played with Edmonton. You know, if there was no Gretzky or no Mario, Dale would have been the best hockey player in the league. And he didn't play with the talent that those two guys did. And he was just a consummate pro and a wonderful teammate. He cared. Just a talented, talented guy. You know, it, to, to me, you always be captain. That's what we called him. And, you know, we lost a great guy. He's a good guy. Yeah. Super talented and a great, fun guy. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I had time for everybody. He, so he he just like, did you see it from that time? Like he just loved coaching. Like after he ended oh, he up did. retiring, he, like, he loved, loved teaching the he game. Loved he loved being young around. Players, yeah, right? being around it. He he just wanted everybody to enjoy hockey, and you know, and he really wanted. You know, winning was obviously really important to him, but to him, it was just the character he did, and he was just a good teammate that would evolve into something, right? And yeah, he was just wonderful. You know, and you know, he's so beloved in Winnipeg and in Barry and. Yeah, it's, you know, I got to talk to him his last day that he was here. A whole bunch of us did a Zoom call. You know, he's just, he did that in style too, right? He just, he just, with such grace and positivity, he was just a good dude. Yeah. It, it, it's maybe not as common anymore, but like back then it was like basically after practice, you would go out for beers and you would basically talk about the games, talk hockey. It would get into other conversations as well. It Was that kind of how it was when you were coming up and playing, at least in your NHL time? Yeah, you know, you know, Biz, I'm, you know, quite a bit older than you guys, but you know, I got lots of buddies in the game, and you know, I think I was lucky enough to play in the funnest time. Yeah, we, you know, we didn't have, we did, we flew commercial, we didn't flow charters, so we got to stay in towns after games, and you always had a buddy in the other team, and yeah, we drank every afternoon. If we weren't playing, we were eating chicken wings and drinking beer, right, and going home and have a nap at six o'clock, and you know, we had a lot of fun, and. A lot of good memories. I remember Ducky Dale was the first guy I met. He lived on a ranch out of town, but he had like nine TV sets and like four satellite dishes. The guy loved hockey. Like every night he watched every game that was going on in the NHL. I remember I was in Hartford and I scored a, one of my few goals. Although I did get one more point than you did, Biz. I checked our stats. Soccer, did you actually? I got one more point you than you. 23? You had 22 and oh, I had yeah. 23. Okay, yeah. In half the games. In half the games too, by the way. Um he, uh, I scored a winning goal, and I got home to the hotel later that night after drinking a whole bunch with Scotty Young. I played with Scotty Young, too. Great guy. Boston guy. Be you. And my phone was, there was a message. It was Ducky. He phoned. He goes, hey, great goal last night, right? Even though he's still in Hartford. I mean, or he's still in Winnipeg, and I'm in Hartford. He was just that kind of guy. That's awesome. But, yeah, Biz, we had a lot of fun. Road trips, you know, you know the rule is you always packed your bag before you left because if you didn't make it back, your roommate would have your bag for you. And there was a lot of hungover flights. Um, yeah, we had a lot of fun. We did. Well, it's certainly uh, great to hear these old stories. I don't know if you have anything. I mean, else. there's. I mean, there's more. I mean, you got. You, you did you play against Gordy Howe? Oh, it's a. What? Play, well, he was on the. He worked for the Hartford Whalers as a goodwill ambassador, you know, like Wendell Clark does in Toronto. Goes around all the boxes, but he would he would skate pregame skate with us uh, in his little green track suit and little coach's gloves and he was in his mid 60s and he could shoot left right you know he could shoot left handed as hard as he had right handed and i hadn't played in about 10 games and i was running around and pregame skate with too much energy and he stepped on the ice and i didn't see him i just bulldozed him he's got no gear on he's a big heap in the boards i go fuck fergie 
so, or uh, Gordy, I'm so sorry. So I went to pick Gordy up and he goes, hey, no problem, kid. And this is like November. So quite often uh, when I got scratched, which is about every one out of every, I played one out of every eight games, it seemed, at the end of pregame skate, we would do two on two. We'd have the two extra forwards, the extra defensemen. Then Gordy would be the other guy in two on two and we against the spare goalie. So it's like right near the playoff time, you know, I played two on two with Gordy at least a dozen times and he's on the other team. And I, you know, you don't think you're going to get hit in pregame skate with your buddies two on two. And I just get smoked an elbow right in the nose. Right. I'm down and bleeding all over the place. He looks down and he goes, you didn't think I forget a kid. (laughs) (laughs) Gordy just plastered me to the ice, but Gordy was the best. He, um, Gordy, Gordy's wife was quite strict with him. You know, he, she ran him, you know, he was, she was his business partner or whatever, consultant. She did all his PR visits and he, uh, he wasn't allowed to come out with us very often, but he was allowed to take us fishing. And uh, we, it was quite funny. We, you know, Hartford's not on the water, but it's about 45 minutes an hour to the coast in uh, Connecticut. And we would go down to the boat. It was the same thing every time. There'd be a big cooler full of beer there. The boat would never leave the marina. We just sit there and listen to Gordy's stories and drink a whole cooler of beer. It was just the best. Oh. He was a great dude. Um, wh- he had great stories. I got one more, unless you got one, Ari. Uh, actually, one other name I want to bring up is um, Paul McLean, who's the assistant in Toronto, I believe. He was coach for Ottawa. This guy was an absolute sniper, huh, when he played? I mean, he only played t- 10 years. And, he basically scored like 35 goals almost every year. Then he was done. And Big Mac Big Mac was quietly one of the toughest guys in the league, too. Not many guys bucked with him, but he was unbelievable and close. Uh, he was my roommate my first year, and and uh, I've got a Paul McLean story. Um I, I didn't, because I didn't start the year in Winnipeg, I didn't get shaved like the other guys. <laughs> so we're in New Jersey. We played on a Sunday night, Sunday afternoon. Sundays in Jersey is about the worst place you can be in the world, hey? God, it was awful. So we go out to have a few beers, and Big Mac was back in the room. I come in, and he I, he's laying on the bed. And he goes, I'm sorry, bus. And I go, what? Just, I'm sorry. It's not my idea. Our adjoining room opens up. Randy Carlisle, Robert Picard grabbed me. They taped me they brought hockey sticks and tape and they taped me over the dresser and they had recruited some young ladies that they had met that day to shave me top to bottom and the girls were <laughs> and big max just said hey dude it's your turn i can't help you oh, like I, what was, was with yeah. the shaving back then it's just like weird like why isn't it like, I, I think nobody used to shave their chest like guys wouldn't shave their chest i'm guessing oh, so, so if they, you did it it was like kind of embarrassing be like I'm, shaving somebody's eyebrow now Probably. I don't know. Some people have the slit in their eyebrow. Oh, that's cool in the circles you run in in the TikTok world. <laughs> yeah, fuck boy. Hey, yeah, no, nobody, nobody. There was no manscaping back then. Nope. Um, I got one left. Um, I mean, talking about another great one. You went from Gordie Howe. So you you got you signed with the Kings, and then you're in training camp with Wayne. Okay. So, you know, huge respect for Wayne. You know, I played against him, and – I went into training camp. They had a funny rule, the NHLPA back then. If you had played in the NHL the year before, you came to camp five days later than the guys who didn't. It was like, I don't know why they did that. First thing we did in LA was we did fitness testing and we did it in groups of five. And it was me, Larry Robinson, John Tonelli, our rookie, Daryl Sador, who was our, our first round pick and Gretzky. And, you know, Every training camp for me was basically a tryout. I wasn't there to get in shape. I had to come in in shape because I was barely going to make the team. And I remember we started with push-ups. And Larry was a stud. Like, for a guy in his 40s, he was so fit. You know, and, and everybody does, you know, 40, 50 push-ups. And Wayne cranks out two. <laughs> two. Right? So then then we go to unassisted sit-ups, right? And, again, you know, I, I did like 120. I can tell you, sit-ups don't help you make the team. And and uh, Gretz, Gretz gets to about six sit-ups and his feet pop up, and that's it. That's six sit-ups. He, he couldn't do one pull-up, not one. And then we did the VO2 test. You know, that VO2 test, the, it's a cruel test because the better shape you're in, the longer you have to ride. I think he lasted about six minutes, right? And he's just like, I'm going, fuck. So he's not on my team, my inner squad team, when we play against him. He's like non-existent. I don't even see him on the ice. And we make make a couple of cuts. We're down to 28, 30 guys, and we're doing a home and home with Pittsburgh. First game in Cleveland, second the next night in in Pittsburgh. And uh, we don't. I don't dress that first game. And again, I've got Wayne, 
Uh, Larry's not on the ice. And I remember we're, there's like six of us getting skated after pregame skate and we're doing two on one, simple two on ones. And Wayne's my partner in every one of them. And like, I don't get one shot on net. Like the passes are hitting me in the back of the ass or the behind me. And I, I go over to my dude, just trying to make the team, man. Like just, just throw it in front of me. Like, fuck, let me have a shot on net. And I see Wayne naked for the first time, this whole training <laughs> camp after that pregame skate. And, you know, he's not a specimen. He's got a little bit of a beer belly. He's got no shoulders. He's got skinny legs. His fucking ass is hanging over his jock strap. And I just got married that summer. So after that, I go to the hotel and I phone my wife and she's a huge Oiler fan. I just go, how's Gretzky? No, Gretzky, how is he? And I go, fuck, you know, honey, I think he's done. He hasn't taken care of himself. I think he's, he's kind of hit the line. It hit the end of the road. Like he's not going to play. We go into Pittsburgh the next night and pop six. We win nine, five, and he gets six goals and two assists. And it's the last game I've ever played in the NHL. <laughs> and I think Gretz won the scoring race by 55 points. <laughs> Good call, buddy. It was unbelievable. Yeah. No, it was you, unbelievable. Did you turn your career into a scout after that or what? <laughs> <laughs> well, buddy. And I hey. got to play. It was Yammer Yarger's first game. Yarger's no way. Game. Yeah. Oh, yeah, my God. Yeah, we were all looking at him at warm up. And he was all tall. He had that long hair. He looked like a giraffe. And we're like, fuck, what a waste of a draft pick that was. Holy I don't know fuck. exactly what year it was, but I have the range within four years. He went 168, 142, 163, 121 points. Yeah. So, Bussy, you were dead yeah. on. You were, you yeah. it. You hit it out of the park, he, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, uh, this has been unbelievable. A great storyteller. Thank you so much for joining us. Hilarious story about getting traded for a bus. Now, is there one that you got to leave us with? Is there one that we forgot to mention that you, is, is a go-to of yours? Uh, go-to? Well, you kind of, I kind of gave you all the big highlights. Um, Jim Kite, Dave Ellett. Oh, roommates. Jimmy Kite. No, Jimmy Kite's a great one to finish on. Just to tell what. So I live with Davey Ellett and Jim Kite, and Jimmy is. Jimmy's clinically deaf. He can't hear without hearing aids, right? So um, same thing. It's a Tuesday. We're watching movies. And, you know, we've, you know, we used to be on the Molson sponsors. So we always had lots of beer. And, you know, it's your turn. Hey, Jimmy, go get a beer for the three of us. So every time Jimmy would go get a beer, we would turn the t- TV down. We wouldn't hit the mute button. We'd turn it right down so it's nothing. And then we'd pretend to talk to each other. And Jimmy would think he's missing some so he would turn his hearing aids up and then we go jimmy <laughs> it worked once a month it would work and you know i remember we would crawl in drunk dave and i and we grab jimmy's hearing aids from the bedside table and i go throw them in the freezer and then i get up about a half an hour before him and i put him back on his nightstand so when he got up in the morning he had frozen hearing aids and they would <laughs> yeah, that's, that's just so kind of fucking stuff mean <laughs> yeah, you're a bully you're a and bully. they would scream we'd be driving the rink and they, because they were frozen they'd be screaming in his ear the whole way and he couldn't swear when he had his couldn't swear properly when he didn't have his hearing aids in. Like we had fun. Oh, Great guy, Tom. Appreciate thank you, it. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. How hey, long thanks was for that? having me. A real pleasure, you guys. Hey, as I said, uh, it's uh, gives me a lot of cool creds with the all the young people I know back in Victoria. And I got gonna, a lot of fans. I'm, I'm going to come back and do a great that, job. I'm going to come back and play that dice game. Get my fucking money back, buddy. Hey, Wits, member guests. I'll be there. Yeah. Nice, nice talking to you, Bussy. Appreciate I, it. I haven't paid my dues yet. He can't of come. Shaga. <laughs> huge thanks to bussy for joining us what a character that guy was biz hilarious oh story goodness. getting traded for a bus and having some fun with it well that interview was also brought to you by ocb rolling papers ocb is the largest rolling paper brand in the world and has been one with nature crafted naturally since 1918 so you know they've perfected the process for a consistently great session time after time And now's your chance to join the OCB family forever. OCB rolling papers are giving a lifetime supply of rolling papers, cones, and some fresh swag to their loyal fans. Make sure to check out at OCB underscore USA today for a chance to win. All you have to do is follow at OCB underscore USA on Instagram. Like the OCB high hall post and tag two friends in the comments to win. And there's also a shortcut on ocbusa.com slash chicklets with a link to enter on Instagram right now. You must be 21 to buy the papers and to follow these social accounts. Good luck with that. Enjoy because they're the best papers in the world. And uh, what's going on in hockey tonight? I meant to bring this up earlier because I compared their Stanley Cup chances to Toronto. They might be above the Leafs. (laughs) 
I want to apologize to the city of Buffalo. And the thing is, when dogging their team in the $750,000 contracts they gave out to everyone, I was more than anything just kind of kicking a dog when it's down, right? Yeah. No, I was kind of enjoying the joke that the Buffalo Sabres organization has become. And I got to be honest, like I'm friends with Jack Eichel. I think it's bullshit what's going on. But I never once... Never once disliked the Sabres fans. What a great group of people. It's the Bills Mafia in the hockey world. So I, 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 as much as I want Eichel to get out of there, I don't want the Sabres to be horrible. And now to see this start, to see them shit kick the two-time defending Stanley Cup champions tonight, 5-1, you got to give credit where credit's due to a bunch of proud players. And Ari's been saying this from the beginning, that Granados had that team play different from the minute he got in there. So obviously they're using... And, and without being in the locker room, I can say, obviously, they're using, using everyone. Oh. Everyone is calling you guys a joke. They're not using anything that you'd be using <laughs> off the ice. Well, they're you said using, R.A. Using, and using, they, and I'm they, like, and then we just came out of the rolling papers ad. I was like, oh, they actually are doing shit. Down they're there? using clowns like us. They're using <laughs> they're using absolute morons like myself as probably a little motivation, right? Like everyone thinks we're a joke. And all of a sudden, they've came out guns ablaze, and I'm happy for the team. And, and I don't think it'll continue, but they've certainly already proven that if you're going to take them lightly, then you're probably going to lose that game. Well, I don't know if you knew, but they're actually using the alumni team. That's why they've been. Phil Housley was it. running the point. I saw that <laughs> joke. I was like, did I forget that this is an alumni game? Guys, it's every cre- other game. It's every other game. Yeah. Like you said, with credit where it's due, it's fun. I mean, it's, it's kind of going to be this on running joke of how long they can sustain this dominance in the NHL, at least at the beginning of the year. And, I guess like the not the the one surprise, but a guy who's really been good there in, in the early days is that Victor Olsen. He had another two tonight. He's got four on the season. They got a lot of young guys. And as you met for, uh, mentioned for Granado, they're, they're playing their balls off. I just maybe that loose approach that they had with the coach before uh, you had him in, uh, in Edmonton. If if the Leafs off the, offered Buffalo Marner for Eichel, who says no? Oh, here we go. You're going to start proposing trades? Oh, it's just literally it just came to my head. I think he's got a no move clause, doesn't he? I don't think he does. It starts yeah. in two years. Oh, does he really? Marner okay. could get dealt. Nylander could get dealt. I'm just thinking like I'm thinking first. It, but want to hear how my brain or want to hear like exactly what happened there. I was thinking Buffalo. Wow. What a great start. What a great start. Fuck. I hope they get rid of Ike's. I hope they get rid of Ike's. Wow. Toronto's pretty close. The Toronto Maple Leafs have sucked. And I, I thought they'd be great and Buffalo would be shit. But, oh, my God. Toronto has a guy that maybe they want to trade at some point. Mitch Marner, right? Eichel needs to get out of town. Boom. I asked you the question. That's how it went. But now, then, maybe I, that makes sense or maybe it doesn't. But nonetheless, like, I'm wondering who says no. I don't think maybe Dubas because he's sticking so to Toronto, his guns. Toronto would. Okay. He's, st- he's sticking to his guns. But think about the, they think about the amount of uh, assets they can maybe even add to the lineup. They they do get rid of Eichel to add to this wagon of a team. Maybe I who know. knows? May, maybe we pose the question: Does Buffalo go farther this season than the Toronto Maple Leafs? <laughs> and maybe they're just going to make a fool out of everyone. So print no, the look, Buffalo, Canale. Montreal. Let's see how Buffalo, Montreal ends up. I think Montreal ends up with 17 more points than them. All right. I don't really have much else to say on Buffalo. I'm actually hoping they start shitting again. So they're sucking again. So we can start shitting on them. Well, wagon we, shirts we, are available though. Wagon yeah, shirts are back those, on sale. Those are maybe the best shirt we've ever created. The wagon Buffalo, Buffalo Sabre shirts. Uh, I was, I was listening to NHL, radio this morning and they were talking about um this is this could be a year where like a team gets like 96 points in the east because the the metro is just crushing everyone right i think the metro is like 22 7 and 5 something i i'm I'm a little off there but it's a ridiculous record and they're talking about usually you get 93 points you're pretty much guaranteed a playoff spot 93 94 but this year it's like with how good the east is and how bad some of the teams in the west are it could be a team like with 89 points in the West sneaking in, and it could be a team with 96 points in the East that gets fucked. So just a storyline we could watch. Good conversation on uh, the radio show I had on NHL. Nice. Uh, all right, Biz, before we get to you, uh, TNT antics this week, which is going to be a weekly segment on this show, uh, we got to acknowledge the San Jose Sharks. Uh, this is a team that nobody had doing anything. Everybody dumped all over them. They're 4-1 and one out of the gate. 
uh, have outscored the opposition 19-11. Won their first four before losing to the Bruins Sunday. Aiden Hill had a great start. Struggled a little bit Saturday. But uh, Eric Carlson uh, looking a bit like his old self. Biz, have you seen San Jose play much? Yeah, he's been chucking in the chew, getting the job done offensively from the back end. And, like, I I think one of the points I want to bring up is, like, they kind of got rid of a distraction too, right? And it seems like they're all having a good time. They got some great goaltending in Aiden Hill. I've been pumping Aiden Hill's tire since I seen him come into the league with the Coyotes. I was devastated when they got rid of him. And all of a sudden, he's fucking kicking for them. They had a great road trip. They ended up uh, losing to Boston with a pretty strong comeback there. It just fell short 4-3. Yeah, they three, didn't quit, man. No quit in that game, Paul. They, they did not quit. And, and one thing that they've always been able to do is draft well and develop prospects. And all of a sudden, you get these guys out of nowhere who are starting to contribute. They're not household names. So we'll see what's going to happen. And another guy who you heard rumblings of who wanted to leave at the beginning of the year was Tomas Hurdle. And they cannot lose him. He is a big component to that team. And I'm curious to know, given the, the, the great start, if he's maybe changing his attitude and his mind, much like Tarasenko is which could transition us into another topic because I know we're going to get to St. Louis right after this, but a great start for the San Jose Sharks on a team that we had at the bottom of the Pacific. Now I could easily, I could easily just considering I picked them to be a bottom feeder, no pun intended, the Sharks, (laughs) um, they could fucking win the Pacific. That's how weak it is. So who knows, who knows what we're going to see. Um, a great start. Brent Burns actually texted me the other day and was pumping my tires about the TNT debut. Not a big deal. And uh, hopefully we can get him back on the podcast if this team keeps going to talk about, you know, what's changed inside that locker room and, and, and what's being done in order to kind of propel them off to this amazing start compared to what we saw last year. I, uh, I went to the game, brought Ryder, another one of his buddies. Oh. My thoughts were the Sharks, yeah. Like, so Eklund and I think you say Darling, Darling. Jonathan Dolan. Dolan? He, yeah. yeah. So two rookies, two Swedes that are playing for this team. Dolan, he was in the, he wasn't in his team, wasn't in the uh, Swedish elite league last year, the Swedish hockey league. They were in the, like the first division down and he lit it up. He lit it up where Merles lives, Timra, his hometown. So he came over and like, that's a guy. And then Eklund also high pick this year pick, makes yeah. the team. So William Eklund and, and, and like, also, you, you forget, like, Bonino's there, Cogliano's there. You got some veteran presence, which they've obviously kind of had. I, f- I feel like it's always been a, a veteran team there in San Jose. But it definitely was, like, no quit, no give up, and, and an attitude that was different than I kind of thought looking at their season. I was down on them big time. And, and I think looking at, like, what they have and the way Carlson and Burns were playing, and even Vlasic had some jump in his step. And they lost 4-3, but it was a sick comeback. My thought on the Bruins was... I know we've said this a million times like that line. It must be so fun. Every imagine how fun it is, biz. Like think it back yeah. in the playing days. There was a day I got a couple scoring chances. Like, Oh my God, that was a fun game. Every shift they're on the ice. It was the first shift of the game. They got one and it really never let up. They could have had five, six goals the line. Yeah. Anson Carter brought it up too. It's like every game they lead with them too. leading with. Oh the yeah. Right eight. out. Lead, lead with the ace of spades and Anson mentioned it before that game on TNT when they were playing against Philadelphia they ended up dropping the game but they it was a 50-50 puck off the opening face off Marshawn wins it gets it back they dump in his quarter he runs in wins the puck battle gets it back and then they have a, a, a minute shift of sustained pressure in the offensive zone to start the game out and what the fuck are the next lines going to do they're going to follow in these guys footsteps They set the tone every single night. Sure enough, the next game, 30 seconds in, they start the big line. They end up putting one in the back of the net. They create a turnover, beautiful setup. I think Marshaw or uh, Marshaw scored it. Pasternak with a beautiful feed over to, to, to Bergeron. Into, into the slot area where Marshall was. Still don't know how he got that puck off the way that his body was. But it's just – and then I think they, that line ended up having three that night against San Jose. So it uh, – it's it, they're a treat to watch. Um, I would say it's fair to say they're probably the, the best, Bruin lines, best Bruins line to ever exist. I, I think talking at the game and Tough being, one, from, right? being from Boston, I think they're the best line – one one of the best lines ever in the NHL. Um, like the French Connection RA was like a crazy line in Buffalo, correct? Yeah. Oh, yeah, um, absolutely, yeah. What yeah. other lines? Curry Gretzky, like who was the their winger? Legion Sometimes it was Zoom. Semenko, wasn't it? 
the Legion of Doom with um, oh yeah. Le- the Legion uh, of Poon, Lindros, Leclerc, Renberg. I mean, Oates, Neely, and I mean, they could have thrown me on that fucking the other the other wing. <laughs> it would have been the greatest fucking yeah. wings ever. I think that this line has done more than the Legion of Doom did. No, I agree. The Legion I mean, of Doom went to a cup you, final, you were, and but but I think like how long did they were they together? Maybe four years. Not all that long. And, you, and you're talking about two guys. I mean, I think and Bergeron probably definitely going to the Hall of Fame. Marshawn is certainly on the track. If Pasta keeps it up, he'll be a Hall of Fame. But you're talking three Hall of Famers on one line. And- I think if Geep Carbono's in the Hall of Fame, then you're putting yeah. Brad Marshawn in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. He is he is so good. It's crazy. And and the other shout out was McAvoy, and he signed the big deal. And watch him in person, dude. He closes time and space very quick. Yeah. He is in a unit that is light on his feet and flying around offensively. He's got a lot of confidence. Just a a big time, like a true number one defenseman out there that that de- that's deserving of that big payday he got. So Everyone's it was great. Being, it was great being at a game, dude. Ryder loves it. With James and James Byrne, Teddy Ryan, these kids, they're all the same age. My good friends, we've all had sons within like, I think Ryder and James are two weeks and then Teddy's about six months younger, but they love hockey. They're watching the game. It was just really cool to kind of experience that. There was tons of kids there being one o'clock start. So quickly, uh, that game was against Boston on, on TNT, Boston and Philly. The only other thing I wanted to mention from it was Atkinson's hot start in Philly. And he felt that some of the fan base in Columbus had given up on him and said that maybe he's not not washed up, but he definitely doesn't have the same pep in his step from the year that he played with Panarin. And I asked him post game because he had some pretty aggressive comments, basically being like, you know, these people think that like Panarin made me. He's like, you know, I had a couple 30 goal seasons before Panarin showed up. And he's like, I got a fucking chip on my shoulder and I'm about to prove some shit this year. And he's been off to a hot start. So it was cool to see them. They got a they got a very well balanced offense in Philly. That is fun to watch, and they still don't even have Hazy in the lineup. I like what 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 their team brings. Obviously, Carter Hart's got to still figure out some things, but the other game that we ended up getting of that doubleheader was Vegas and St. Louis, and this was my first chance to really get a, a look at this St. Louis team coming out of the gate this year. That game was played with so much unbelievable pace the entire night. You had Johnny predictions that night too, Biz. You said Philly over Boston, and then you called the Tarasenko goal over Vegas. Gotta That's right. Here. I was. I was humming. I fucking blacked out. What happened? But she didn't yeah. bet it though. I didn't. No, I, I, I've been picking losers lately, oh, just yeah. like the Leafs tonight puck line, and they get. All right, he's a gambler now. Now, whatever yeah, you don't bet, you no. win. He's experiencing what Learn he the dealt hard way. with. Yeah, but uh, incredible game. Back and forth, uh, great goaltending. Uh, I picked Tarasenko, who's had a great start to the season. I guess he scored another nasty one tonight against the LA Kings. But this St. Louis team is the real fucking deal, man. They, Ryan O'Reilly was mic'd up. You could just tell he had some pep in his step, and he loves those big moments and those big games. And and they ended up stepping up to the occasion. And uh, obviously Vegas is is dealing with some uh, scoring issues right now. And, uh, you know, I, 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 you can't really put the onus on Leonard. And they're really struggling after, you know, missing Stone and Pacioretty. And their power play, their numbers when they don't score power play goals as far as an organization so far are not very good. And uh, they need to fucking pick that up or they're going to be in trouble. Like, they're they're at the bottom of the division right now. Also, Butch Nevitz got a two-game sussy foul. Our second headbutt of the uh, season, folks. Second cocoa butt of the season. Cocoa butt off uh, Arizona's Lawson Kroos. I mean, it's like WWF in the 1980s over here with the cocoa butts. But, yeah, two Uh, games for him. Uh, Also, too, I want to go back to Philly for a sec. Nate Thompson. like uh, Seattle's Nathan Bastian went off uh, his captain, Claude Drew. Big mistake. Oh, I mean, he's given him so I mean, many rights. He was a Nate's a, for a such left. a nice guy off the ice, but like <laughs> you mess with his captain, he's gonna do that to you. That was pummeling, fierce pummeling. Yeah, yeah, but uh, hey, and 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 just quickly, St. Louis Bennington, um, you know his his GM is GM of the Olympic team, and right now I'd say that he's probably one of the guys that's going to be going at least the way that he started this season. He looks back. He looks like he's in, in in playoff mode already from a few years ago. So um, I'm excited for that. And then uh, and then I don't know who the other guys are going to be, but uh, you know there may be some uh, some nepotism involved. Well, I think uh, that would be hard. one of them's Blackwood. That's why he got vaccine vaccinated because I think you'd have to be to go to the Olympics, and he's one of the goalies. 
The Blues, that's my pick I want back most from the preseason. I don't know what I was thinking. You didn't, I can't blame you on that one, Biz. And it's like O'Reilly, and I didn't really think of how good Perron is. Shen, it's a team that I, I think with Bennington playing like he is, it's no surprise. And for some reason, I thought it would be. But the young guns, that Cairo flies around. Robert Thomas plays more. So not at all surprised. I don't know what I was thinking. One of my many bad takes, Biz, I know. I know you've had them. I have a lot more of them. <laughs> I, I, in the end, though, it's Ryan O'Reilly up front. And when Bennington's this good, they're going to be able to beat anyone. So the goal tonight was sick. Tarasenko undressed someone. I can't think of it right away. And just scored shelf. And maybe that's a guy that, that, that doesn't end up wanting to be traded, right? But he's doing exactly what you have to do if you, if you still want to be dealt. Like he requested, you play as well as you can. You give him as many, many opportunities for teams to come calling. But he's won a cup here, and they're winning. Uh, maybe all of a sudden he changes his mind. He's playing good. He's playing a lot more. And I don't know how that's going to go down, but they're going to get a lot for him if they do trade him if he's playing this well. Uh, one other team, Biz, we needed to talk about from the doubleheader you covered, uh, the Vegas Golden Knights. Uh, it's been tough sledding for them so far. One and four start. Uh, they're missing Mark Stone and Max Patchy already. Stone is somewhere between uh, day-to-day and week-to-week. Uh, Patchy already is week-to-week. He fractured his foot. And also defenseman Zach Whitecloud is also out week-to-week. Uh, Robin Lena, I mean, I don't think he's been playing bad. His numbers no. one and four, three to eight with a nine oh four. You know, it's just indicative of a team that's losing a lot of pots. I, I think he's getting hung out to dry a little bit. Chandler Stevenson leading the team and scoring two goals, two assists, four points in five games. Uh, but in fo- in their last four games, I'm sorry, in the I'm well, sorry. I mean, in all that, right, like in that St. No. Louis game, I think he had over 40 stops. It was a goaltending showcase until that third period when Tarasenko ended up scoring the winner. And then against the Islanders, they didn't score a goal. They lost 2-0. Yeah. Does, yeah, he probably want the, does he want the Barzell goal back? You know, probably because it was short side shelf on, on, on a not, a not so good angle. But fuck, they didn't even pot one. So, I mean, at, at that point, you're losing 2-1. So you can't blame the Panda at this point. They got no goal support right now. What do they got? Nine fucking goals in six games? Yeah, they've been, they've been struggling and obviously missing a couple of offensive horses. Only going to make it worse. Uh, in their five, what's it? I'm sorry. Yeah, five games, they've scored four goals, three goals, two goals, one goal, and zero goals. Uh, six goals in the That's not the trend. Game, so. It's not the trend you want. Yeah. Not not the way you want to go. So, boys, moving right along. The Detroit Red Wings, 107 games they went without being a favorite. Uh, they were favored over Columbus Monday. They ended up winning the game 4-1. Uh, to one. Mo Sider, number 53. Biz, imagine he took this number because of Herbie the Love Bug, which is a Disney character, like going back 50 years. He saw the movie when he was a kid and decided that's going to be my number. You ever heard a story like it's, that before? I mean, it's working for him. It's but the training right camp is. number, he's... Man, he's he's a cocky fucker too. We talked about it last week. He stole the puck from uh, from Hedman after the faceoff. Cross checked Oliver Ekman Larson. He's off to a hell of a start, folks. And and Stevie Y has already got this team playing a lot better. They are going to compete all season long. We joked about turning him into the goon squad, but that just tells you that there's been a culture change and that these guys are willing to stick up for one another and 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 compete with one another every night. And then on top of having a guy on the back end that's, you know, in, in his rookie campaign coming out of nowhere, you got this Lucas Raymond four point night against the Hawks goes into Chicago. I mean, you get the fucking pizza from DeHaan to start things off confidence rolling ends up getting the hat trick. Only two other players in Detroit Red Wings history have had a four point game before the age or, or, or while being the age of 19, excuse me, Gordy Howe and Stevie bong rips. So this guy is off to an amazing start. And, and, and I know the you Detroit fans who have been so hard pressed for these four years, <laughs> you go on a 20 year run with horseshoes stuck up your ass, getting lucky with every single goddamn draft pick, even the ninth rounders. And now all of a sudden you're pulling more rabbits out of your ass. So fucking congratulations, Red Wings. You're back at it for fuck's sakes. Why can't the coyotes get a fucking couple fucking bounces? No, they will this year though. So they'll, they'll, they'll get they'll get Shane right. Honk. Um, Bert. I think that I think that the the Red Wings are on the come up. The the Raymond kid could be very special. I mean, that's a tall pick. Plays with edge. Gets quicker. Gets better. And I guess this guy's like a seasoned pro. 
you know, off the ice, like came to Detroit, was living there this summer, like totally is all in on becoming like as great as he can. So it's always good when you hear, you know, the type of kids these guys are right. These, these kids are so driven now and he's one of those dudes. So Cider's a prick. Like you mentioned, I mean, it's not just stealing the puck. He plays mean, he plays physical and he's huge. Maybe not like tons of offensive upside, but maybe it just keeps getting better as well. He's a true number one. But I, I think that it's exciting if you're a Wings fan because it's been pretty quick to at least all of a sudden have some guys you're really looking at like that you can enjoy the season watching. Yeah. So I like it. And, and uh, Bertuzzi, obviously unable to travel to Canada, gets the night off against Montreal. He's nasty. Hey, hey boys, I'll see you in Chicago. I'll meet you there. <laughs> I think he had one and two. And you were talking about Cider. Like you talked about the offensive upside. I mean, I think he's already got, what, six assists this year? Fuck, he's their best bad. defenseman already. Yeah, on the team. So, yeah, it's 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 going to be interesting, guys. We, we said three, four years out. This thing might happen a little bit sooner. Yeah, Detroit, very exciting to watch thus far. Uh, a few other teams we want to mention, uh, the Pittsburgh Penguins, 3-0 oh, and 2 out of the gate. They've been getting some scoring by committee, Biz. Uh, I know you want to talk about the leadership of Sully. He's obviously the most winningest coach in team history. Uh, they've gotten goal. They've gotten goals from eleven different forwards. They were missing Geno, Sid, Latang, Rust, and Cotton. They still beat up on Toronto seven to one. Uh, Crosby still not sure when he's going to be cleared, but they're getting led by these kind of like you know by committee. Like I said, Drew O'Connor, undrafted free agent out of Dartmouth, leads the team with five points. Danton Heinen, free agent signing. Uh, Evan Rodriguez, Northeastern product. Be you. Getting- I'm sorry. I thought it was Northeastern. My bad. Be you. Oh, you know. yeah. Oh, don't say that when we went around. But it's, it's get guys, it, it's, a, it right. it, it's a cultural thing. And, you know, I they win the division last year, and I think that they're going to not make playoffs this year. I am just oh for the goddamn century right now. And with injury comes opportunity. And there's Drew O'Connor. Who knows? Who knows, guys? Maybe all of a sudden you got the next Jake Gensel. And that's just kind of the luck that Pittsburgh has had with some of these guys that they end up picking out of nowhere. And, uh, and all of a sudden you hear Crosby who spoke with the media, he's not far from coming back. And the fact that he's even just joined the team for practice has just elevated their mood mood. And I'm sure the pace of how practice and how they're conducting themselves. And with, as far as Mike Sullivan, I think that the, the fan base is a little bit, Like, because, you know, I follow online a little bit and like the minute things are not going so great, they want a coaching change or they want to trade flurry off or or whatever goalies in in what situation at the time. But given with what they've gotten to start the season and where they're at early and more five games in folks, early candidate for the for the Jack Adams, I would imagine. Yeah, I mean, you uh, I, I, I don't I don't really understand how people want him fired right if you're a penguins fan because he's the winningest penguins coach of all time the team right now like the the win that they had against the leafs was ridiculous i actually you remember rob rossi (laughs) he wrote he tweeted this is my 17th season covering the penguins their 7-1 win over the maple leafs might be the most impressive regular season victory in that span probably ranks among 10 reg top 10 regular season wins in franchise history, not being hyperbolic. Wow. Gosh, stuff given circumstances where they really were. They didn't have four hall of famers in the lineup. They were kind of icing somewhat of like an AHL squad. I mean, they had a ton of guys that won't be in the lineup if everyone's healthy playing and they dusted Toronto who was starving for a win. So if you don't think the coach is partly to has something to do with this start without who they've had in the lineup, you're crazy. Uh, He's the head coach of Team USA for a reason. He's another example of a guy who failed at the beginning at a younger age as a head coach. He was in Boston. And then your second go around after he's with Tortorella for a long time in New York, second go around your head coach. Yeah, you have Crosby and Malcolm, but he's done a ridiculous job there. And this year's start's been no different. Yeah, I think that the 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 fire Sullivan chat start when the the fact that what they haven't won a playoff game in the last two, three years. Yeah. So I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to put him as much stock in that, but definitely off to a great, a uh, great start to the season. All right, boys, moving right along. Uh, shit, man, there's so many notes on so many teams. We got to speed it up a little here. We're going to give a shout out to Anze Kopita, who had nine points in his first five games. I know the Kings are playing right now. I think they're losing, but um, the little, little, little bit of a surprise out of the gate with the Kings. Also, hey, did you see the play by uh, Matthew Kachuk, Calgary? The puck was going on the stands. 
and I was going to hit like somebody at, like in the lower rows, like at a pretty high velocity. And Matthew jumped up with a stick and batted it down. Like it's, I've never seen it before. I mean, he was basically making sure someone didn't get their face broken or stitches or, or fucking teeth knocked out. I mean, he got a penalty for it, two minutes for interference. Did you see, did you see this guys? No, no, I he didn't catch that one. He literally, yeah, it was crazy. I'd never seen nothing before. He literally jumped up because he saw the puck was like going to go into the crowd, but you know, with a little bit of mustard on it. And if it caught somebody, it might have split him. And he jumped up and knocked it down with his stick like a fucking Jedi. Why did he get a penalty? It was going to go over the glass. It was his own teammate who dumped it out from inside of his zone. So they're like, ah, that was heading out. Boom, get in the box. Yeah, I I just. that's well, bullshit. You should well, be able okay. to save the puck from going out. Are you kidding me? The but he was on the bench. But he's also yeah, on he, the bench. Oh, no, he I'm the sorry, bench, yeah. dude. I if you said that, I apologize. I thought no. he was in on the ice. Okay, that's a little yeah. different. No, he was on the he was on the bench. It was, it was just a crazy play I'd never seen before. I know we mentioned Tampa Bay getting their rings earlier. Fall Out Boy played the ceremony. Biz got the CD. Uh, also, did you guys see that picture of the Tampa Bay Fire Department? They had one of their uh, ladder trucks painted over. Half of it was. Tampa Bay um, Lightning champs. The other side was uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers champs. On each side, on the end, was the Tampa Bay Devil Rays. Well, they don't the Devil Rays. Sounds Devil like Rays. a sick fire truck, all right? No, it really did. It, lo- it looked unreal. I guess we did it a few months back. But if I mean, you know, I haven't seen it. Send me the picture over. All right. Uh, oh, you rattled? Are you rattled right no, now? No, I, I, I didn't think you were going to rank on a, a, a nice fire truck. I didn't, I didn't see you. <laughs> hey, wait, my dad was a fireman. That's insensitive. <laughs> Please take it back. No, I'm not a, I'm not a fire I, fire. How did I dog yeah. it? I said it, it sounds like no. a sick fire truck. No, you're an asshole. You're, you're uninvited to the, to the fireman and police officer game in NYC next year. All right, Biz. Uh, do you know this kid, Dyson Mayo, in Arizona? His first goal in his first NHL game, taking 133rd overall back in the 14 draft, 208 AHL games, 25 Coast games, and he gets a goal. I just uh, think his first if NHL it, game, nice it, story, it, perseverance, guys, and and I love Fuck stories right. like this, and and you know, given this the situation in Arizona right now, and. Um, you know, the fact that, you know, you're going to get some opportunities if you're a guy in the minors, the fact that this guy went from the coast to the A and then now in his first NHL game scored his first goal. He looked great out there, happy for him. And I just thought it was something that we could bring up a little bright spot in the Coyotes season, including Clayton Keller with another tuck against the Florida Panthers tonight, who he, he put on seven pounds this off season. He's uh, he's looking really good. He's looking like the player that we expected him to be. So that's all I really got for the Coyotes. They played a great game against uh, the Islanders, but fucking Islanders put them to sleep. I thought the, I thought the, the the Coyotes deserved to win that game. Fuck, they limited them to four shots in the first fucking period. But uh, off Islanders back off to boring hockey with back to back shutouts. Like uh, Columbus, Max Domi, uh, he's going to be on the injured reserve with a rib fracture out two to four weeks. Uh, Patrick Liney got two overtime goal, game winning goals. On the first week of the season, 18-year-old Cole Sillinger got his first NHL goal as well. Uh, out in Anaheim, forward Max Jones is going to be out four to six months with a torn peck. Hate to see that with, uh, with a young staff today. We like obviously would rather see him on the ice. And uh, Mason McTavish, he should be back soon. Uh, also, New Jersey, Jack Hughes dislocated his left shoulder. Will not require surgery. Uh, he's going to be on IR. Sucks to see that as well. Uh, hat tip to Jimmy Vizu. Got a goal. He started off as a PTO with uh, Jersey. Got a goal. Got some nice ice time there. And uh, Nico does his first NHL start. He got the win as well. So a couple of nice stories there, boys. Uh, yeah, and the- quickly, it sucks for Jack Hughes because for the most part, if that happens, you end up needing surgery at some point. Now, I guess if it's not a bad one at all, that won't be the case. But probably in a sling when he comes back, Biz, you know, that always affected guys. You have to play in the sling. You have to get used to it. So that's just brutal news because his start had been so good. Yeah, people, people are probably wondering, wait, a sling on the ice? Yeah, sometimes they, they, ha- they have guys that put them on underneath their equipment. So it limits their range of motion to where it would make yeah. it vulnerable to make it worse if you were to get hit in that situation. So, but that just, man, I've, I think I've put on one of those because I had eight bad AC joints and it just limits you so much. And for a guy who needs his hands in, in, in that move, who was limited to begin with who me, <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, you fucker. Like putting a bear trap on me out there. But uh, yeah, that that's <laughs> shitty. That's shitty news. That's fucking too many injuries. There's so many guys going down right now with injuries. Yeah, we hate reporting them, but we do have to pass them along. Uh, three stars of the week. Uh, Kyle Connor, Winnipeg Jets, five goals, three assists in three games. Uh, Connor McDavid, three goals, five assists in three games. And Ilya Sorokin, uh, three zero and one with the nine nine goals against, then the nine seven one save percentage with two shutouts as well. And uh, Biz, uh, Mike McKenna, uh, guest of the program, he talked about uh, e buds and his feelings on them. He figured, he feels this should be a taxi squad goaltender, uh, a full time paid number three that would travel, practice, and be ready for every game when called upon. Uh, he thinks they could rework the CBA to include a provision that allows teams to carry a third goaltender. They could enter the game in emergency situations, obviously the situations which we'd expect here. Um, I know you opined about it yourself to us on the email, Biz. What you take here? I know. I think it's a great idea. I guess you would just have to figure out like what, what, what would be salary. Like it would be tough to you can't pay them more than what the guys would be making in the American League. Yeah, he was saying basically two fifty k would be the like. Well, yeah, but fucking both the both the guys in the AHL are making less than that. So it's yeah, but of- he can't play unless it's middle of the game. Like they'd have to call somebody up. You know what I'm saying? Or are you just saying salary because he's sitting? No, there? I just I think that I think that you could probably persuade you. You would what you would probably get is is not a you would get a competent goalie that is a little bit older that is not going to be getting developed in the American hockey league. Right. But you're also going to see no game action. So to pay a guy like that two fifty when guys are in the American league making less, I think that the money's off. So McKenna's the- saying two fifty. there's beer league goalies sprinting to the gym right now. Like what? Like, it would be a beer league goalie, correct? No, it, it would probably, it would be a, it would probably be a guy like McKenna who's, if he if he had the ability to now mind you he's got a family and I don't know if he could be traveling around but you're but as a team you're not going to go you're not going to put one of your prospects because you need him playing in the American yeah. League and developing so you have to find a situation where you're going to get like a like a like a, 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 like a bullpen pitcher and and that's yeah. kind of the example to use you got to get gotcha. some guy who's yeah. like 35 years old who loves going on the fucking road with yeah. the boys crushing beers but not making 250. You got to yeah. and not playing. This is the best job in the world. I might become a fucking goalie <laughs> for 125 grand. I'd do it. Absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah. Hey, all right. You had a pretty good showing of ball hockey. I love the concept. I just don't think the money's right. Cause then it's yeah. just like, then, then, a, then a, 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 the fucking American league guy is going to want to go just hang around with the team making two fifty. <laughs> like you're going to have prospects, not wanting to be prospects. You're going to have them wanting to be booze bags that are I going wanna to be suspect packs. Butt chugging pink Whitney dog. Let's go. Just saying, don't get both of you guys better not get injured. We also want to send our best wishes to Mike Bossy. Uh, he's going to be stepping away from his on air role at TVA Sports as he battles lung cancer. Uh, this is this guy, he's a name that should pop up a lot more. We talk about the best goal scorers in NHL history. Mike Bossy, his career was cut short by injuries, but he's got the best goals per game percentage in NHL history. Uh, prolific playoff scorer and prolific regular season scorer, but also a great human being. Uh, he's got a little bit of a battle up, so we want to send him our best, and uh, hopefully everybody else does the same. And uh, we're going to send it over to Brady Shea in one second, but first we do want to tell you that the interview is brought to you by Sling TV. The NHL season is here, and if you love watching live sports, but you're tired of the high prices, it's time to take control of your TV experience. It's time you got Sling. Sling is the place where your favorite sports channels like ESPN, FS1, TNT, and more are all together for less. Watch sports all season long with the Sling Blue Plus Sports Extra Package, which gives you access to NHL Network and more like Red Zone and Golf Channel for only $21 your first month. Plus, watch past episodes of Spit and Chicklets, Send bag and the invitationals and exclusive Barstool content for free on the Barstool Sports channel on Sling. Sling is so easy to set up. It's so easy to use, and there's no contracts. Starting at just $35 a month, you sign up now, and you get your first month for just 10 bucks. Whatever you're into, Sling is where you can find the live sports you love all in one place. Go to sling.com slash barstool to sign up now and get your first month starting at just $10. 
And right now, we're going to send it over to Car- Carolina Hurricanes defenseman, Brady Shea. Well, it's time for our first player of the new season, and we're pleased to welcome this defenseman to the show. A first-round pick in the 2012 draft and a member of the 2017 All-Rookie Team. He's already heading into his seventh NHL season and his third wearing a Carolina Hurricanes jersey. Thanks a bunch for joining us on the Spit and Chicklets podcast. Brady Shea, how's it going, man? What's up, guys? Thanks for having me. Appreciate yeah. it. Absolutely. Our pleasure. I'm, I'm guessing you got down in the town a little early so you can get some golfing. I did. Yeah. I got down here um, about three weeks ago and actually like six of us are about to join a course down here uh, yeah. called Old Old Chatham. Oh, it's, dude. Uh, that place yeah. is sick. Yeah. It's so good. It's uh, There were two guys there last year and you're only allowed four rounds a year. So we use that up pretty quick. So we're all... Uh, Six of us are joining this year, so it should be good. Isn't that where uh, Justin Williams plays? Yeah, Willie. Yep. Yeah. So Willie was there. Troach was there. Is, is there, and then uh, Hayden Flurry was there as well. So it's an unbelievable track. So is, is Williams uh, kid the real deal? He had us. Uh, he he had him hitting balls on on the Zoom when we interviewed him the one. Oh, time. on the simulator. I forgot yeah. about that. Yeah, he's a yeah. stick, isn't he? Have you guys seen that simulator Willie has? Yeah, well, we, when we interviewed him, he did it from down in his basement there, and his son was whacking five irons, like 210 on a string. I'm like, Jesus Christ, how old's that kid? Yeah, Jax is a stud. I actually played with uh, Jax and Willie, three of us one time, and he was good. He's he's the real deal. Like He's playing like junior tournaments now and stuff. So, uh, yeah, he's a great kid and a really good golfer. I, I got a buddy um, that's a member at Old Chatham. Uh, he's actually Rob Oppenheim who plays on Taurus Caddy. His name's uh, Dynamite Dean. Uh, just stay away from him. I, I, he's, he's probably going to be laying lines for your games, too. It's just, just say, Dean, stay away from me. Stay away from me. This guy's a I'll gambler. Keep, I'll keep that in mind. Not those kind of lines are, right? Um, <laughs> uh, we, were, we were hearing, I mean, you, how, long, how long have you been golfing for? Because everybody says that everything you do, you just pick up naturally, including guitar, which is something you picked up last year. Oh my God. And everybody's been raving that you're the new fucking John Mayer. You're a this- guitar guy? Where are you guys getting this information from? Um, yeah, I, well, I, I was lucky. I actually grew up on a public course in, uh, in Minnesota. So um, I had like the junior membership and stuff and a good group of buddies growing up. So I probably started playing when I was six or seven. But when I got older, um, we lived on the sixth hole. So when, you know, guys were finishing up the round at like seven thirty, eight o'clock at night, I always wait for the last group to go by and then bring out like 30, 40 balls and just hit, hit, hit balls around the, around the course. So I feel like that, that helped quite a bit. That'd be a divorce school. for me, biz. Hey, eh? if I lived on a course now, like, oh, oh, oh yeah. Why well, you talked about tub. maybe you talked about maybe getting a simulator. Now you talked about Minnesota around that same time where you started playing golf. That's when they ended up getting the NHL team back. So you must've grown up a huge wild fan. I did. Yeah. I uh, actually was lucky enough to go to the first game, the first inaugural game for the Come wild. On. Yeah. I think that was, it was either 2000, 2001. Um, and yeah, so I was a huge wild fan, huge Marion Gabrick fan growing up. He was like the stud back then for, uh, for all us young kids. So uh yeah huge huge minnesota wild fan and it was really fun to go to that first game i still remember that, that to this day so uh i i know you ended up uh in ann arbor with the development team but what town are you from in minnesota and, and like most kids did you play for your high school before you left left home i did yeah i'm from uh lakeville which is like 20 minutes south of minneapolis um and then you yeah you guys know what minnesota hockey it's pretty cool that you know you grow up with I had a really good group of guys I grew up with that we all played together from like six years old all the way up and through high school. Um, always for comp- your town too. That's the best thing about that state. Yeah, always for your town, uh, which is pretty cool. So, yeah, hockey's huge. High school hockey is huge in Minnesota, and um, there's a lot of talent there. I mean, everyone plays, so it's uh, it's a great spot. Did you make any of those legendary hair videos ever? <laughs> I actually did not. No, I don't know if that was around. It might have been around. I had I had a buzz cut in, in high school, so I was I didn't have the flow going. Um, but I actually met the guy that did the did the videos in New York. Um, he came to one of our games and got to say hi to him quick. And I think I made a little quick video shout out for the guys that made the hair team that year. 
Where could you nice. imagine this guy skating up to the blue line? The fucking waterworks that would be going on in the stadium. Oh, Flood I thought you warnings. were going to say, could you imagine somebody trying to do an all hair video with you, Wit, with my fucking terrible fucking <laughs> quaff I have up top? Well, I can't talk right now because I got the fro going, although it's pretty tamed right now. I know you- so. Oh, go ahead, Ari. I would say you look like Chewbacca in Return of the Jedi right now with that with that do you got going, Biz. <laughs> it looks good, Biz. It's got slick back. It's Thank nice. you very much. Hey, sticking with the last golf question here, though, you, you played in the Barstool Classic pretty recently, did you not? I did, yeah. I played with uh, Anders Lee, Brock Nelson, and Vinny Terry, and Frankie as well. You guys All take right. it down? Yeah, so it's actually two-man teams. Um me and Vinny actually qualified to go to Pinehurst. I think we got second. Um, we shot six or seven under, uh, and then we obviously aren't. We're not gonna be able to go. I think it's in November, and we're in Vegas at that point. So I'm not gonna. Oh shucks! I'm not gonna tell Rod. Hey Rod, I gotta go skip skip today's game. We gotta go to Vegas and play in the Barstool Classic. Grinelli was too shy to ask. He wanted to know uh, what do Anders Lee's quads look like in person? Are they the fucking real deal? This guy's got to be the Quadzilla reigning champ in the NHL. I've, I've never seen anything like it. I'm not kidding. It is, you have to see it in person. I know there's pictures and stuff. Like there's some pictures that make them look big. They are the biggest things I've ever seen. He's so, he's so strong. I mean, talk about like, he was an unbelievable athlete too. He was like an all, he was Mr. Football in Minnesota, like really good athlete. And uh, yeah, I mean, his quads are crazy. Is he, is he a little older than you or are you guys the same age? uh he's older than me he's okay. he's probably four years older than me four or five yeah but That's yeah right. he's a he's yeah a i watched that video i mean yeah you got a beautiful swing it looked fun but i he pulled up in those short shorts i'm like is this guy <laughs> fucking for real with these things <laughs> yeah try to try to move him in front of the net on the power play you probably tried it's you can't do it it's impossible yes is where's Laterry playing now is he still with the rangers i have no idea He's in uh, he's in San Diego and Anaheim, so okay. he's he's at the Anaheim camp right now. Um, yeah, we had a ton of fun. It was such a good day. It it was like very professionally ran. Like I was not yeah. surprised, but like no, you were, were surprised. They, oh, you were surprised. They, you can't backtrack uh, now. You were surprised. No, I was a little surprised. They were they do a hell of a job. They really did. It was a really really fun day. I you were the quarterback in high school as well. You a huge Vikings fan? I'm guessing. Unfortunately unfortunately yeah how about last week the oh. kicker the on every single that's week like, and every week but that's, that's like the, the theme thing. of the franchise man that's Miss crazy Fielders. it's crazy yeah i'm i've always been a vikings fan um they've had a couple pretty good runs but um yeah definitely been vikings all the way i and actually oh, sorry all right quickly i forgot to ask this right away so like when i first saw your name i'm like who's this brady skagel from fucking slovakia <laughs> like how <laughs> What what is the ancestry DNA like? How many times have people messed up your name? Take us through like where this comes from. It's Norwegian. Okay, um, it's been messed up my whole entire life. Uh, during like a roll call in school, people the like it was a substitute teacher. They'd say Brady, and then like would start the S, and then I'd be like, yeah, okay, I'm, yeah, I'm here. Like messed up at hockey games. Um, it's actually funny. I went to Zuccarello's charity uh, hockey game in, in Norway probably three or four summers ago. And every person knew it like right away how to pronounce it, which was pretty cool. That's the first time. Uh, ever, he told me that, that that's happened. an insane time. He said, first of all, Zuccarello is legit the king of the country. King. Yeah. He's the man. I mean, it's, it was like a list celebrity type stuff going on when Zooks, when Zooks there, it's uh, like, I wasn't there. Kev went the year before me, but he was telling me that he was like police riding the back of the police cars, going from like the venue to the bar. And Zook was just is the absolute man. It is it is crazy. Did you ever think it would land you on SNL? <laughs> I did not. No, no, that was um, we were actually watching that. So the Rangers. Um, they knew there was something going on with the Rangers for that week. Like they, I think they reached out to them and asked if they could use a couple guys jerseys or names or something like that. Um, so we had a, we had kind of knew something was going to happen and me and Kev and Jimmy were watching it live and we saw the guy walk in and there was like, you could see the seven on the Jersey. And I was like, 
geez, that might be my jersey. I'm not, I could be mine. Kev's like, it's definitely yours. It's just sure enough, he turned around and my phone literally blew up like the second after that happened. It's crazy. Yeah, that thing's become a, a meme ever since then. But I, I know you said you left Chance the Rapper tickets for a game. Did he ever take you up on the offer? <laughs> I've not contacted Chance since that skit, no. But it was actually it was good because it was, it was actually a really funny skit, which was they did a really good job with oh, it. Oh, yeah. So, um, you know, it, it was, yeah, it's pretty cool that my jersey was on there. I feel like we skipped away from that guitar question awful quick, Kyle. What's, oh, yeah. the, sto- what's the story with that? There's not, there's not much to talk about there. I, uh, you can't serenade our following? You didn't know you had to play for us on this interview, dude? Go <laughs> get it. To. I see it behind you. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Um, well, <laughs> I, so I actually, in Ann Arbor, it's actually unreal. I went to, um, went to Pioneer, and my senior year, my first hour class was uh, Guitar One. So I kind of was the first time I ever picked it up, and – it was nothing better than getting up, going to school in your first hour. You're really sitting there playing a guitar. It's just it's like the perfect start, start, start of the day. Do oh, a couple bumps. Shit. Just fucking let's, let's fucking get her going here. <laughs> no, there's none of that happening. But, oh, okay. um, no, yeah. So I started then and then kind of been playing on and off um, since then. But I'm definitely not an expert in any means. That's not what Jordan Martinuk told me. Oh, my and, God. What? And, and, and at the fact that, like, so you play with Lundquist, and then also Ryan O'Reilly's a well-known guitar player. So they're like the NHL needs a new it guy, and I feel like you guys could go neck and neck. And by the by, the way I hear you play the guitar, that you could be that you could take Lundquist's spot. Uh, I got a lot of work to do um, right. before that, but uh, something to shoot for. But that, I can bet a lot of money that will not be me. Right. He's like Biz. I own five suits. What are you talking about? <laughs> You had a pretty big off season. Uh, congratulations. You got married, correct? I did. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, it was fun. We went to, yeah. Thank you. We went to, uh, we got married in Maine. Um, what made so, you go there? Yeah. Back to Ann Arbor. Actually, my billet parents um, are originally from mass and would vacation in Maine and stuff growing up. And uh, they bought a place on the river out there. Um, they're just the greatest people in the world. Like, I mean, everyone on, when I was in Ann Arbor was jealous of me. Like they were just such good people, um, steak and eggs for breakfast every morning. And no. like, just, yeah, it was unbelievable. Like, great, great house. And, uh, they asked us like a year and a half ago, if we want to do it out there. And we were like, yeah, maybe we'll, we'll think about it. Knowing that almost everyone in the wedding is going to be from Minnesota, it'd be kind of a hike, but we went out there and saw it and it was absolutely beautiful and um, decided to do it there. And it was a ton of fun. Really fun. What I part feel- of Maine? Uh, Newcastle, that area. Yeah. 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 You guys go away for the honeymoon right after? Are you waiting to do that or what's the deal? We did. We went to Italy right after. Oh, um, oh yeah. dude, Lake Como? We did do Como. We did three days in uh, Tuscany. Um, three days in Rome and three days in Positano. So it was, uh, I recommend anyone who, who can go there to go over and see Italy. It is greatest food. Like it's so good. I actually, so I want to go over there. I, I really want to go over there. The food, everything. A couple of people told me Rome almost, you almost only need a day or two. Did you, did you agree with that? Like kind of like the other two places were, were better off for you guys. Yeah, we were told the same thing actually, and um, we actually like all three about the same. It was they were all unbelievable. It was nice because in Rome, it was because of COVID, the capacity of people that were in the city was way down, and that weekend was also a holiday weekend for the country of Italy. So it was like not empty, but you could walk around no problem, no lines for uh, restaurants and like that. So we we really liked it. I'm I like history, so I thought it was really cool to see the Coliseum and like the Vatican and that kind of stuff. So we had, we had a ton of fun in Rome. How awesome is that Amalfi coast? Unbelievable. Like our, our favorite day on the honeymoon was we took a boat around um, Capri. So that, and it's just beautiful. It's like nowhere else in the world. It's just a lot of stairs though. The walking is kind of a pain in the ass. You got to walk a ton of stairs. Looks like um, I ain't going. <laughs> <laughs> Can't handle it, Biz. You know that. It is wild how they basically build the city like into the side of a mountain over there. It's, crazy. It's, it's crazy. Yeah, it's beautiful. 
So I, I mentioned you're down there for training camp. You guys, would you have physicals and interviews or something today? Have you started skating with the group yet? Yeah, so we started we started skating together. Um, when I got down there, there was probably 12 to 15 guys. And in the last couple of weeks, there's been we've had two full teams down here skating, which is which has been good. Um, and then yeah, today we did physicals and media, and then our welcome like team meeting before training camp kicks off. So we're starting up tomorrow. What's testing like look look like these days, or is it is it changed completely? It's got to be intense with Rod the Bond. Well, dude, it was Carolina was where Justin Williams fucking tore his Achilles one year testing. They gassed it. That was like ten years ago, I think. But I don't know what's going on now. Yeah, we um, it's not it's it's tough. We do a uh, assault bike, which is like we do uh, that's 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 pretty tough. Most guys will pass that, but the the cool thing is Rod does it with us, <laughs> so. Or he doesn't do it with us, but he does it before us. And uh, if he makes sure he passes and then everyone else is kind of set to that standard, like you better pass if this 51-year-old, 52-year-old coach is, is passing, you better pass at 27. I didn't pass, though, when he did. I'd be like, somebody drug test this guy. I mean, look <laughs> at him. It's en- enough's enough, Rod. He is a specimen. To say is he least. in there pumping weights when you show up like 8 a.m., 8 30? Like, or is he after practice? Like, what's his routine like? I think he does it before we, we get there. We see him, we saw him a little bit um, in his last few weeks. He was working on a little bit when we were there, but um, it's either before we get there and he might do two, two days. I'm not sure he does it before practice. And I think he maybe does it like before the game. So, uh, like, two o'clock before everyone shows up for the, for the game, he might get an extra little workout in. What was it like when you, when you ended up getting traded over there? I mean, you had a pretty good setup in New York. Obviously, you befriended so many of the guys on the team, and, and you had a great role going on there, even offensively. And then you switched over, and all of a sudden, it's just like, you know, the pandemic hits. Like, what was that transition like coming over from, from New York? Yeah, it was um, – at first, it was tough. I mean, I feel like every player, when you start off in the league, you kind of think you're going to be with this team forever. Um, that was, you know, everyone's mindset. And uh, – I loved in New York. I mean, I love the city. I think I met, I met so many great people there. Um, but coming down here, I it's more laid back. It's just, everything is just so much easier to get around. I mean, going to the rink is ten minutes instead of forty five minutes to to the practice rink in in White Plains in New York. So, in that sense, it was uh, it was good to get down here. It made everything a lot easier. Um, the team made it really easy for me to join it. Like gel and get a, get uh, acquainted with the guys. The leadership's unbelievable. Willie was here when I first got here, Jordo, Jordan Stahl, um, and even the young guys. I mean, usually you get these – sometimes the young guys kind of are a little clicky and hang out with each other, like the fellow guys from their country. The young guys we have here, like Svechnikov and Aho and Netchas, all these guys are so good um, – hanging out with the group and they're so involved and buy into the system. It's just a really, really good organization that, you know, everyone, all everyone wants to do here is win. So I, I've, I've been absolutely loving it down here. But like more for you personally, like I know you had more of an offensive role in, in oh, New York. You, no, no, it's, it's okay. Like, was it hard to come over and all of a sudden like things are a little bit different where maybe you're not seeing that power play time and maybe you're relied upon a little bit more defensively. Yeah, I think, um, you know, honestly, I didn't, I didn't play, I didn't play power play in college at all. So I went to, when I got to New York, I actually started in Hartford. I was in, after my college years, I went to Hartford and I played power play, penalty kill, all these situations, which was a ton of fun. And then I went to New York and was on the power play and had some success. Um, and then, yeah, you just, you know, we brought some other guys in that they, you know, thought could do better. And I just tried to buy into the role of playing defense and penalty killing and then coming down here. Yeah, with Dougie and all these guys, it's just uh, I've embraced the role of playing defensively. I think I still have that offensive ability in my game, but um, whatever it takes, uh, like whatever it takes for this team to win, I will definitely buy in and do that. Well, that, that was my one follow up with with Dougie leaving, and and I'm sure that you were happy when you got protected because it took the guessing game out of it with Seattle. Have has has Rod uh, Rob Brindamore talked to you about maybe taking on a bigger offensive role coming up this season? I haven't talked to him about it yet. Um, I'm mean, honestly just going to go into camp and work my ass off and just try to prove that, you know, I can play that game. If not, if it doesn't happen, um, I'll stick to the penalty killing and I can definitely do that. So 
Um, yeah, it's funny that when you brought the protection thing, I thought about it, it was actually during my bachelor party. And, oh, uh, Jesus. Yeah, I remember yeah. Hazy told me he was going out for that. Yeah, so Kev, Kev was there, Jimmy uh, VC was there, um, and all my Lakeville or my high school buddies and college buddies were there. And I texted my agent like right before the list got announced, like any word if I'm protected or not. And he said I'm protected, and the the party went up from there. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Canes had a busy off season as well. I mean, anytime there's an office sheet in the league, everybody sits up and take takes notice. I'm guessing you did as well. Yeah, no, it doesn't happen often. Um, I've been skating with, we've been, yes, Barry's been here for a while now for a couple of weeks and he's good, man. He's really, he's a really good player, super skilled. Um, he's bigger than I thought. I didn't know he was, he's pretty, he's like six, two, maybe six, three. I'm not sure. And he's pretty filled out. So um, we're, we're happy to have him. And yeah, it was, it wasn't, I mean, it was a little bit of a shock, but um, you know, we're, we're happy we got him. I mean, it's a nice ad. Plus, you didn't lose anybody off the current roster, too. So it's almost like he falls out of the tree. Yeah, no, exactly. Exactly. He's, he's going to help us for sure. Did you have a chuckle about the pettiness of your owner going through all that social media stuff with the like the $20 <laughs> signing bonus and all that nonsense? Yeah, I, I thought it was funny. I thought it was good. I think the, the Canes the Canes do a really good job of um, – Yeah, they do. Their, their marketing team does a really good job of uh, – getting our name out there and um i mean it's a really if it, people don't follow us on twitter i think they should it's a it's a good follow yeah Definitely. they get in the mix that's what's cool it's they like they're do. not really afraid to chirp other teams and stuff and it's only happening more and more whereas they were kind of one of the early ones in terms of really chirping other teams and other other players even yeah i i was shocked when i first got traded here from new york and new york is obviously first class everything is just so professional and then come down here and they're chirping other teams on Twitter, and it's just, it's just, I love it. I think it's great. Le- leaving leaners on, on the other the away teams yeah. at the hotels. Yeah, yeah. exactly. You, were you uh, were you shocked when you got traded? I, I know you asked your agent about the the protection for Seattle. Like, had you heard rumblings, or was it kind of out of nowhere when you did get the news? Um, I I wasn't expecting it until you know a week before I saw my name pop up on the trade bait list in the NHL. There you go. I was like, oh gosh, what is this about? You're like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. Um, this ain't the top 10 list I want to be on. <laughs> wait, 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 yeah. wait what, is that my name? I think I started, like, I I was, I don't know, a week before the trade deadline. I was like, yeah, I jumped, I wasn't on it. And then suddenly I was on like, I was like 48. And then the week later, like 20, I, I, I make up numbers, but I went higher and higher. And then I don't know what I officially got to, but once, uh, Crides Crides was the big free agent that year uh, at the trade deadline. And once he signed, I kind of felt like I saw the writing on the wall that I might be gone. So, um, and another funny thing, I think the trade deadline ends at three and we're sitting there at a coffee shop in, in New York and it was like three fifteen, three twenty, And I was like, Oh, maybe I'm okay. Sure enough. No call from the agent. I was like, Oh, never mind. Oh, I heard a rumor that you found out on social media on Twitter. So that's not true then? No, uh, that's a lie. No, I, I, I did find out. I looked at social media and saw like some rumblings, like Brady Shade to the Canes. And then literally like my phone rang probably 30 seconds after that. And speaking the of Twitter, weirdest I was, feeling, huh? Like oh. a pit in your stomach. Even though Carolina, like great spot to play, good young team, but it's just like so bizarre that first time. Yeah, definitely. No, it's just, it was just a weird feeling. And, um, yeah, you just you think like I said, you think you're gonna be in one spot your whole career, and then suddenly it's gone. It's just, it's it's a weird feeling, but I think the nice thing about that is I was, I think Carol, we had a game the next day, so it was like just pack up a bag for a couple of weeks, um, go down Carolina. Like it just happened, happened so fast, which helped a lot. Like there was no time to kind of sit back and think about it. Um, you started playing hockey again, which was good, but yeah, it is a weird feeling right away. I actually went and uh, stalked your Twitter account. And in 2017, you, you tagged Harry Star- Styles and congratulated him on his role in Dunkirk. Are you like a, a massive <laughs> Harry Styles fan or what? Uh, and were you aware I, that he's big... Ray's best friend's uh, 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 wife, Ted Lasso? No way. Well, I, I did know that. Olivia Wilde, right? Yeah. So you, we got some bad blood here, R.A. I got yeah. your back. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> um, I was actually a big One Direction fan in college. I liked One Direction. <laughs> okay. Um, hard to admit, but um, me and my – yeah, we had some college roommates that uh, not – I mean, they actually liked their music, so we'd listen to them, and uh, I don't know why I tweeted that. I probably should take that you, one down. But you tagged them, too. I think you were looking for I, some clout. Uh, I, maybe. For, I, was, I was fishing for some clout, yeah. That's the only guy you could run with in NYC who would be better looking than you are. <laughs> yeah, he had a tough game. He's like, dude, maybe, maybe I'll get a retweet from Harry Styles. Though. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you a big movie exactly. buff? That's usually RA's question, but are you a big movie guy? Um, yes and no. Not huge. I wouldn't say I'm a huge movie buff, but um, I feel like I've seen all the all the classics. So, yeah, classics is funny too because everybody's different generation is. Yeah, Biz is like, yeah, yeah Bill and classics. Ted's Excellent Adventures, <laughs> well, fucking unreal. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, I mean, they had the social that we, we tweeted out today from our Chicklets account. They were asking a couple of the young Rangers who Britney Spears is. Oh, and they don't yeah. even know who Britney Spears is. I'm what? like, no yeah, way. I mean, that's bad. They like, didn't know her by her name. They didn't know they had a who's this. And it was a picture of Britney Spears. And, and I think it was no her way. first album cover. Oh, all right. And so they didn't know who she was. Maybe though. Maybe if you said her name, they would. But the, but yeah, either way, I told, well, then that would yeah. defeat the purpose well, might have of the been whole game they were playing. I, I think no, they knew you know she was saying. regardless. Like yes, they heard, they've heard of Brady. No, I just wanted to chirp you because you chirped me. No. <laughs> 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 hey, but but I'm actually curious to know what you would define as a classic, given that you're a big One Direction fan. Yeah, right. I would say uh, Dumb and Dumber is probably my favorite. If that's a classic, yep. Caddyshack right. is up there. That's good. Yeah. Um, all right, old school. Next, yeah, I don't know if you That's if you, if you read, I don't know if you read it all, Brady. There's a great book about the making of Caddyshack. Uh, probably get what it cheap it? on him. It's called it's oh, I, it's called the making of Caddyshack. I, I can pull up the okay. title. It's like, it was I'll, like your music class every every morning at nine a.m. Very similar. Yeah, a lot right. Of tomfoolery going on on the on the set, <laughs> right? All right. <laughs> yeah, lots of, lots of tomfoolery going on. Uh, to, oh yeah, yes, this is Caddyshack, the making of a Hollywood Cinderella story. You can you get go. it cheap on Amazon, but if you do read, all it, right, it, I like, I like the hat. I just noticed it. Yeah, I, I figured I I'd do like a little that. little pandering for the guest every once yes, in a while. Never hurts. I love it. I nice love it. Yeah, you guys rock those jerseys a little bit, huh? Yeah, nonsense. Yeah, I haven't <laughs> I haven't oh. worn the the green ones yet. I saw them in the locker room today. They are so sick. Yeah, those they're unbelievable. Are so yeah, good. Yeah. They're pretty sharp look. And while we're talking about the time in New York, I want to go back to that time. I think it was the 27-18 season when the, the, the team management sent out a letter to fans basically like, buckle up for the next couple of years. Like, how did that go over in the room with guys? Did guys feel like kind of thrown under the bus by management? Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, guys are definitely – a little bit walk on eggshells coming into the room the next day. And I was right, right up before the deadline. So, um, yeah, it was, it was definitely strange. I mean, we kind of saw that we kind of knew it was coming a little bit, but we didn't expect the letter to come out and, and all that to make it that public. But, um, yeah, I mean, they, they cleaned house that year. No doubt. When, when you first like got to meet Panarin, I know you just played with him, you know, the one year, but, was it just amazing right off the get-go on the ice before the season started? Like, he seems super friendly. I've never met him, but it must have been wild seeing the season he had that year. He's he's so good. He's so skilled. Um, you, I literally – I don't even think I can count. Like, whenever the puck touches his stick, something good happens. Like, he never, never makes a mistake, which is crazy. And, um, yeah, he's just – and he works his ass off too. Like he's in the gym all the time. He's work on stick handling, shooting before practice. Um, just a, a elite, elite skill and elite talent. He's a stud, and he's always he's a he's always smiling too, which is great. You know, sometimes you get the Russians that are always a little crabby and <laughs> never smile. This guy is always smiling. He's always in a good mood, and he's a really good guy. Did he ever almost clip somebody with that high kick he does when he scores? <laughs> I I always stayed away when he scored. I knew something something might be coming. So I don't. I've got kicked in the face once by Kevin Hayes, and I don't need that to happen again. Oh shit! Yeah, you lost some chicklets, right? I oh, did. God. Yeah. Ugh. How'd that had, How'd that uh, go down? So we were at we were at the Garden. Kev was I can't remember who he, he was. Someone in Chicago. It might have been Hosa. He was defending and. uh, they were both right in front of me and Hosa cut and like turned around and 
hit Kev's leg and I was right behind Kevin and his skate came up and hit me right in the, like the chin. Uh, I lost two teeth and I think I had like 40 stitches. That's so, the scar right nasty. there. Yeah. Right here. I don't know if oh, wow. Yeah, that is pretty nasty. <laughs> yeah. So Kev never said sorry or didn't buy me dinner or anything. He just kind of went up. And then it. turned you into a Pats fan. <laughs> Yeah, so you right. really got kicked in the dick. Hey, I, I want to know the backstory between all these nicknames. Like, wh- where did Larry come about? And then I, I see this one, Brady Hung. Now, most of you probably think that it's for uh, a different reason than it actually is, but that's not the case. Uh, Larry is Larry's not me. I don't know who said that. We call Vinny LaTerry Larry. Um, he calls me Brad for some reason. So I think that might be it, but that's from – Brady hung. Where did you get? Where did you get this information from? We just heard. Throw man, check. You don't, yeah, you don't tell us. What's this? Yeah, we yeah, heard yeah, it. You're, you're, hung over, you're worse than Biz on the ice. <laughs> That's not true. I think um, I showed up one. We had a team party, and I showed up to a practice. And whenever I, when we go, when I go out, my eyes literally like the next morning just like droop down super far. <laughs> And guys, I walked into the rink and guys are like, Jesus, I'm like you hit by a train or something last night. And that's where, uh, that's where Brady hung started. So that doesn't happen as much uh, anymore. If I got that nickname. Uh, you lived with Hazy at first, right? You were a 22 year old rookie living in New York city, playing for the Rangers. Life must've been pretty damn good for you at that time. Not to say it's not now, but at, at 22, at the, the world's your oyster in that position. Yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. I actually lived with uh, v, VC my first year, a rookie year in uh, in New York. We lived in Battery Park, and then um, our second year, me, Kevin, Jim, Kevin was always over at our place. So we were always at his place. So one night we're like, why don't we just get a spot together? And we got a we got a place in Tribeca that was pretty cool. Three of us living there. So uh, it's a it's just a unbelievable city. And yeah, like you said, at twenty two and twenty three years old. Um, it was a good time. There's no staying in. <laughs> <laughs> we tried yeah. to. <laughs> um, so getting into the game of hockey, was it your dad? Like, like you just always loved the game. Like what was the beginning to you playing? And like, also kind of curious, most kids in Minnesota, you dream of playing for the Gophers. Was, was that the case for you as well? Yeah, it was. So I got, um, I come from a football family. My dad was a football coach, football player. My grandpa uh, played at the, at the U for football. My uncle did the same. Um, but my uncle, my other uncle was actually a skating coach growing up. Uh, he's a skating coach for the Phoenix Coyotes. And I remember going when I was really young to my cousins, like high school hockey games. I think that's where I kind of fell in love with the game. Um, so did your so dad skated, ever even play? My dad played college football um, in a small school in Minneapolis called Augsburg. Oh, oh sorry, hockey? Yeah. No, 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 no. He played wow. – uh, yeah, he played football and basketball. And um, so I got into hockey through my kind of through my uncle, I believe. And then my dad was like fully supportive of it. He always kind of wished he played hockey, I think. All of his buddies were hockey players. So uh, it's just kind of the thing to do in Minnesota. Yeah, I was looking at that roster your first year at college. You guys had 10 guys on that team that went on to play at least one game in the NHL. Most, most guys are still even playing. Like, I mean, there's, I think yeah. there's probably about six guys who are still in the league. Yeah. No, it was – my freshman year was crazy. We were um, supposed to – we were ranked one the whole year. We were supposed to win the national championship and got bounced in the first round to uh, Yale, who actually went on to win it that year. Um, but, yeah, that team going in was crazy. We had Bukestead, Howla, Nate Schmidt, um, Mike Riley, myself. It was it was a really good team. Oh um, yeah, this team is loaded the, for college. Yeah, the funny thing is, though, I mean, then my sophomore year, we lost all those older guys. They all went to the NHL, and we were kind of weren't supposed to do as much and ended up going to the national championship game against Union, ended up losing. But Oh, um, that was the game when Goss Bear was fucking Bobby Orr. It was insane. He put like, like seven points, something like that, or six or seven points. Busy yeah. He was plus seven, I think, with seven points in the title yeah. game. I nuts. think you guys were up. Weren't you guys up a couple goals early? Yeah, I think we were up one. We I scored remember the first watching goal, that. And I think we made – I think they might have scored and we made it two to one again. And then they they scored like three goals in a minute and a half. So, um, yeah, it was good. Uh, the game before that, too, was really fun. I, I don't know if you guys remember. We scored with like 0. .6 seconds left to beat North Dakota. 
Justin Hall. His first goal of the year, we're on the we're penalty killing. He scores 0. 0.6 second, seconds left in regulation to win it. That's like the big one of the biggest goals in Gophers history. You mean McDavid's kryptonite? Yeah, Halsey. He's a stud. Shut uh, down dur- anybody. <laughs> During your junior year, when do you start thinking you're going to bolt right after the season's done? Um, you know, I mean, it happened pretty quick, but um, you're not really. We were again. We had a good team. We were, I was honestly just so dialed into. I wanted to win the national championship so bad. We had kind of the same team we had my freshman year. Like a lot of really good players that all came back. Um, but yeah, once the season ended, I so bad with remembering this stuff. But it, it happened pretty quick. I was at, I was in Hartford um, probably within a week or two, probably a week. I always like to ask guys uh, who played for the Rangers, like what was your fam- favorite MSG moment? Of course, like going to play in the most iconic arena, probably in the world, every single game. But, you know, did you get to meet any celebrities you would have never got to meet? Like what was the one thing that stood out that you remember in your mind? I, we didn't get to meet as many celebrities. We you, know, you see them at every game. You see them behind the bench all the time. But we didn't get to meet them as much as uh, – we'd meet them more. If we went to a Knicks game, we'd sit in like the – on the floor and kind of like there's some sweets below yeah, the... you get some splinters on your toes like Comrie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah right um a favorite moment though i honestly probably when i went out for the playoff for my first playoffs at the garden and they played that uh they played the bob o'reilly song with the piano oh. and like the lights <laughs> were gone that was pretty that was pretty freaking cool the who yeah oh yeah. my goodness that is yeah, yeah. That's probably yeah. up there with like stranglehold um, when you come out in Chicago with. Oh, that's a jam. Yeah. That's a jam. That, that's that the one. Cool. That's the one that starts slow, right? Yeah. I know yeah. Ted talking. Nugent. Like the, yes, yes, yeah. yes, 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 yes. Straight yes. mullet, just ripping guitar. That's actually why Brady or uh, Larry here got into it. <laughs> you had a nice play. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Brady. Go ahead. No, I, just, I don't know where Larry came from. I, I know that Brady hung. I don't know the Larry one. Well, they're going to start calling you in the locker room, mm-hmm. Larry, now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you had a nice playoff, uh, four goals. I think you got them all within about a six-game span there. Were you just failing at that? Yeah, then you got named to the all-rookie team as well. Yeah, I was. I I mean, I feel like I was just playing with, the, I don't know, a ton of confidence, and I was um, – it seemed like everything I was everything I was shooting was kind of going in. I think you kind of get those streaks, and um happened at a good time. Obviously, wish we would have – went for, further that Ottawa series I think we ended up we I mean we ended up losing but that game, that series could have gone either way um which you look still look back on but yeah I was I was playing with Brandon Smith who I'm actually down who's here now in Carolina with me and um we both uh we just had a pretty good pretty good run in the playoffs what do you uh what do you think about the Ryder Cup this week dude who's your pick I can't wait I I, I mean, I think the Americans are going to win it, obviously. Um, I saw Riggs is going against the Americans. Yeah, it's unbelievable. He's Team Europe. It, well, his friend didn't make the team, so he just doesn't root for the country where he's from. It's pr- pretty uh, ridiculous. Uh, Nobody likes a bandwagon fan. Pretty ridiculous scenario, <laughs> but he says that you're a sheep if you want the U.S. to win, even if you're American. I have no idea. I think he's just mad his best buddy didn't didn't make the team. But, Kisner, is that it? Are, yeah, Kisner, are you? We we were talking on this week's episode, this this prior week's episode about uh, Kepka and DeChambeau. Where do you stand on these two guys? I feel like you might be a not ruffle feathers guy, but like, be honest here. I'm definitely not a ruffle feathers guy, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I just think it's kind of a joke what they're doing. I mean, like, I think there's some quotes about. Brooks not wanting to like, or have, it's a not a fun week or something like that. Like it's gotta be like the best week of the year. They're playing on a team like for once. And like, I don't know, the DeChambeau. Yeah. He's doing the long drive competition right after. So who knows? I mean, I hope, I honestly hope they play them together the first day and hope I'll break squash, that down for the fans. All the beef. I'll break it down for the fans with no filter. Kepka's an arrogant asshole and DeChambeau is a jock <laughs> sniffer. <laughs> oh Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Hopefully they figure out, but isn't there, I mean, I feel like there's, there's something this year with the PGA tour about getting like uh, social media or something. I don't know. Well, yeah. You know so that's stuff. what the tour, they came out with this like player incentive program. Like they're calling it the pip where I think they're giving five guys, 10 million each 
as to who does the most good for the game through social media. I don't necessarily think it's good for the game, but basically like who gets the most eyes on, on, yeah. on the game of golf. Now I think that was the beginning in Kepka in terms of like all the shit he's done. DeChambeau is just a weird prick. So I got no idea what's going on in his mind, but there's definitely guys who are doing things that like, I think, I think Max Homa should be one of them. Cause he's yeah. just funny. He's I just, think he is one of them. I don't know, man. People say that like he won't be. It'll actually be like Phil and like Spieth and guys who are like bigger. I don't know how it's gonna come down <laughs> come down to work, but I, I'm fired up for the Ryder Cup. I, it, it is definitely my favorite sporting event to watch. I'd say, hundred percent. I agree. Um, yeah, when I, I I thought it was definitely at the start was that Pip thing, and then she's, I feel like they've just taken it way too far now. But who knows? Um, you seem like a pretty non-controversial guy. Is that why you're such a shitty two-touch player? You want the other guys to win, and you don't want to. Does he suck at two-touch? Uh, apparently, he's the worst two-touch player. Oh, Absolute my liability, gosh. out first guy every time. <laughs> Just, Just fucking not true. Uh, I'm mean? not, not true. I'm not great. I'm not. I'm not the best, but I'm not the worst either. I'm, I sit right in the middle. Um, I have my good days and some bad days. Yeah, okay, Larry. In New- in New York, we had a football out there actually too, and. I, I, when you ever got out, you wouldn't play catch with the football. And I seem to be playing football quite a bit in New York. My game's gotten better in Carolina. So, oh, Biz, this is the New York guys who told us this. That's basically him saying, no, I'm much better now. That's man. why I got worse. dealt. That's why I heard you <laughs> exactly. got dealt. A bad two touch player. <laughs> <laughs> Last year in the playoffs, you guys lost to the eventual cup winner, Tampa Bay Lightning. The series before that versus Nashville, absolutely insane series. You guys go up 2 nothing. The next two games, they win. Double overtime, both games back to back. Then you won the next two in OT. Have you ever played a series like that, four straight games in OT with so much in the line? No, that was the first time. Um, and the other, like that was the, what I was going to say. Like PNC Arena, the arena we played at, we that was the first time it was fully capacity. And I've never heard a louder rink. Honestly, I've never been in a louder rink in my life. Like everything is the the roof's like metal so everything just bounces the sound bounces right off it it's so loud in there um yeah those those games we were playing i don't know what it was but me and pesh looked at each other after game four and we're like holy cow like i feel like we've played eight games already it's just it was so much ice time and um obviously we went on a little longer than we wanted to but we got the job done but yeah those the overtime games were crazy and Nashville was loud too. That's they were both. That series was really fun because the arenas were both fully packed. Yeah, I'm looking at twenty seven forty three in game two, which was regulation. Then thirty seven fifty nine, thirty nine oh two in those double OT games. But I just want to ask, how good is UC Saros? I feel like a lot of people don't know how good this guy is. Yeah, he's really good. He's small too, which is crazy. You think you're going to beat him? He's so quick, and um, he played really well for them that series. Are we are we getting the storm the storm surge again this year or what? Yeah, what was your decided? first storm surge? And 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 you were probably <laughs> ripping on it before you got there. They made oh. him get dunked on by somebody <laughs> on a fucking plastic basketball hoop they brought out. Funny thing is, I got traded here. Me and Troach got traded here, and we lost the first like four games in a row. So we we never got the, the chance. Fans to hated your guts. <laughs> exactly. Me and Troach like, geez, we ruined this team. Um, but. I haven't done an official storm surge yet. Last year we did a stick salute to all the like doctors, nurses, first responders, um, every game, which was which is really good. But we'll see. I'm not sure exactly if we're doing. I got one for again. you. I got one for you. What's you bring up? out a you bring out a chair and you go back to that 9 a.m. class in the morning. You light one up. You cross your legs and you serenade the ladies <laughs> in the crowd. What if God was uh, one of us? Right, Wit? Going back to last pod. Did you hear about uh, did you hear about the guy who went and got Wit gas? No, I did not. Tell me. If you listen to the last gas. podcast, okay, guy, if you could do us one favor, you would sing that song to the entire crowd after your first win as a Carolina Hurricane. That would be a hell of a surge. That would definitely make Sports Center now that ESPN's got hockey again. They'd be like, look yeah. at this guy singing. Oh, my gosh. His jersey off. Since you're being so modest, what can you play on the guitar? Like, what are the what are your go tos? Um, I feel like I can play the start of like five songs. I can't play all the way through. Um, I can play "Free Falling" by John Mayer, the start of that one. Uh, "Iris" by the Goo Goo Dolls. I was learning "Crash Into Me" by Dave Matthews. So, 
I kind of stick uh, to those ones. Going to be ready for for a fraternity basement any day now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So there's no chance that we get a little send off for our fans. You busting out the guitar, just the start of a song, nothing. There's no actually my guitar is not even here right now. It's in Minnesota. Okay. All right. I Wait, swear. I just figured okay. I'd try to. Does, Tom Green did it. Just saying. Does Tom, Does John Mayer see, sing a song called "Free Fallen" separately from Petty, or does he do a version of it? He does a version of it. Yeah, he does like a his own little version. Oh, okay, all right. It's, no, G G just. T- I thought I heard that, but I, I don't listen to John Mayer, so I don't know if he had a, a a song that he sang as well called "Free Fallen." Just gotta stand up for my boy Petty. He's not around anymore, so Brady Mayer. Yeah. <laughs> well, buddy, hey, uh, best of luck this season. I mean, uh, you guys, uh, you guys got a solid squad. Uh, Going to be dangerous in that division yep. again. Um, best of luck, and thank you so much for coming on and uh, work yeah. on that golf game because at some yeah, point we, need we him will. For a sandbag of us. Who would your partner be? I was gonna, those are my those videos you guys do are so good. I watch every one of them. Um, Kev already did one, didn't he? Kev did one. Yeah, already? Kev did one with Keith Yan. Yeah, we fucking bent them holes. over. All yeah. they did was complain about how hungry they were. <laughs> Wit hopped on my back and I won on the twenty third. I actually ta- I I saw that. I actually talked to Kev after that round and he was like, "Dude, we played like because you went you had extra holes, right? We wouldn't Dude, feed six them six extra holes." Six extra holes and there's food like there's no food on the course that no, day. No, we wouldn't allow them to never eat. let us forget it. Or Grinelli. Yeah. We had a smorgasbord board for breakfast and 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 we wouldn't allow. Them to eat. <laughs> it's like we were we were getting ready to fucking hibernate. We just crumpled a bunch of food and and wouldn't like, allow we those Red guys Bulls. To... Does Red Bulls count, guys? You can have a Red Bull, sugar free. So good. Yeah, we'll set something up though, Brady. We appreciate yeah, let's it. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right, buddy. Yeah. Have a Get, great year, right. man. We're looking forward to watching the Canes go. Get Williams, kid. We'll do it on the simulator. There we go. There we go. Let's do that. All right, guys. Thanks again. Appreciate it, man. Thanks, Brady. Have a a great year, pal. Take care. Thank you. Big thanks to Brady Shea for joining us. Great chat with him. Great kid. Enjoy chat with him. So we want to let you know that that interview is also brought to you by Sport Clips. Got a cowlick, a patchy beard, finally want to grow out that mullet. Well, maybe you just need a style that works every day. Whatever you need... Go to Sport Clips Haircuts. This isn't your grandma's hair place. Sport Clips stylists are experts in men's hair. Cutting men's hair can be harder than women's hair, and Sport Clips stylists are specifically trained to cut men's hair. They know the tips and tricks for making sure guys get the best cut to suit their facial shape, hair texture, and lifestyle. Remember, you can go to grandma's for the holidays, but not when she cuts hair. You want to go to Sport Clips for that. The pros in men's hair. All right, boys. Uh, last few topics here. Um, Boston, the big story, I guess, of the day with uh, Bob Newmeyer, a.k.a. Numi. He died at 70 years old from heart failure. He was uh, an institution. If you were a Boston kid, he was on WBZ TV covering sports. He was the Bruins radio guy. He actually did the whalers way back in the day. Um, and he was a fantastic horse handicapper on NBC as well. Wit, I'm guessing you uh, grew up at Nomi as well, too, right? Uh, yeah, I remember him. I think he announced some college hockey games, possibly. That, too. He did a Frozen Four, too, yep. Yeah, so, um, yeah, that was brutal news to see. I remember, I mean, this growing up was before, like, the Internet and cell phones and Twitter. It was like you watch the local news. So he was always on us. Yeah, I feel bad for his family. Brutal. Did, did he say how he passed away? No, he had heart failure. He had had some heart, um, oh, heart problems the last sucks. few years. So, yeah, it got come over. Uh, I think it was Sunday afternoon where it happened. So, yeah, Bob Noombay, one of those guys. It's funny, too. Like, I wrote the blog. Like, it used to be a generation where you grew up and everybody knew the local news anchors with, like, the, you know, the two anchors, the weather guy, the, you know, news person, the sports guy. Now it's like nobody knows that stuff anymore. It's like it's almost like a relic because, like, young kids just don't watch the the news like they used to but either way we are very sorry to hear that bob newmeyer passed away he was uh an icon here in new england with uh sports patriots bruins whalers all kinds of teams he was involved with so uh let's move right along here what what were you watching sunday night i know the uh, football was on but yet succession uh yeah first first episode of succession i succession i missed the curve i'll watch that after um later on but I, i think i was exhausted at the end of succession this show is so good. I forgot. I mean, I, I had rewatched the last episode of season two. Not going to give anything away, but one of the top shows on TV right now. 
I haven't seen a lot of them. I haven't seen Ted Lasso, but I'd argue this is right there near the top. So it's pretty exciting. And I wonder how accurate it is for the family of like a billionaire and like this media monster. I don't really know how to describe the guy, Logan Roy, but mogul. A media check, mogul. M- mogul. Yeah. It's just check it out. It's uh, it's, I, I, I've enjoyed it. First episode I thought set up a lot. Biz, have you watched Succession? Where are you on Succession, Biz? I so, no, losing. but I was talking to my buddy Jeff Jacobson uh, about it because it kind of played into the fact that in, in Canada right now, uh, the Rogers family, who, like, own, like, basic Canada, they own, like, the, the cell phone towers, they own Sportsnet, the the father passed away, and now the son has appointed himself as, like, CEO or one of the main guys, and the 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 daughter went to Twitter and just started ripping the brother and no. saying this would be like himself appointing himself like the the king of England. That sounds like kinda... a succession fucking plot right. Line. So he, I haven't seen. <laughs> but the succession. father must have left it to him, right? Or he could. Is yeah, there a story and, that he like finagled something. I I don't know the 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 massive extent of it, but I know that the the, the when the the daughter of the guy who founded it all tweeted it, it went viral, and now it's a it's a big conversation going on at the fact that. Because it's just, there's been questions about how it's being ran. I don't need to get into the political aspect of it, but I just thought it was funny that you guys brought up the show and it kind of tr- transitions into like a real life situation that's at least happening in Canada. So I know I know we have a decent amount of listeners and, and I'm sure that some of them are aware of what's going on up there north of the border. But Jeff did say that this show is excellent. I need to catch up on season one. I'll probably start it tonight on, is it on Netflix? No, God damn it. It's an HBO show. You gotta okay, go HBO's and- got a lot of great shows, man. Oh, awesome. HBO has been like the pinnacle of like quality program for a long time. Uh, with, I know you don't watch Insecure, do you? It's going to the last season as well about the uh, black chicks dating in L.A. And it was no. in the Valley. Yeah, I've been watching it for the last few years. Great show. It's just a, a show that I wouldn't think I would have any interest in, but it's such a well-written, well-done show. And also... um. The fuck was it? Oh yeah, curb, curb your enthusiasm. Now I know it did what seven, eight years. Then it came back for two. Have Have you watched Curb every episode since it come back? You think it's been at the same standard? Uh no. I still think it's really funny. I I might also just be biased that like eight, nine years ago, some of those episodes are just so good that it's maybe I'm not being fair, but I, I certainly like the older ones a little bit better. I still love the new ones. I'm a big Larry David fan, big fan of the show, but I think maybe now it's probably a little, a little worse, but I still like it a lot. Yeah. I, I yeah. want to see what, I mean, did you watch the first episode of this season? You don't like it? No, I, I, it's funny. I actually did watch it. I thought it was very funny, but when they came back after that long, lull, I didn't think that, the show is the same. I mean, I think it's tough to leave and then come back. I mean, we saw the same thing with Arrested Development. Remember, they did like yeah, you, you know, get a little early... bit of a yeah, you kind of get out of that rhythm. Yeah, and, and it's tough. You're bringing people back and you're trying to write the, wife, the same rhythm. The it, wife, it, Larry David's wife, uh, though, in it. Oh my god, Cheryl. She gets, uh, she gets me. Well going. then, well then, is Jeff Jeff Gollin's wife, uh, Susie? She's fucking hilarious. The the foul mouth. Yeah. Oh, she's so hilarious. I actually uh, I watched. I was on the plane uh, to, to Atlanta the other day, and they they had it as one of the options. I forget what season it was, but it was when he uh, he starts practicing to be in that play. And then he goes to Ben Stiller's oh. birthday and, and he's like, oh, yeah, don't bring a gift. And he doesn't bring a gift. And then the, the best part of the show is when he tells the blind guy that it's fine, that his girl's like disgusting. <laughs> and then he has to do all the chores for him because because he gassed his girl. It was like so like some of the shit that is happening in that is just next level. So he's uh, yeah, Larry David, one of the, the most uh, probably one of the most iconic men in, as far as TV is concerned. <laughs> I mean, with Seinfeld and then easily, easily. I would say Dave said that if uh, there was, there would only be three people on the planet that he would drop plans for. And he's, and Larry David's one of them. Really? Yeah. Yeah. He's obsessed with them. And uh, Teddy, Teddy Purcell was at a wedding with him. Did we talk? He he, he was chatting them up. Oh yeah. They were like, playing tummy sticks the entire he said he was like covering his head because it was bald and it was in, in the like, like getting beat in on the sunlight and he just said he was basically the exact same person as he is in the show so we can uh, we can move on um we did talk about Wayne Gretzky earlier I don't know if you guys watch CBS Sunday morning it's like the most soothing news show in the history of the world like you get up at nine o'clock in the morning CBS comes on 
And it's just like a very pleasant news show. And they did a, a very wonderful segment on uh, Pal Wayne Gretzky, his okay. co-worker. Just very nice. They went up, I, I'm assuming it was Gaza. They said it was a resort in Idaho. And they went up to uh, Gaza and just taped a very nice segment. With him. He's just such a nice, polite guy. But this was done for like generic America. Like it wasn't like for a hockey audience. So yeah. I don't know if you've seen it. If you it, And if you don't want CBS Sunday morning, man, it's uh, maybe because I'm getting older, but when you, it's such a like awesome show. It's a new show that's done at like a low speed. So, you you know, it's not like in your face. It's kind of like a, uh, at a two, I guess you'd say biz. Okay. Uh, that's, okay. that's about my speed. Oh, there you go. All right, boys. I think that just about wraps it up a little longer than we planned on, but that's what Chicklets is all about. G great job on the Danbury trashes merchandise. This stuff has been all over the internet. Uh, kudos to you and AJ for getting it done. Yeah, I mean, I didn't really do anything. You slap that logo on anything and people are going to buy it. The trashers are hot in the street right now. I think this will be our uh, best-selling merch ever, so buy it. It's both available for American and, Americans and can- Canadians. Uh, store.barstoolsports.com. Okay, wait. So I had Canadians messaging me saying that they could only access a T-shirt. Now, are there sweaters and maybe hats and jerseys down the road that are going to be available? Oh, yeah. So right now, Canadians can buy T-shirts and they can buy crewnecks. The crewnecks are exclusive in Canada. We're getting the sweatshirts up to Canada. It just takes a little longer with all the shipping stuff that's going on in L.A. right now. But we will have it all exclusive in Canada and in America. So we're, we're pumped about that. Okay. And shout out to the Galantes. Jimmy Galante signing off on this thing. That guy's a legend. There you go. Absolutely. I got to uh, <laughs> sign off on that one. <laughs> I don't want to leave that a blank envelope. We're talking yeah, about yeah. G. All right, everybody. Listen, uh, great episode. Hope you had fun. And uh, we'll be back next week with the latest spit and chicklets. Peace.